Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous people. Clark, are there any documents? Yes, Mr President. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. And I understand there are no proposals for committees to meet. So we'll move on to item four, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I understand that uh, uh, pursuant to um, uh, an order agreed by the Senate, uh, I have been asked to attend the chamber in relation to uh, a number of uh, government responses to Senate Environment and Communications References Committee reports um, tabled across uh, a period of time. Uh, that uh, uh, this um, Order uh, notes, Mr. President, uh, the uh, uh, approach since 1973. I says, says uh, that uh, uh, government responses to committee reports seek to be tabled or be tabled within three months of a report uh, um, being finalised. Um, I note, Mr. President, there's probably been a, a wide uh, variation in terms of the handling of that uh, since 1973, uh, rather than uh, whether it be Labor or Liberal governments, complete compliance with that. I'd note that, uh, Mr. President, uh, in that time frame, uh, there would be many uh, such committee reports that uh, um, uh, that have uh, been have lapsed in different ways in terms of their relevance as a result uh, of. Um, the passage of time and other matters uh, along the way, uh, and that, of course, I'm pretty confident uh, that the volume of committee reports being made by the Senate uh, is probably much greater uh, today in 2022 uh, and in recent years than it was back in 1973, uh, Mr. President. Nonetheless, I can advise the Senate uh, that in relation to uh, some of the reports that uh, have been identified in the motion passed by the Senate. Uh, work has been underway to respond to those reports. Uh, that The government uh, responses to the National Land Care Program uh, and uh, to the regulation of the fin fish aquaculture industry in Tasmania, uh, that uh, responses to these committee reports are indeed being tabled today. Uh, that, uh, that work is continuing to table, uh, and I'm sure, Mr. President, that, uh, that there will uh, no doubt be extensive interest uh, from, uh, from senators in relation to uh, uh, their contributions on land care, an important and very much valued uh, program uh, across Australia, and land care a program that um, our government has very strongly and passionately and enthusiastically supported in a range of different ways. Um, and, uh, and fin fish aquaculture industry in Tasmania. Um, a sector that I, uh, I imagine my colleague Senator Dunningham is much um, uh, better uh, placed to address the uh, merits and challenges facing the fin fish aquaculture industry in Tasmania uh, than I necessarily am. And yes, I am certain that Senator Wish Wilson will have will have much uh, to uh, to say on uh, on a matter uh, such as uh, such as that. Uh, Mr. President, um, uh, so uh, so I'm sure those uh, those government responses on those 
uh, two matters are no doubt going to be eagerly anticipated uh, by, uh, by the Senate um, and, uh, and of course uh, I'm sure they will add enormous value Mr. President, to, uh, to the debate uh, in relation to, um, to such matters. Um, but I know uh, no doubt that, uh, that when I conclude speaking uh, there will be um, a rather predictable take note motion that will be moved and there will be uh, a degree of uh, faux outrage that will come. Uh, um, um, oh, well, well, um, Senator Hanson Young, I know, is very good at, uh, at turning the dial up when, uh, when she needs to, uh, to have uh, a degree of outrage. That um, uh, I think there's a little, you know, sort of a little knob under Senator Hanson Young's desk there somewhere where she can sort of work out which level of outrage uh, on the outrage machine she wants to, uh, to flick to. So she'll have her degree of outrage. Perhaps she'll have something to say about the fin fish aquaculture industry uh, as well. Uh, Mr. President, uh, but no doubt there will be that approach taken um, from uh, the crossbench and, uh, and probably from the opposition as well. Notwithstanding the fact that I'm sure, if uh, if we were to work our way through uh, the period of their time in government, uh, we would equally find uh, many different committee reports uh, that uh, that were not responded to within the uh, 1973 standard of three months. That uh, that I suspect governments of all persuasions have uh, honoured more in the breach in that, uh, in that period of time. But Mr President, I, do, uh, I wouldn't want anybody to think that uh, that means that Senate committee reports are any less valuable. Uh, the work of Senate committees uh, is uh, of crucial importance in a range of ways, and of references committees has a unique role in terms of how they operate uh, across our parliament, uh, that references committees um, uh, of the Senate uh, operate with, uh, with a certain freedom and a liberty um, uh, to, uh, to explore issues beyond the remit of specific legislation. And of course, the unique uh, aspect of references committees in this place uh, is that uh, they not only um, uh, uh, have that freedom in terms of exploring issues beyond pure legislation presented to ledge committees, but of course, those references committees um, are constituted. Uh, with a non-government uh, balance in this place. Now, oftentimes that, uh, that is a good thing, uh, where those references committees with a non-government balance. I've been there, chair of a references committee myself, uh, um, back, in, uh, back in dark, dim days of opposition. Um, I, uh, look, I, I, I think Senator Cash would have been chair of a references committee too, uh, Senator Stoker, and that she would have done a great job uh, at that time. Um, and they, uh, they are valuable opportunities for a constructive approach to be taken at times. However, there has been a bit of a trend over, uh, over the years as well, where sometimes references committees uh, are abused, uh, that because they have that non-government majority that, uh, that they are constituted with, uh, then those references committees uh, operate in a way, uh, in a way uh, where they are used not so much for the uh, legitimate uh, analysis of the issues that are proposed, uh, not so much uh, for, uh, for the pursuit um, of, uh, of information and knowledge around those issues, but instead for political purposes, uh, political purposes where a non-government majority, a uh, non-government controlled committee uh, is able to, uh, to pursue um, political attacks on the government uh, rather than the uh, purpose, original function and intent for which those references committees uh, were established. And I've noted that, uh, that over the years there have even been attempts where sometimes legislation finds itself referred to a references committee if, uh, if opposition parties of the day uh, think they can get the numbers in, uh, in that regard. So those approaches, uh, Mr President, uh, when they are used in ways that do um, undermine the intent of those references committees, uh, they can be um, uh, indeed I think undermining the overall benefits we have of the very powerful and important committee system uh, in the Australian Senate. Uh, now I haven't had a chance, uh, Mr. President. There's been a little bit happening, as there usually is in uh, in sitting weeks and in the finance minister's life. I haven't had a chance to go and have a look over uh, each of the 18 committee reports uh, from the uh, Environment and Communications Committee myself. Um, uh, uh, I have no doubt, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, that, uh, um, that others, particularly in the relevant portfolio offices, would have read um, uh, the valuable work of those committees. 
I just in the last day or two myself haven't had that chance to go and actually uh, read the reports myself. Uh, I'm sure that uh, in some part uh, they are uh, valuable additions to public policy and debate. But I equally suspect that in other part, uh, given especially this reference, references committee has uh, for a period of time had a chair from the Greens, and I, uh, I, uh, I note Senator Hanson Young your enthusiasm on, uh, on this topic, uh, that it is probably the case that these committees are, uh, reports are somewhat uh, laden with the Greens' view of the world, um, perhaps uh, with the support of the Labor Party. A reminder, Mr President, of the type of Labor-Greens alliance that uh, uh, we could see after the next election, uh, where their pursuit, uh, where their pursuit, um, and Senator, Senator Keneally, usually the Labor Party seek to deny that there would be a Labor-Greens alliance, but I note Senator Keneally didn't on that occasion. Uh, she instead, when she drew an automatic analogy to Morrison Joyce, was Senator Keneally's words. So there you have it. Senator Keneally sees the Labor-Greens alliance as being akin to the coalition. To the coalition parties. Order. That is order. Order. That's stand. I'm just observing anyone who goes into coalition with the Joyce government has a hell of a lot of I don't of, uh, think no, this is a point of order, trying Senator to cast Keneally. Dispersions. These are free-ranging debates. Minister, you have the call. Mr. President, well, this is this is quite amazing. Uh, this is quite a revelation, Mr. President, that even in taking that point of order, Senator Keneally didn't seek to suggest. Senator Birmingham, Senator Senator Keneally, thank you for the invitation Keneally, to take no the point floor. Of I, the senator is giving me the chance to take the floor, Mr. President, Senator to Senator deny Keneally, that there is any I, I coalition between chance. Greens no and the Labor Party. Order, Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally, resume your seat. Senator Keneally, resume your seat. Senator Keneally. Minister, you have 15 seconds. Well, dragging, kicking and screaming there for Senator Keneally to deny that essentially the Labor-Greens relationship would be just like the Liberal National Party relationship, working in coalition, working in tandem, should they get the opportunity. That's what we saw for much of the last term of a Labor government, and that's what Minister, is the risk for Australians ahead Minister, of the next election. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young. You're uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the minister's response. Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, what a display of disrespect for the institution of this chamber, for the institution that uh, this chamber holds over reviewing uh, government policy, uh, looking into issues of uh, serious. Uh, matters concerning the community. The idea that as senators we should just sit back, be, uh, be quiet and do whatever the government of the day likes uh, is just laughable. That is not the role of the Australian Senate. Our role is to inquire, is to ask tough questions, is to hold government to account. And that is precisely why this uh, motion and this uh, request for the minister to respond today was moved because there are 18, when this motion was put forward, 18 reports to the committee, uh, the Environment and Communications References Committee that this government has arrogantly refused to respond to despite uh, the uh, rules and requirements and respect that was set uh, back in 1973, when, of course, during those times there was a big debate about the role of this chamber. Now, the arrogance of this government runs through everything, doesn't it? It's led from the top, Mr Morrison himself, and it goes all the way down to Senator Birmingham here today thinking, oh, he doesn't have time. It's not part of his job to have to read and consider and think about what his government's response are to reports that are put forward by this chamber. Well, it's, that's wrong. It is your job. If you want the gig of government, you take responsibility for copying accountability and scrutiny as delivered by this chamber. Um, it seems from the response of uh, Senator Birmingham, that because governments in the past and current have been tardy 
in their response and accountability. They can be tardy now. They can be tardy in relationship to responses to these serious and well considered reports put forward by fellow senators in this place. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the government of tardiness, Mr. President. Spin, mistruth, and tardiness. And we've just seen it from uh, Senator Birmingham this morning. Now, there were 18 reports that the Environment and Communications Committee have considered, have inquired into, have reported into, and that require government responses, 18 of them, some of which go back to 2014. Shame. 2014. I mean, that's how tardy and arrogant the Morrison-Joyce uh, government are. Now, yesterday, after it was clear that this uh, request for the minister to come and explain uh, the arrogance and dismissal and lack of accountability of his government. The Senate received two responses to two of these reports. Imagine that. So if we kept asking for this, maybe, maybe by the end of the next term, if they were to be re-elected, we'd get some more responses. But that is not how this process is meant to go. 18 reports with no response from this government. And why? Because they do not believe they are accountable to anyone. They don't believe they're accountable to the people of Australia. They don't believe they're accountable to the chamber. They don't believe they're accountable to the institution of the Senate. This government, the Morrison-Joyce government, thinks they, it's their way or the highway. They like to write their own rules and not have to be accountable for anything. And of course we know the attitude of Mr Morrison in all of this. Nothing's ever his fault. It's always somebody else's. And then if he gets caught out, he doesn't tell the truth. The reputation of this government is in tatters because they are unaccountable. They think they are above everybody. They are above the law. And it's led right from the top, from a prime minister who schemes and twists and thinks that everybody can be taken as a fool. No accountability, no transparency, and when you get caught out, you do your hardest to cover it up or lie through your teeth. That's what that's the hallmarks of this government. And as we lead into what is going to be the next federal election, there's only three sitting days of this chamber left. And all this request has been is that this government finally do their job to respond to the hard work of the committees in this place and the witnesses that have put forward evidence to the members of the public service who have participated in these 18 different inquiries across different issues, many of them, yes, have to do with the environment, an important issue to many and most Australians, to issues in relation to our public broadcasters and the rules that govern media in this country, another issue that is important to our community. But no, this government thinks, well, if they don't have the numbers on a committee, if they don't have the numbers to get the reports and the recommendations they want, then bugger it. They're not going to respond. Arrogant, dismissive, sneaky, always looking to blame someone else and cover up when you get caught out. That's the hallmarks of this government. And it's just been demonstrated again here today. So on the eve of a federal election, when we have three sitting days left of this chamber, the government had an opportunity to come in and give some considered contribution to important issues that this chamber has debated, inquired into and worked on since 2014. And rather than taking that seriously, 
Rather than being prepared to be held to account or to be transparent with the Australian people, we heard from the government minister. He didn't have time. Thumbing his nose at the democratic institution and role of the parliament and the right of the Australian people to ensure that there is accountability and transparency of their government. There isn't a level of accountability that this government likes, every which way they try and avoid it. Of course, there was a promise that there was going to be an anti-corruption commission in this term of government. Where, where is it? It's not happening. And why? Because Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce don't want the scrutiny, don't want to be held accountable. They don't want anybody looking into their affairs. They don't want to be held responsible for the dodgy deals that this government has made with their mates in business, in corporations, big developers who have been given green light to damage and destroy our environment. This government has an allergic reaction to truth, to accountability and to transparency. You can't trust them on anything. It's not just the smirk that frustrates and alienates the Australian people from the Prime Minister. It is, it is his arrogance to think that he doesn't have to do his job and he never owes anyone the truth. Well, this chamber is standing up today against that arrogance, not for ourselves, but for the Australian people. And the display from the minister today and the res pathetic response just proves why this government does not deserve another day in office. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise also to take note and make some remarks about the minister's contribution just now. You would think that this government, and indeed all senators in this chamber, would be seriously concerned, worried about the declining trust in politics. It is not an overstatement to say that this is a moment of crisis. Trust in Australian politics is at an all-time low. The 2019 Australian Election Survey, obviously an important resource for every person here, showed that just one in four Australians are willing to express confidence in their political leaders and institutions. I find that terribly sad. I've spent much of my life in volunteer capacities seeking to contribute to Australian democratic institutions, to public debate. It's built, built on the idea that every Australian citizen has the ability to contribute, every Australian citizen has the right to be heard, and that the Australian parliament exists to safeguard those rights, to safeguard those interests, and to ensure that we continue as a democratic community capable of taking important decisions for our nation together. Just over one in ten Australians are willing to say that they think government operates for all of the people. That statistic alone should concern every person in this chamber. And so when a minister is asked to come to this place and explain why, since 2014, Report after report after report 
that's been prepared by senators in this place has been ignored by the government, you would think he would do the Australian people the courtesy of providing a serious explanation. Because Senate inquiries are a serious political process. Senate inquiries offer the opportunity for ordinary people, working alone, working in community organisations, working as researchers, to provide a perspective on the questions that should be concerning us as a nation. And I tell you what, just at the human level, it might be a job for people in this chamber, a job that the leader of the government here was willing to disparage and make mocking remarks about, a little bit of ha-ha-ha about how funny it was back in the dim, dark days of opposition when we had to stoop to chairing committees. Well, Minister, that's not the way everybody in this place treats committees. We treat them seriously, and we know that the people who spend their time coming before us as witnesses, they take them seriously as well. These people spend hours writing submissions. Then we ask them to come to Canberra, and we ask them to provide evidence. We ask them to appear before us, to sit before us, to appear on television at times, to expose themselves to scrutiny. They come, they are willing to subject themselves and their evidence to our scrutiny. They sit before us and they answer questions. And at times that's not comfortable for those witnesses. But they do it, those ordinary Australians, those good citizens do it because they believe that our democracy matters. They believe that the deliberative processes of the Senate matter. So why is it that a minister, the leading representative of the government in this place, would have the temerity, the hubris, the arrogance to come into this chamber and treat a motion of this kind with contempt? Failed to respond to the original request to provide a response to all of these matters. Failed to provide a serious explanation for why they've done so. And it's typical of the broader approach of this government, a government which shows disrespect to, evident, disrespect to evidence, to experts, on every policy decision. And it starts with the Prime Minister, doesn't it? I've given some thought in recent years about why the Prime Minister seems so pathologically incapable of responding to the public interest. Because I'm actually a person who's generally generous about the motivations of the people around me. I know that I don't agree with many of the people on the other side, but I'm willing to acknowledge that they come here in a spirit of public service. But I have racked my brains to understand what it is that drives the Prime Minister. We've had some fairly recent free character assessments offered by some of the people who know him best. Because according to the man who now occupies the position of Deputy Prime Minister, the man, Mr Morrison, is in fact just a liar. According to the unnamed front bencher, Mr Morrison is a psycho. And according to former Premier Berejiklian, he's a horror, hor horrible person. And I think this is the kicker and the thing which explains it the most, who puts politics well, before I'll people. Senator McAllister, please resume your seat. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I do think that Senator McAllister is now straying very, very widely from uh, the matter that is before the Senate. That matter is clearly prescribed in the notice paper. It refers to matters as about responses to reference committee reports. So I ask you to bring Senator McAllister back to the substance of the matter before us. As I said uh, when a, an attempted point of order was being made against Senator Birmingham, uh, these debates are generally allowed to be fairly free-ranging. However, I will take note uh, of the answer being given, the response being provided by Senator McAllister, and I will draw her back to the matter under discussion. Thanks, Mr. Senator President. McAllister. What is needed is a leader who is willing to take responsibility for the stewardship of this place, for its functioning and its role in a democratic nation. 
He could start by committing to the ordinary processes of accountability, by responding to the reports that are provided by this place and by insisting that the ministers in his cabinet respond to the reports that are provided by senators in this place that reflect the evidence that's provided by Australian citizens. He could follow up by keeping his promise to establish some kind of national integrity body, some kind of anti-corruption commission that can deal with the rorts and the scandals that have sadly proliferated under his watch. He could possibly direct his people, his ministers and the public servants that work for them in executive government to take the Senate estimates process seriously. We're going into estimates next week and I can tell you what, what's the bet that we'll see a repeat of the behaviour that we have seen intensify over the last three or four or five years under this government? Questions taken on notice and then an irrelevant and meaningless answer provided. Public servants glancing nervously sideways at their minister to assess whether on this occasion they should just tell the truth about what is happening in a government program or whether there's some kind of punishment coming their way if they dare to speak up and actually just explain what is happening in Australian public program, whether it's responding to references reports, establishing an anti-corruption commission, dealing properly with the estimates process, this is a government that is allergic to scrutiny and accountability. The minister in this place that hid behind a whiteboard, hid behind a whiteboard rather than merely be photographed in an uncomfortable week for her. The minister who went to the cricket rather than attend a Senate hearing into the crisis which is occurring in our aged care facilities as a consequence of the pandemic. This is a government that ignores Auditor General recommendations. This is a government that's willing to defend its car park rorts, its sports rorts, its decision to purchase land at many, many times the, va the evaluation of the value of that land and sees no problem with that, sees no questions to answer. So is it any surprise at all that they've got no interest in the matters that have been considered by the Environment and Communications Committee since 2014? Questions about direct action, questions about land care. Questions about finfish aquaculture, questions about online gambling and the harms it does to Australian families, questions about climate change on fishery and the impact on fisheries and biodiversity. Do you all think that the Australian public don't care about this? Are these issues that you think aren't important? Because that is the very strong signal you are sending here. But worse, and I'll return to where I began. Worse is your contempt and disinterest in securing and stewarding the health of Australian democratic Senator institutions. McAllister, your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Um, in my small hometown of Launceston in northern Tasmania, we've broken yet another temperature record this summer. We had the driest December ever recorded. And yesterday it was reported in the media that 60,000, an estimated 60,000 Atlantic salmon, fin fish, an invasive species that are farmed in the Tamar River, died. A mass fish mortality. Because the water has warmed, the water has warmed to an extent that the nitrogen levels underneath those fish pens have starved those fish of oxygen. And those fish literally choked and drowned in their own shit in those pens. Now, that's a problem for the salmon company. But it's not just the Tamar River. We've seen hundreds and thousands of fish die in single events 
in Macquarie Harbour, on the west coast of Tasmania. And if you think that's a lot, Senator Dunningham knows this. One of the companies, Tassile, lost over a million fish in a single event in the shallow waters of the Huon Valley. Why? Because our oceans are warming, Mr President. Why am I raising this now? For two simple reasons. Two of the Senate inquiries that we have here that haven't been responded to, dating back to seven years ago, firmly put these on the national and federal political agenda, warming oceans and the problems with finfish aquaculture in Tasmania, not to mention the amazing work this committee did, the Environment and Comms Committee did, into the impacts of warming ocean back in 2016. And who in here doesn't think we've seen an unprecedented period of history where our habitats Marine habitats had changed because of warming oceans. I honestly couldn't think of a more important issue in the environment than this. I'm a bit biased because I spend a lot of time in the ocean and I care deeply about our marine ecosystems. But this is an issue that this chamber and this government have ignored. They have refused to respond to these inquiries. Now, the 2015 Finfish inquiry and I thank Labor for their support. It was actually Lisa Singh, a fellow Tasmanian at the time, who convinced her colleagues in this place to support that inquiry. That began because some secret documents were put under the Greens' door in Hobart that had leaked emails from two of the CEOs of the three salmon companies begging the state government to do their job regulating the salmon industry, because they said it is a ticking time bomb if you don't act. Companies begging for regulation. You don't see it very often, Acting Deputy President. Why this was a significant matter of national interest was because Macquarie Harbour, where we did have a ticking time bomb, it has been an unmitigated disaster since 2015. We had protected federal species in Macquarie Harbour, and Macquarie Harbour is on the edge of a World Heritage Area. Eventually, we convinced the Federal Environment Department, because of those threatened species, to go down there and talk to the Environment Protection Agency. And finally, we saw some action on destocking of salmon in those harbours. The regulation of finfish, of salmon aquaculture, is a federal issue. And yet this government has refused to take it seriously, and now they are reaping the consequences of that, as are the Tasmanian community. Another report that this government has sat on for six years is the mitigation of shark bites in this country. One of the biggest Senate inquiries I've been involved with, and I'm very proud the Greens led on this one as well. We went all around the country and took evidence from small towns like Ballina in northern New South Wales through to Sydney and Perth, northern Queensland. We listened to all the evidence and we pulled together the world's first inquiry into mitigating the risk of shark bites and how we get the balance to protect our ecosystems. Because sharks are critical to ocean health. Yet we have these fisheries devices like shark nets and drum lines that are indiscriminately killing not just sharks, but there are weapons of mass destruction to protected marine life, like turtles and rays and whales. And that was a great body of work, Mr President, but this government has never responded. And there is a number of recommendations in that inquiry on, once again, how the federal government can show leadership on this issue. And it is way past time for the federal government to show national leadership on this debate. We still see the media victimising sharks. We still see state governments like New South Wales and Queensland refuse to remove these last century responses to what is a very complex problem that has much better solutions. And they're all in that report if the federal government would just listen and pay attention. So I look forward to the minister. And by the way, uh, Acting Deputy, sorry, Deputy, 
By the way, Mr. President, <laughs> I'm so used to that, <laughs> um, having been one myself at the same time as you. Um, this, this inquiry, when we, when we were holding this inquiry, great white sharks, which are nationally protected species, there was a big push on to open great white sharks up to fishing all around this country. We saw Tony Abbott at the time, the Prime Minister, calling great white sharks the terrorists of the sea. I remember when Mr Frydenberg flew over to Western Australia and whipped up the media into a frenzy to kill great white sharks. CSIRO did a report looking at the genetics of white shark populations and found, contrary to the myths that this government was whipping up, that shark populations aren't exploding in this country. In fact, if anything, at best they're flatlining, if not continuing to decline. We're still catching these protected species in shark nets. We're still catching whales. I know Senator Waters here, who is from Queensland, knows that every year on the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast, whales are still getting entangled in these awful shark nets that are just designed to kill marine life for a false sense of security. We've recently had a tragic death of a surfer at Snapper Rocks and Greenmount in, on the Gold Coast, bitten by a shark inside a shark net. Probably had a false sense of security, like many surfers and ocean goers do, that somehow you're safe if there's shark nets there. Well, you're not. Shark nets do not make you safe from shark bites. They are simply a fisheries device designed to reduce the population of sharks and other marine life. Total indiscriminate killers. We could do so much better if we had federal leadership, Mr President, and I'm proud that the Greens have led on this issue, as they have with warming oceans through this Senate committee, as they have with trying to get some action on regulating toxic Atlantic salmon in the waterways of my home state of Tasmania. The Greens will continue to lead on these issues. And I'll finish by saying this. And Senator Daniam, I actually do hope that you provide a response to this today and we do see some action from your government on this issue. Uh, I do recognise that we are looking at uh, Commonwealth waters and other ways of farming finfish, and I'm keeping a very close eye on that, you can be sure. Um, however, I want to finish by saying this. And Senator Hanson Young has said this so eloquently already. The fact that we have 18 reports from a committee on the environment that haven't been responded to, many of them on critical, critical issues like I've outlined today, just shows this government's contempt for the environment, just how low it is on their priority, on their agenda. Critical work done by good people, including the amazing people who work in the Senate committee, the secretariat and all the fantastic people, all the witnesses around the country. There were hundreds of witnesses just on the shark inquiry, uh, Mr President, and even more submissions. And yet we've done nothing. We've failed to respond. We've failed to show leadership on an issue that I can tell you about is a significant matter of public interest. It is still one of the most talked about issues by Australians at their barbecues over summer. This idea of shark bites and whether our oceans are safe and how we better protect our marine environment. Let's actually get some responses before this parliament is finished so we can actually give that to the people who went out of their way to make submissions and inform the evidence that we need for good policy and good decisions. Senator I'm going to keep Wilson, going to you. Apologies. apologies. You. Uh, are you seeking the call? Okay, I'll go to Senator Dunningham and we'll that okay? Okay, Senator thank Dunham. you, Mr. President. Uh, look, I do um, thank senators for the contributions made on a range of important issues relating to the work of the Environment, Communications and the Arts Committee, one I used to be a member of and some of the committees that have, or the inquiries rather, that um, Senator Wish Wilson and Senator Hanson Young have spoken about. Uh, indeed, um, I participated in as well. And, uh, um, they've had their chance to say their piece, and uh, we'll just leave that on the record. But I do want to turn my attention to one of those inquiries that uh, Senator Wish Wilson referenced, and that was the one into uh, the matter of fin fish farming in Tasmania, um, something that he did indicate to the Senate I would have a high level of interest in. Uh, and it is something that uh, 
that both he and I and Senator Urquhart also, as a Tasmanian, have a very strong, and Senator McKim as well as Tasmanians, have a strong interest in, albeit though I expect Senator Urquhart and I are on a unity ticket with regard to this industry, uh, not with Senator McKim and Senator Wish Wilson. You see, uh, both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party in Tasmania support this industry. It employs over 5,000 Tasmanians, predominantly in regional communities up the northwest, down the east coast, on the west coast. We talked about Macquarie Harbour and some of the issues that have occurred there. Uh, down the Huon Valley, a huge employer in that area. Uh, and something that uh, both Senator Urquhart and I take very seriously and support. Uh, and um, the one thing with regard to this uh, inquiry I do want to focus on is the fact that uh, um, this is about an industry in Tasmania, uh, one that is regulated by the Tasmanian government, one that occurs within the waters uh, governed by the Tasmanian government, uh, managed by the Tasmanian Environment Protection Authority um, and the Department of Primary Industries, Water and the Environment something well and truly under the terms of our federation in the scope of the Tasmanian government, not the Australian government. And the committee report notes that extensively. Uh, and there are a range of recommendations that came out of it, the three that I could see before when I was having a look through this report, were recommendations for the Tasmanian government to act. Um, and last time I checked in this place, uh, the parliament we are in is the Australian parliament, uh, to which um, the Tasmanian government is not accountable, um, and they are the ones that those recommendations relate to. And I suppose another point to make with regard to this industry is that there are a order, Senator Patrick. Order. Oh, that's a ridiculous proposition, not related to this debate at all, Senator Patrick. But uh, my point is, um, you know, that we've got an inquiry that. At the time, we know the Tasmanian division of the Labor Party did not support, and, but you know, the inquiry went ahead. Um, and the reason they didn't support it because they knew it was a stunt. They knew it was just another beat up. They knew that it was something Order. that was going to be weaponised to try and trash an industry that, while not perfect, does a very good job of managing our environment. Now, this industry proudly employing 5,000 people, something I support, something I want to see improve, and if there are technological and regulatory improvements to be made in this industry, then let's make them. Let's help them make them. And that's why, rather than uh, raking over some of these issues based on emotion rather than fact and science, I'm keen to see what we can do actually within the Australian government's purview, and that is Commonwealth aquaculture, something you referenced, Senator Wish Wilson, through you, Mr President. Order. And I'm looking forward to having a science-based, fact-based discussion around what we can do to grow this industry. I don't agree that these are a toxic, poisonous species of fish, as described by uh, the previous speaker. These are a commodity farmed sustainably um, and one that we rely on for protein in diets and, of course, for economic support. This industry pays the wages of over 5,000 people. And can I say this is an important part of the Tasmanian economy and something that, as I said before, and I doubt Senator Urquhart would disagree with me, we're proud of in Tasmania. 90 per cent of our population support that industry because they vote for the parties that actually support those 5,000 people. And, uh, and I reflect on comments made by uh, those who are opposed to it, again based on emotion, not science, not fact, cherry-picking stats and data, rather than looking at these things in the context of the truth. And we end up with these horrible emotive debates, uh, which we need to steer clear of. And as I say, that's my priority. That's what I'll be doing as we head into this work that the Blue Economy CRC, a fantastic institution, uh, bringing scientists together with industry, people who actually want to grow that sector and do it well. And we've got to remember those industries, those ones that operate in the fin fish farming sector, trade on brand. And so uh, a lot of the evidence provided to that um, inquiry uh, you know, points to that fact, that uh, in order to be successful in the marketplace, you have to be able to point to your record as environmental managers and uh, ensure that you are doing the best you can. And, um, and I might just turn to the uh, government senator's 
uh, additional comments. Um, and of course, it was clear at the time Order. that uh, the government didn't support the establishment of this inquiry. One, because as I've already outlined, Mr. President, it's a matter for the Tasmanian government. And insofar as the Commonwealth of Australia is concerned, and we are heading down that path with Commonwealth aquaculture, something I'm very excited about and something I can promise you, Senator Wish Wilson, I will engage with you on directly. We've already talked about it in brief, but as work continues, you and I, I hope, can find a, a unity ticket to support a well-established uh, industry based on science that actually will be good for the environment and for the economy. That's so I can't Order. understand what Senator Wish Wilson is saying, but uh, my point is um, that I would hope uh, that we can find a way past the division. I assume that's something you would like to see, Senator Wish Wilson, that we could actually agree on that industry. And I would invite you at some point in the future to come and stand with Senator Urquhart and I as Tasmanians to support the growth of this industry in Commonwealth waters. I think that would be fantastic. Imagine doubling the size of the industry, having 10,000 Tasmanians employed in this industry. That would be fantastic. And we could do it based on science. But I'm going to take Order. a punt, Mr. President. I'm going to take a little punt here. Order. Not that I'm a gambling man, but I don't reckon I'll get any unity with the Tasmanian contingent of the Australian Greens. I don't think they'll stand with me, no matter what the science says, and they won't be standing with Senator Urquhart either, supporting growth. No matter what the Blue Economy CRC says, I expect we will be facing opposition for growth in that sector. But back to the government senator's additional comments. Uh, obviously, the government was opposed to the inquiry because it would be used as a platform for anti-industry attacks, and uh, quite clearly that was the case. It happened. And we noted also that uh, the Tasmanian Labor Party didn't support the inquiry. Um, the points made by the uh, government senators include the fact that there were appropriate systems and regulatory frameworks in, in place, but most importantly that it was a matter for the Tasmanian government. And so there's concern around the lack of response to this, but I think it's important to look at what has happened in Tasmania since that point in time under the auspices of the Tasmanian government, uh, the ones who are actually charged under regulation and legislation to regulate and manage that industry, to improve its future, to improve its impact on the environment and to ensure that it remains a strong industry. And there have been a range of changes made to how they do business down there. Not all of it, I have to say, has been supported by sections of the community that uh, no matter what we do, no matter how far we go to try and ensure Senator an industry Wilson. is sustainable, they will never, ever, ever be happy because trashing the brand of these businesses and the future livelihoods of these 5,000 Tasmanians that work in this industry is important for them because it's about politics, just like this report was about politics, not about actually improving the future of Tasmanians and making sure Order. regional communities can survive. Senator Urquhart and I, and I hope she would never disagree with me on this, stand for those jobs. And they are based on sustainable practices, based on science, improved every year. Every year those businesses get better at what they do. And we support Order. them to ensure that they can continue to improve and provide that uh, important commodity to the Australian marketplace and, of course, exports. But as I said before, None of this is about committee report responses. It's about politics. It's about division. It's about running down Tasmanian jobs and businesses. And I say to those who keep doing this, who keep uh, highlighting divisions and trying to run these uh, entities down, stop it. It's not what the majority of Tasmanians and indeed Australians want. They want us to get on with creating conditions that are actually supportive of jobs and environmental outcomes that are based on science, not emotion. Senator Arnhem, your time. Senator Thorpe was to her <coughs> feet Thank first. You. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, as a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, uh, one of the highest governance training in this country, I learnt a lot about accountability and transparency. And coming out of that training and coming into this place, I see a very real lack of accountability and transparency, which is the very essence of how you govern 
an organisation, a corporation, an organ uh, and I thought uh, a country. Uh, obviously, that isn't the case, uh, and maybe they should include that in that training. That when you get to the place of uh, governing the country, <laughs> accountability and transparency just does not apply, particularly to this government. Uh, to hear the government's contribution and excuses uh, as to why they can't be accountable uh, and transparent to the people of this country is an absolute joke. To hear the government talk about science and sustainable practices while well, they've got black senators uh, in this country who come from over 65,000 years of sustainable practices in this country uh, is also an absolute insult. Uh, and you want to think about standing for the acknowledgement to country uh, the next time we sit, because if you can't acknowledge the over 65,000 years of sustainable practices and our survival as first people in this country, then sit down for the acknowledgement. Because an acknowledgement to country is about obeying the law of this land. The law of this land is about not harming the land. It's about not harming the water. It's about not harming the animals and everything that belongs to these lands. So sit down to the acknowledgement to country and, of course, take your dot paintings down because I'm sure uh, you've got some animals and totems in your dot paintings that are in danger of becoming extinct right now. Uh, so while you have your hand on your heart um, and standing up to acknowledge us, you're actually stabbing us in the back and murdering our totems and our land and our water in the same breath. You talk about commodity and the land and water being your commodity, stolen land and stolen water and stolen wealth from uh, our commodity. Uh, we don't see it in the same way. The land is our mother. The way we look at our land and our water is the same way we look at our mother. Now, if you can sell your mother as a commodity, then you're gross. It's disgusting that you could sell your own mother off and treat your own mother the way you treat our mother in this country, raping and pillaging our mother. Would you do that to your own mother? I ask you, because look at it through the First People's eyes of this country and understand the hurt and pain you're causing our water and our land and our air and our people. And those reports that you refuse to acknowledge or answer to are part of the solution of healing these lands and these waters. And I know you're not interested in that, and I know Labor are aren't really interested either, only when it suits them. But we know your position on protecting country, and you treat us like a bunch of greeny activists when the greeny activists or the Greens party are in step and absolutely respect the first people of this country. So if anyone is guiding the Greens party on how to care for this country, it's the first people of these lands. So don't, don't refer to us as some you know, breakout party that causes you grief because you're doing the wrong thing with your mates over here, Labor. Look at us in a way that you stand for the acknowledgement for country because you need to have a bit more respect and you need to account for the destruction and desecration that you are causing and creating for our future generations. You've been doing it since you arrived on your boats. Since you arrived on your boats illegally to this country, the colonisers 
who have only saw our land and water as a commodity to destroy and make money from so that you're comfortable in your privilege and your mates who are giving you the money who run all of these outfits to destroy and destruct is all sit back with your privilege and you know what? Your children and your grandchildren are going to look at you in 10, 20 years' time and they're going to say, what did you do? What did you do for us? And what are you going to say to them? I want to know what you're going to say to your grandchildren when they don't have clean water to drink, when they have to stay inside because the heat is so unbearable that people are dropping like flies. What are you going to say to your children and grandchildren? What are you going to say to the young people of this country who are out there fighting for their lives, trying to tell Labor and you, the Libs and Nats, that you need to do more to sustain our future? We want clean air. We want clean water. We don't need fossil fuels. We don't need the destruction and desecration of country and water. There are other ways to do this. Do you think all those young people marching for climate change and climate action, do you think they're going to take up one of your jobs in your departments to destroy and destruct? No. No. They're going to be looking after your children and your grandchildren. They're the ones putting their arms around your grandchildren and saying, come with us. We just have to try and survive for another couple of years before the wave comes or the heat wave comes or the dirty water comes, which we know is already happening. We know communities don't have clean water because of the decisions that are made in this place. We know that you're stealing land off traditional owners to destroy and destruct. What does that say for our future? What, what do you want left? Like what really? Because you've had free run to destroy and destruct and you've made a lot of money out of it. What are you going to leave us? What are you going to leave the first people of these lands? What are you going to leave the children and young people of this country? You're going to leave them in an absolute mess, an absolute dire, dire mess where they'll be gasping for their air where they'll be desperate for clean water. Like, wake up. Why can't you see this, right? It's happening now, and you can't even provide any feedback about the importance of protecting country. Why can't you protect country with us? Why can't we protect country together for all Australians? Why is it such a big ask? Why do these fossil fuel companies and companies that are set up to destruct and destroy, why do they have precedence? Because money won't matter when we're fighting for our life. Your status won't matter when we're fighting for our life. COVID shows that. Rich, poor, it affects everybody. You will be affected. What are you doing for your children, I ask? We are fighting every last breath to maintain the survival of our young people in this country and our old people, because our old people drop from the heat. What are you going to say to that? Senator Thorpe. Your time has expired. Senator Chisholm was on his feet. Sorry, Senator Davey.
of the Labor Green Scare campaign with his performance before um, on a unity ticket with Senator Urquhart and supporting the Tasmanian fishing industry, as plenty of other senators do in this place. Uh, I'm sure he'll get a rap over the knuckles for that. But I wasn't really going to come in and contribute to this debate until I saw the performance of Minister Birmingham before. And it really was, as Senator Henson Young said, a disrespectful and arrogant performance. And you can understand that he's probably not in a good mood this morning. The government haven't had the best of weeks. Um, but it's not as if he's been busy passing legislation. Um, I don't know what else he has been up to this week if they couldn't respond um, to these important um, 18 reports of the Senate committee. And uh, I've had the misfortune of being on the Senate committee with Senator Wish Wilson on and off over the last uh, couple of years as well. And I re recently just came back on it. And I was astonished to see that there were still so many reports outstanding um, that the government had not responded to. Uh, it really is astounding that they have been so derelict in their duty that they haven't responded to some of these important reports. And I'll come back to this later because you may think, oh, well, these are just you know, Senate committee reports, but they do touch on really important issues uh, and they have real life consequences for people. And I had an experience of that uh, recently, and I'll, I'll come to that later on the road trip I did through north and central Queensland with the federal Labor leader, Anthony Albanese. But the Australian community take these Senate reports very seriously. Anyone who's been involved in these committees know that the Australian people who participate, um, experts, those people who have lived experience and turn up and give evidence, they take this very seriously. They think it's important that they get the opportunity to express their ideas or their experience or their knowledge so that then the senators can then take that and put it into report. And I think we've seen from the debate on this today that there often is contestability in this, where um, Labor and the Greens will disagree, um, Labor and the government will disagree. That's exactly what you want when you're preparing these reports. You want some contestability, but it's also why you want the government to respond, um, so that they're actually looking at this, the evidence that's been gathered from experts, from those with lived experiences, so that they can actually use that and implement it and turn it into policy. But it does go to the arrogance of this government, it also goes to the lack of accountability for this government and the fact that we're having this debate this morning um, in the same week that they've announced that they're going to junk and not actually pursue a federal integrity commission. Um, it is no surprise when you look at the way they treat Senate committees, when you look at the way they treat the Senate, when you look at the way they treat accountability and integrity issues, um, this government always looks the other way. And they do it in so many areas. So it's quite remarkable when you think about it. They, they haven't responded to 18 important Senate committee reports from Environment and Comms, but they took half an hour in a meeting with no due diligence to give almost half a billion dollars to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. So they can go and do that with half a billion dollars, uh, with no notice, no due diligence, but yet they can't respond to these important reports, despite some of them having um, more than seven years. And I wanted to go to the real life consequences of this and just so, some of the reports that I've been involved with. But you look at the retirement of coal fired power stations, and what triggered that was the closure of Hazelwood. So, something that had a significant impact on regional Victorian communities, uh, and something that the government has not responded to. You think there would be something in that they could learn, something in that that they would be able to better respond to, yet nothing, no response from the government on this important issue. And the other one that, uh, that I had some recent experience of is in relation to the impact of feral deer, pigs and goats in Australia. So this is something that uh, I had some involvement with when it was before the committee. And just on that road trip I did with the federal Labor leader earlier in January, um, we stopped at a banana farm near Tully that was run by Stephen Lowe. And for those who don't know, the Panama disease has had a significant impact on the banana industry in North Queensland. Um, and Stephen, uh, the owner of that farm, was talking to us because he's so concerned that the Panama disease is only one farm away from his. And one of the things that is transporting uh, the Panama disease across farms is feral pigs. 
So you might think that, oh, well, what's this? You know, what's the real life consequence? Well, this is someone who has put their livelihoods into building this farm, uh, and they know that feral pigs are causing the problem of spreading Panama disease across farms in North Queensland. Yet this government, this Liberal national government, can't take can't find the time to respond to such an important issue in far north Queensland. So there's this a farmer who employs plenty of people, who provides good support to the local community, um, who's doing the right thing by his farm and trying to build a long-term uh, operation in North Queensland. Uh, he knows the risk of Panama disease. He knows the risk of feral pigs, issues that were tackled in this Senate report, yet the government can't find the time for it. The Liberal National Government, the so-called uh, party that is supposed to look after farmers can't take the time to respond. So when you think about these reports, you might think, oh, they're abstract and they don't really have real life experience. It does for this farm in near Tully. It does for these banana growers because they know that government action on this to stop feral pigs from spreading Panama disease is actually going to be the difference between their livelihoods or them uh, falling by the wayside. So it's important when we look at these Senate reports, they're not just uh, you know, glory exercises by senators, they actually have a real impact on real people and real livelihoods and also on communities as well because banana farming in North Queensland is a significant industry. It employs hundreds of people uh, and it is something that the government needs to turn their attention to. So just a couple of examples about the real life consequences of the government not responding to these, not adequately addressing these issues that therefore mean people's livelihoods and communities are at risk. So it does go to the accountability, the transparency of this government, the fact that they came in here today, uh, the way they have treated the response of senators raising this important issue, uh, and it does go to the arrogance uh, of this government. And we see it more and more, and it is really troubling that there's so many reports outstanding uh, so many issues that this government uh, can be called into question on when it comes to integrity and accountability, uh, yet they continue to run, they continue to hide, and it is absolutely disgusting that this week uh, they said they would be abandoning a Federal Integrity Commission. Uh, so there's no doubt that the Australian people are sick and tired of this government, they're sick and tired of the rorts and the waste, they're sick and tired of the arrogance. Uh, and this has been another example today of an arrogant government, uh, an arrogant minister, uh, an arrogant performance, uh, when they really have nothing to be arrogant about. Senator Davey, you have about 20 seconds. Oh, beauty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, the first thing I will say very briefly is that, you know, don't cast stones in glass houses. Can Labor honestly stand there and say that they effectively and efficiently responded to every single report that was produced by a Senate committee when they were last in government? Because I can assure you that no, Senator they did Davey. not. Senator Davey, the time for the debate has expired. The question is that the Senate take note. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, we will now move on to, uh, I will call the Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I find myself here again under order of the Senate, um, uh, an order of the Senate that, uh, that is uh, highly politically motivated in terms of the, uh, the relentless politicisation of matters in relation to aged care, the relentless politicisation of delicate matters in relation to uh, COVID-19, uh, the approach that is being taken uh, by those opposite uh, that seems to um, put reality of COVID-19, of the Omicron variant, of the many challenges and infectiousness that it, proposed, that it, uh, that it uh, results in uh, to one side, uh, just in pursuit uh, of political points, uh, and in particular in pursuit of political points against uh, the Minister for Aged Care Services. Uh, Mr President, I reject uh, the basis upon which this motion has been made, the many accusations that have been made uh, and indeed will be made, I'm sure, in the debate that will ensue. Uh, I want to state very, very clearly, uh, Mr President, uh, the support for Minister Colbeck, uh, the work that he does, has done 
continues to do and will continue to do uh, across the government. And the support, though, not just for Minister Colbeck, because it is not about him. It's about a team of health experts, aged care experts across different government agencies that he works closely with. Uh, it's about all of those different officials and employees across the Australian Public Service who have been working with him, with the government, with Minister Hunt, uh, to make sure that they do all possible from a Commonwealth level in support then of the people who it is really about, and that is, of course, aged care workers, aged care residents, uh, those people on the front line of aged care in perhaps the most difficult time that aged care facilities have faced around the world. In terms of modern aged care facilities, I think we can say with a high degree of confidence that none have faced situations in any country like COVID-19 has brought to them in the last couple of years. Now, Mr President, I'm sure that we will see uh, slurs and attacks made on Minister Colbeck uh, about his attendance at the cricket. I want to make very clear uh, that Minister Colbeck, of course, as those in this chamber know, is not just the Minister for Aged Care Services. He is also the Minister for Sport and he is also the senior government senator uh, from Tasmania. All of you know the circumstances in terms of the different roles and responsibilities he has within those different um, roles that he has. However, even with that, I know that he continues to give enormous priority and precedence to the work he has to do as Minister for Aged Care Services because of the global challenges and then uh, how they materialise in Australia the local challenges the aged care sector faces. So on January 14, when some will allege uh, that Minister Colbeck uh, was not at his job, he instead was actually hard at it in terms of participating um, in many different aspects of the aged care response, but they included the COVID vaccine and response meeting led by Task Force Commander Lieutenant Gen General John Fruin, a meeting of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, and with the Acting Secretary for the Department of Health on a range of different aged care matters, including the status at that stage of outbreaks across the aged care sector, a meeting with the Deputy Chief Medical Officer to discuss aged care advisory group actions uh, and to work through uh, all of those different issues. They are just some of the things in relation to uh, the work in the aged care services uh, portfolio that Minister Colbeck undertook on that day, as he does on every day. On every day in terms of working through these issues with his engagement with all of those senior officials, with the sector in terms of addressing the challenges uh, of COVID-19. He also has made himself very available to, because I'm sure this will come up as well, the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19. Uh, appearing multiple occasions before that committee, uh, as well as, of course, the times he has appeared before Senate estimates committees and the endless questions that he continues to face in this chamber about the important issues as they relate to aged care. Now, they are important issues. Nobody denies the fact that the challenges in aged care are real. Um, and as I said before, they are real not just in Australia, but right around the world. That, tragically, there is a loss of life as a result of COVID around the world and in Australia and in aged care facilities in Australia. But of course, in those aged care facilities, there is also a sad and tragic loss of life uh, across the country every day for a range of factors in terms of the individuals at end of life that they are caring for and supporting. Now, the government's response to supporting aged care has been to focus on vaccines where we can, and every single aged care facility has had the opportunity for their residents to have not just a first dose, not just a second dose, but have had the opportunity to have a booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine as well. As is known, the one area that the government led in terms of urging for and supporting a mandate in relation to vaccines was in aged care. 
working with the states and territories to see them uh, enact uh, those requirements across the board. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the government, under the leadership of Ministers Colbeck and Hunt, has sought to provide significant support to the aged care sector, more than $2.5 billion worth of investment and support to the aged care sector, with more than $1.5 billion of that $2.5 billion of additional support being made available to the aged to support the aged care workforce in particular. Mr President, we do recognise the challenges of the workforce that have been exacerbated uh, by the widespread of the Omicron variant and the associated isolation requirements that have ensued. That's required us to trigger uh, the various availabilities for surge workforce assistance across the country. Uh, as at the 4th of February, more than 80,000 shifts have been filled by workforce surge staff uh, supporting the aged care sector. Uh, as I understand it, uh, there are around 852 current deployments uh, of surge staff and support at active outbreak sites across residential aged care facilities. A range of different providers supporting that operation, including the Australian Defence Force, with the capabilities they have to hand. Of course, the type of work they do is supported by the significant volumes of personal protective equipment and other equipment that we've made available to support aged care throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've seen tens of millions uh, of masks, of gowns, of gloves, goggles, of face shields, uh, hundreds of thousands of hand sanitizer, millions of rapid antigen tests dispatched to aged care facilities to help meet the unique needs and challenges they face. None of that equipment, none of these things make it easy in aged care facilities because COVID-19 cannot be easy in terms of the management in aged care facilities. And our thoughts in particular go to the workforce who we've supported not just Mr. President, uh, in terms of uh, providing the surge capacity uh, and additional staff capacity in that regard, but who we have also supported uh, through uh, bonus and retention payments that have been made during the course of the pandemic. Four separate workforce bonus payments made uh, to aged care workers, recognising the additional stresses that have been placed upon them. These temporary actions we've taken in, uh, in response to COVID-19 in the aged care sector are in addition to the fundamental reforms that we are pursuing in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission and that Minister Colbeck, together with Minister Hunt, has been leading in relation uh, to those reforms in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission. Last year's budget, and then with further updates in the mid-year budget update, more than $18 billion has been committed and is being delivered through the aged care sector to support comprehensive areas of reform recommended by the Royal Commission. Additional home care places, uh, additional arrangements in relation to minimum staff, uh, additional safety requirements, uh, all different areas that Minister Colbeck is well versed to speak on and to detail. The government's response has been comprehensive. The government has been clear in terms of what we are doing, how we are going about it and the funds provided to it. The opposition seek to be critics, but they offer no alternative. They've offered no alternative in relation to the responses uh, to the aged care sector, but for one that I suspect, again, we will see in this debate, uh, that they will seek uh, to trot out uh, as, part of, uh, as part of their uh, attacks on Minister Colbeck and the government, uh, and that is that the opposition says they would make a submission for aged care workers uh, to uh, receive um, a higher wage outcome from the process before uh, the independent umpire at the Fair Work Commission. Now, the government supports the Fair Work Commission process. We support the decisions, whatever they may be, of the independent umpire, and we've provided information to it. Those opposite, though, want to have their cake and eat it too on that debate. They say there should be an increase, but they don't have the guts to actually say what it should be. They won't say whether it should be a cent, or a dollar, or a hundred dollars, or a thousand dollars. 
They won't put any figure on it. It is a hollow promise they're making. And of course, the reason that they won't put any dollars on it is because they don't want to have to account for it. What trust, what faith can aged care workers have in relation to those opposite? If they run around saying, we think there should be an increase, we would make a submission, but we won't actually say what we would put in that submission, and we're not going to budget a single cent to actually deliver upon it. What confidence can they have that it is nothing other than a cheap political stunt by those opposite to seek to take advantage of a sector that is stressed, that is challenged, uh, that is facing uh, a global challenge and crisis, uh, the likes of which um, they have never confronted before and their counterparts around the world have never confronted before. But in Australia, we have managed, notwithstanding the enormous challenges of this, and to keep COVID-19 at bay whilst in the main, to keep it in the main at bay whilst vaccinations were developed, the vaccination program rolled out. During that time, we have seen uh, the benefit uh, or the improvement, at least in the sense that whilst uh, the Omicron variant may be much more infectious, it also results in around 70 per cent less in terms of severe health outcomes. So what we've successfully done as a country through our closed borders, through other measures that we, states and territories, industry and others have achieved uh, was to buy the time to get the vaccinations done, to get the vaccines developed initially, of course, around the world uh, and to have a more resilient environment in aged care today. So I have no doubt, Mr President, that we will hear plenty of politicking to come uh, from those opposite, plenty of sniping at Minister Colbeck uh, that, uh, that will be uh, unfair and personalised and, uh, and seek, of course, uh, to continue to paint uh, a picture uh, of an aged care sector not supported by the government or, uh, or the officials hard at work uh, in, in actually delivering support on the ground. The picture those opposite paint uh, is not an accurate one, and it is certainly not one that actually reflects and understands the complexities in the aged care sector, the complexities in dealing with COVID-19. Uh, it pretends uh, that somehow there are alternate universes in which COVID can be locked in a box, in which Omicron is not actually as transmissible as it is. That's just not true. There are real challenges that we all have to deal with. What we have sought to do is provide as much support in a very challenging environment uh, as possible. And I know that Minister Colbeck will continue to do that uh, with the greatest of diligence and effort uh, to the task at hand. Senator Gallagher. I thank you very much. And I thank the Leader of the Government in the Senate for, for uh, coming and providing uh, that speech this morning. Despite what the uh, Senator Birmingham says, the picture we paint— Sorry, paint, Senator Gallagher, you just need to move to take note oh, of— I'm sorry, I move to take note of um, Senator Birmingham's statement. Thank you. Despite what Senator Birmingham said, the picture we paint is an accurate picture of what's happening in aged care at the moment. We have an aged care system that is broken. We have an aged care system that is in crisis. We have an aged care system where it cannot be guaranteed at the moment that elderly people living in residential aged care are receiving the quality of care that they deserve. There are too many stories of neglect. There are too many stories of loved ones who have lost mums and dads and grandparents and, in some cases, younger people living in residential aged care in terrible circumstances that will devastate those families and those individuals uh, for years to come, if not forever. Now, this isn't the fault of the staff who work in there. There are not enough of them. They don't get paid enough. You can't retain them because they can get better pay outside the sector. And the providers support this view. You know, it's not us sitting here politicking. This is the snapshot of aged care at the moment. And I know the minister knows that because he will be getting the same emails and the same correspondence that we are getting. 
awful stories of what is currently happening in aged care. And I know the government want to say, well, Omicron or well, COVID. And while COVID has stressed this, the system, it's not the cause of the, the broken system we have. That has been years in the making. 22 reports, a royal commission, an interim report titled Neglect, a treasurer, now prime minister, who cut funding from aged care when we were in the world of a surplus at any cost, despite the fact that it's going to hurt elderly Australians. When we were living in that world and that political reality, that's what the prime minister did. And those cuts and that, those failures of years to, ago are coming back to roost now. And yes, we do hold this minister responsible. Perhaps not, he's not responsible for all of the failures of the system. That goes to his predecessors as well. But at some point, somebody has to take responsibility. And we have, under this minister, and, and if I can just deal with the cricket again, I know this has become a talking point. The cricket is symbolic of a complacent government that has not worked during its nine years to fix a system. I don't care that Mr. Minister Colbeck went to the cricket. I wish I could have gone to the cricket that day. I like the cricket. But the fact is we were told by Minister Colbeck that he could not attend and he did not want to see resources diverted from dealing with the crisis and therefore he could not support the committee hearing. You know, that is the problem, that we weren't told the truth. And that smacks of complacency and arrogance and disrespect for the Senate. But from my point of view, the real issue is about what's happening for people in age, living in aged care. We have the Defence Force currently working in there. And yes, there is an impact from COVID, but we have a system where there are you know, nearly 200,000 Australians at their most vulnerable living in a system where we cannot guarantee that they are going to be cared for properly. And that is a failure of this minister and it is a failure of this government. And under our system, as I said, it might not be fair to lay 100 per cent of the fault at Minister Colbeck's feet. Maybe 50 per cent of it should be with the Prime Minister. Maybe more should be with the Prime Minister, seeing as how he made all the cuts to aged care years ago. But under our system, the minister does take responsibility. The system is in crisis. Hundreds of people are dying. The staff are leaving the sector in droves, and the government doesn't have the answers and hasn't made the investments over years that would have provided elderly Australians with the protection they deserve. It is a national shame that we accept the system as it is. It has to be better, and the minister has to be held to account. Senator Smith. Well, that was a very, very interesting <coughs> contribution from Senator Gallagher. Very, very interesting contribution from Senator Gallagher. What we heard was a catalogue of criticisms without any solutions. A catalogue of criticisms without, without any solutions. What is the definition of politics in this place? What is the definition of politicking in this Senate chamber? That definition is coming into this place with your criticisms and not offering up a plan. Not offering up a plan. But this is Labor not offering up a plan today or not offering up a plan yesterday when Bill Shorten went to the election at the last election and asked for support from the Australian people. Guess what he said about aged care and guess what he said about the funding of aged care? You're right. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Silence. So Australians are right to ask, if Bill Shorten had been elected Prime Minister and this country was confronted with a pandemic, what would aged care funding look like? What would it look like? If you can't tell Australians at an election, on the day you're giving your National Press Club speech, what aged care funding looks like, if you're to be elected, then Australians cannot trust you. I'm very confident that aged care would be in a significantly different place if Labor had won the last election. Minister Colbeck has steward this, stewarded this country in aged care policy 
through significant landmark reforms. I say that as someone who has watched through the Community Affairs Committee process very, very closely the contributions he has made. But let me identify one important contribution that Senator Gallagher and I'm sure other Labor senators choose to ignore. And I would hope that if Senator Seward was still here, Senator Waters, she would draw attention to this very, very important and particular issue. And that is the work that Minister Colbeck has specifically done around strengthening regulations as they apply to physical and chemical constraints in aged care homes. I hope that if the Greens make a contribution, I hope that a future contribution by Labor will at least have the decency to recognise that this is a minister who has not only just pursued reforms and fought to have them well funded, funded at historically high levels, this is a minister who has been tackling other issues which are just as important in our aged care system. Senator Waters, that's your challenge. I challenge you to at least recognise, because Senator Seward would have had the decency, she would absolutely have had the decency to do that, because Senator Colbeck has worked closely with people like Senator Seward when she was in this place. It is just unacceptable, it is just unacceptable for Labor to continue to come into this place arguing for reforms to aged care, arguing for funding for aged care workers, and not even offer up a solution, not even offer up a figure, not even a figure. Even the newspapers were forced to report that Anthony Albanese, in making a pledge for aged care, he made a loose commitment that he would fund aged care. But guess what he didn't do? He did not put a figure. He did not put a figure. Is he saying that the future forward estimates increases in aged care funding are guaranteed, or are they not guaranteed? Because when Labor was in government previously, they did change aged care funding and they dialed it down. They dialed it down. Now Labor doesn't talk about that, doesn't want to talk about that, but your record, your record is appalling. So at least have the decency while drawing necessary attention, and Senator Gallagher made a very good point, these issues are complex. There's a matrix of issues. But guess where the devastation happened the most for families of people in aged care? In the state of Victoria. So at least have the decency to identify that Premier Daniel Andrews, poor contract tracing, allowing community transmission in the community, then all those aged care deaths. Don't believe me. Go to the Senate estimates transcripts and look at what Commonwealth health officials had to say. These are the facts. This is a minister who is diligent, who is committed, who is available and has been pursuing reforms across the entire aged care sector. The challenge actually is on Labor. The challenge is on Labor. As we approach the federal election, people will be interested in knowing what is the alternative aged care solution. And thus far, thus far, Labor has said nothing. Labor has said nothing, and it's committed not one red cent. Sen the challenge on Senator aged care Smith, going forward your is yours. Time has expired, Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise this morning to speak to Senator Watt's motion that asks the government to explain why Minister Colbeck remains the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. The Minister for Aged Care has failed to keep older people safe. And the federal government is responsible for aged care, and they have done a shocking job at keeping older people safe in this country. The Minister for Aged Care has failed, and the word failed has to be reiterated in all accounts, failed in the vaccine rollout, failed to provide boosters to older Australians and their carers, failed to provide PPE. Aged care workers still have to pay for their own rapid antigen tests. This is simply unacceptable. Older people in residential aged care are missing out on basic care and hygiene due to the workforce shortages and, of course, to the COVID crisis. Our older people are locked down and isolated from family and friends because of this government's failure to protect them. Where's the minister's accountability? It's missing in action, as usual. Yesterday, in my home state of WA, we recorded our first two cases of Omicron in an aged care facility. These cases were detected in a residential aged care facility in Bentley. I'm extremely worried about the threat of COVID in aged care facilities, particularly in WA, as we open our border. And we should be learning the lessons from the COVID crisis here on the East Coast. 
and doing everything we can to support aged care services, particularly in Western Australia. And these are not new, new issues in the aged care sector. These have been going on for decades. And the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety found that there were unacceptable high levels of abuse and neglect in aged care. And in fact, any, that intersection of disability, anyone that's over 65 years of age, is in aged care. The, crisis was in, the system was in crisis before COVID arrived. That needs to be acknowledged. And thanks to a decade of funding cuts by successive governments, this is the place that we find ourselves in. The care economy is one of our highest workforce. The aged care workers in this country are underpaid and overworked. They're, they are some of the lowest paid people in the country and they have been working tirelessly throughout this pandemic to support older people in our communities. They absolutely deserve better. The Royal Commission recommended that the government in this sector put in place, um, put in applications to the work Fair Work Commission to increase their wages. The latest federal budget, budget included no ongoing wage increase for these workers. The one-off payment that they announced recently by the Morrison government just is not enough. It's not enough. When we, this is our largest workforce in this country. Without serious long-term commitments to improve pay, conditions and training, this government will be unable to implement the recommendations from the Royal Commission. Unlike the major parties, the Greens are strongly backing the calls from the unions for permanent wage increases for aged care workers. And the Greens are the only party arguing that aged care should not be run for profit. Big corporations should not be making millions of dollars for the provision of essential social services. And I want to note that was the work that uh, Senator Rachel Seawitt had done so tirelessly in this sector. And for profit, companies now have gotten away with substandard care for too long, which is now why we are at crisis point in this global pandemic. So for the folks out there that are watching, we are having an election very soon. By voting Greens in this election, we have a chance to kick out this government, the one that have caused this situation and exacerbated this situation, and your vote is powerful. So together, we can kick them out and we can ensure that everyone in this country has access to high-quality aged care services. Thank you. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, and I believe it's important for me to make a contribution um, as a part of this debate, because I thought it's important that I express the commitment that I have always had through this portfolio uh, since I was appointed to it on coming to um, at the beginning of this parliamentary term, Mr. President. This is a difficult portfolio that has been exacerbated, and the dif that difficulty has been exacerbated by COVID-19. As has been acknowledged through the debate, I came to the portfolio with a Royal Commission which exposed a whole range of issues that needed to be addressed in aged care. And Mr President, that is my commitment to address those issues in aged care. It's been made all the more difficult, all the more difficult by the circumstances of COVID. And I'd just like to quickly address a couple of things. There's been a lot of comment made about the booster rollout. The booster rollout, Mr. President, is well ahead of what it was originally programmed to be. While Labor were having their holidays over Christmas, we received advice on Christmas Eve that the period between uh, second and third shots should be brought forward. This government, over Christmas, while Labor was on holidays, worked to bring forward the booster shots for residential aged care facilities in this country, and they were all, have all now been achieved. Every facility in the country has been visited. These are the things that keep me and my departmental officials awake at night to make sure that we do everything that we possibly can in support of residents in residential aged care. I've had the opportunity to work in facilities as a contractor before coming to this place. I've seen the way that the industry change, has changed, but I also understand that there is further reform required. This government, Mr President, has put in place the most comprehensive response in history to any royal commission. $17.7 billion, a five-pillar, five-year reform program for this industry. 
That $17.7 billion post my FO now, ex now is in excess of $18 billion. This government's commitment cannot be questioned. And the criticism from the other side would actually mean something if they actually had a plan, Mr. President. They have no plan. They have no response to the Royal Commission almost a year Minister. since it was handed down. Minister. Please resume your seat. The time for the debate has expired. The question is that the Senate take note. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Uh, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. President, I present the first report of 2022. Oh, first report feels like <laughs> feels like 2021 still. Uh, first, sorry, my apologies. Uh, first report of 2022 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Sen Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I just um, wish to move. Uh, two amendments to uh, this well, report. To move to adopt. Oh, my first. bad. Senator, Sorry. Senator Smith. Did, yep. The first report of 2022 be adopted. Yep. Senator McKim. Apologies, uh, Senator Smith, and thank you, uh, President. If I could just flag, the Greens do have um, a number of amendments um, to this report, and um, after the two amendments that I will. Um, shortly be moving. Uh, Senator Rice and Senator Waters will also uh, have amendments. So um, my first amendment is that uh, at the end of the motion add and in respect of the social media anti-trolling bill 2022 contingent upon introduction in the House of Representatives, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 24th of March 2022. Uh, and the second, uh, well, I'll, actually, um, President, perhaps you could advise me. Should I just speak to this one first, or can I move them together? I, I, you, you get one five-minute slot, so you probably I'll move them, should I'll move, move them both. Both, and President. Speak to thank them both. you. So the second um, amendment is that at the end of the motion, add and in respect of the Treasury Laws Amendment, Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance. Pool Bill 2022. The provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 24 March 2022. And the reason that um, these amendments are critical is, uh, and I'll speak um, first to the Treasury Laws uh, Amendment Bill, is that um, this bill, uh, in effect, um, creates a system where the government becomes an insurer of last resort. And, but it will only apply to a, a, a relatively small geographical part of the country. Now, the reason the government has to do this, or the go government wants to do this, is because insurance companies are vacating the field. And the reason that insurance companies are vacating the field is because of climate change. Now, what we are facing is a climate that is breaking down around us. And governments are going to have to come to grips with this because more and more we will see insurance companies, and in particular driven by the massive global multinational reinsurance companies, vacating the field, which will mean that ordinary Australians won't be able to get insurance on their homes and their properties and their businesses. But this shouldn't just be limited to one small part of the country. This is a valid and growing area of concern around the whole country, and it's only going to get worse. So it's critical that this bill be referred to an inquiry so that Australians from right around the country who will not benefit from this bill can have their voices heard and Australians who are extremely worried 
about the lack of climate action and climate ambition of both major parties in this place can make those views heard. What needs to happen on this bill, ultimately, is that we should be putting a levy on the companies that massively profit from burning fossil fuels and logging our native forests and emitting massive carbon emissions as a result. We should be levying them to pay for schemes like this. That's why this needs to go to an inquiry, um, Mr. President, and that's why the Greens have moved um, this amendment. In the short time uh, left to me, I'll just quickly uh, indicate why we believe that um, the Social Media Anti-Trolling Bill uh, 2022 needs to go to an inquiry. Um, uh, of course, something um, needs to be done to address some of the online harms uh, that are caused by uh, trolls. This bill does not do that. This is actually not an anti-trolling bill, uh, as it's claimed um, in the title. And what we've seen um, from this government is a continued erosion of rights and freedoms and liberties uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, this bill is yet another step uh, in that dangerous path down the road to a surveillance state and a police state. And on that basis, uh, if on no other basis, this bill should be referred to an inquiry so people can have a say about that. All right. Now, unless there is someone who wishes to vote separately, I will put these two amendments together. Is that acceptable? All right. So I, I will put the two amendments moved by Senator McKim. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I understand there are further. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Yes, I seek to move uh, three amendments to the Sorry, it's been a long week. I seek to move three amendments to the selection of bills committee report. Uh, they've been circulated in the chamber, numbers three, four, and five. Um, they pertain to removing the three latest electoral bills from being rammed through this chamber because we would like to refer those three electoral bills to a committee for scrutiny in the ordinary manner of all legislation because no one should be passing legislation that they haven't even seen until 24 hours ago. Um, so these amendments uh, refer each of these three electoral bills, one about COVID enfranchisement, one about authorisations and one about foreign influences to the um, Finance and Public Admin Committee for inquiry by uh, 25th of March. So this is a, a fairly tight inquiry time frame as it is, um, but Senator Waters, people are looking I'll just at me strangely. Interrupt briefly, we don't have. Apparently, these haven't been circulated. Ah, okay. I I'm sure our chamber attendants Please. will do their very best to circulate them. Um, that is the effect of the amendments to refer those three electoral bills to finance and public admin for an inquiry by the 25th of March. So that will soon be with you on a piece of paper shortly. The reason that we need uh, these bills to be properly inquired into is because no one should pass laws that they've only just seen in draft form 24 hours ago. And particularly not laws that relate to people's ability to vote and choose the government of the day. Now, some of these bills sound innocuous. Maybe they are. But we will never know unless we have time to scrutinise them and hear from experts and potentially find loopholes or, or nefarious um, consequences that the Senate might then seek to amend uh, and close and change. That's the whole point of an inquiry. So it's kind of um, ironic that we need to be arguing for basic process here. Uh, but I might just point out that this, these three bills are the tenth electoral bills that we've seen in five months. So we have had a flurry of attempts by this government to try to change very fundamental rules about voting and elections in the shadow of an election that they are desperate to attempt to win because they are so deeply unpopular throughout the entire community, in particular the Prime Minister. This is not the way to win an election um, by trying to rig the system at the last minute and ran through bills that suit your own purposes. Um, it's pretty shameless, folks, even for you. So we'd like these bills to be inquired into. Um, and I might also add that the last time we dealt with electoral legislation, this government was proposing to bring in the requirement for voters to show identification 
before they voted, and to then set up a convoluted process, which was impractical um, in the event that someone couldn't provide identification. Now, this was a pure attempt to disenfranchise, and it would have had the effect of disenfranchising First Nations people, of disenfranchising people without a home, um, of disenfranchising women fleeing from violence. For all of those reasons, they might not have their ID papers with them, they might not have ID papers at all, they might not have a, a, a person that can come along to the polling booth and vouch for them so that they can get a declaration vote. This was a shameless way of trying to deflate the vote of people that don't traditionally vote for the Liberal Party. Now, a deal was done between the two uh, big parties, Order. because in the course of that bill, of course, the government was also trying to silence the genuine involvement and advocacy of not-for-profit organisations um, in the contest of ideas that is an election campaign. They were trying to bring an additional layer of bureaucracy onto non-government organisations who seek to advocate for their purposes, sometimes charitable purposes, already covered by a schema that heavily regulates charities, essentially seeking to silence dissent and silence voices that call out their terrible policies. So in the course of that bill, they did a deal together, like they so frequently do, and pushed off voter ID laws. But we saw yesterday Senator McGrath in this chamber introduce his own voter ID bill. So this issue is not dead. This government is once again trying to rig the electoral system to benefit themselves because they've got nothing left. They've got no policies that anybody likes. They don't have any uh, representatives that anyone likes much anymore, if the latest polls are anything to go by. And now they're trying to ram through three more electoral bills, which may have consequences that this chamber isn't across without having an inquiry to find that out. So we are moving for these three electoral bills to go to inquiry like they normally would in the usual manner, and it's particularly important when bills are about voting and the right of people to have their say about who runs this country and protects their future or sells it out to big corporations and political donors. All right, I'll put those three amendments. Uh, does anyone require those three amendments to be split? You happy them to be voted on together? The three AG three four five voted on together. All right, I will put those amendments together. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. Yes. Division required. Ring the bells.
the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, tell her for the nose. There being nine ayes, 32 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. We do have one more uh, matter to deal with in this section, so I'll just give Senator Rice a couple of moments. Senator Rice, you have the call. Thanks, President. Um, yes, look, I want to move two amendments to the selection of bills which have been adopted. However, I want to amend what has been circulated to just change the date from the 25th of March to the 24th of March for both motions. So the, um, these motions, one is to refer the Social Security Amendment Improved Child to Adult Transfer for Care Payment and Care Allowance Bill um, to inquiry to the Community Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 24th of March. And the second one is to refer the Social Services Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022 um, to the Community Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry by the 24th of March. Again, here are two bits of legislation. It is standard practice for, the, for legislation to be sent to committee for inquiry. It's a really basic part of our job as the, as the Senate to do that, to inquire into these bills. It is not acceptable that this legislation is being introduced and not being sent off to committee for inquiry. So by referring these bills to the inquiry, we're basically just asking the Senate do its job, that we have transparency on two bits of really important legislation that are going to affect people's lives. In particular, the Workforce Incentive Bill 2022 is in the space of um, income support, workforce incentives, the whole nexus between supporting people who are seeking employment, supporting people who need to be living and being supported by government with in income support, and the actions that the government can take to support people to be moving into employment. It is a very complex space, and it's one where we know the government is doing very badly at the moment, that we have people living on income support who cannot find work who are living in poverty, who are living well below the poverty line, who cannot afford to put food on the table. We've got people who should be on the disability support pension, who can't get on the disability support pension because maybe they'll recover from their brain cancer, who are then on job seeker. We've got other people who, are, who should be on the disability support pension, who are on job seeker, 
who are being forced to comply with so-called mutual obligations. And even in COVID, we have now got people who are being forced to go and have face-to-face -face meetings with their, their, their job services provider, their employment services provider, and being told, no, you can't have these meetings over the phone or, or via, the, the in, via uh, um, video conferencing. No, you've got to come in in person. And we have so many people, these jumping through hoops, which supposedly which are meant to help them find work, who are just being, they, they feel that it is just being asked to do so many things which are not helping them find work, which is all just a matter of them having to do, do crazy things for them and to be applying for jobs that they know that they haven't got a hope of getting, that they haven't got the skills to do, but their employment service provider are telling them they've got to do it. These are the sort of things that this bill is in the middle of. We really need to be getting our whole employment incentives, what really works to get people into employment. We need to be getting that right. And we need to be making sure that for people who, for whatever reason, are not able to work, that they are getting the support they need. That we need to be at least doubling the current rate of job seeker from the pitiful $43 a day, which it is at the moment. And the Greens' position is we need to be doubling it to at least $80 a day so that people are not left living in poverty. It is critical that everybody in Australia has the support and that government can support them so that they can be living a decent life, not in a situation which so many people across Australia today are in, of not being able to afford to put food on the table, of only being able to afford to eat one meal a day, of not being, their kids not being able to have shoes on their, on their feet, kids not being able to go to school excursions, people homeless because they can't afford skyrocketing rents. This is the reality for far too many people in Australia. And yet what we have this government doing is saying, well, we'll just sort of invent some other useless workplace incentive or, and workforce incentive to try and get them into work. When people know, no, they need to be lifted out of poverty so that they can genuine and be supported to help get their lives um, in, in a good place, to help them get the education they need, to help them have a, house, a roof over their heads, to help them being able to afford to eat healthy food. These are the sort of basic measures that will allow people to really be able to live their life to the fullest, to genuinely then be able to participate in the workforce. And these are the sort of fundamental measures that are needed not, and that need to be inquired into. Thank you. Your time has expired. I will put these amendments together unless any senator indicates they wish them separated. All right, I will put the amendments. Those in favour of the amendments say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. There being 30 ayes, 26 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the amended motion. Those in favour say aye. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. It is, is it, uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12.15 p.m. today. Government business then be called on and considered till not later than 1.30 p.m. And see general business notices of motion number 1321 be considered during general business today. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Can say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Mr. President, postponement notifications have been lodged uh, in respect of general business notice of motion number 1319, postponed to the 29th of March, and committees have sought extensions as shown at item 8 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. All right. I shall now, move, uh, now proceed to the discovery of formal business. We will go through them as uh, they are listed. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion 1 to 3 are being debated later in the day. Uh, item 4, Senator Patrick or McKim. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I ask that business uh, of the Senate Notice of Motion number 4 be taken as a formal motion. The question is, is the motion be taken as, as formal? There being no objection. Senator pa I move the motion. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Formality was denied. Senator Patrick. Suspend standing orders. Okay. Pursuant to contingent notice of, mo no notice of motion, I move that so much of the standing orders uh, be suspended. That would permit me moving a motion. <laughs> Yep, so we have to put the motion without debate. Yeah. So, so I put the motion to suspend standing orders as moved by Senator Patrick. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is the suspension be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. There being 29 ayes, 25 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I will move straight to putting the motion. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I move the motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, sorry, Sen sorry. Senator Dunningham. We are the call. I seek leave to make a short statement. Oh, is leave granted? No, leave is not granted. We're putting the motion. I'm, I am Senator Patrick. I'm putting the motion. Question is, the motion be agreed to? I'm just seeking whether Senator Dunham sought leave to table his statement. Okay. Statement has been tabled. Uh, I'm now going to put the motion. Those in favour of the motion say aye. Again, say no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Sorry.
stop the bells. Question is the motion be agreed to? I was passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 25. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I will now move to government. I'll give people a moment to get back to their seats. And I'll move to government business motion uh, number one. Senator Dunning. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the hours and meet of meeting and routine of business on Tuesday, the 29th of March, 2022, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. Question is this motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We'll now move to government business motion number two. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that government business uh, notice of motion number two relating to the consideration of disallowance motions be taken as formal. Question is this motion be taken as formal? Are there any objections? No. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is, this motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, government business number three, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that government business notice of motion number three relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. The question is, this motion be taken as formal? If there are no objections, it is so taken. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I ask um, that um, the question be put separately on some of the legislation uh, in this motion. And just apologies, I'll need to go through um, the list. We intend to vote uh, differently on the following pieces of legislation: the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Foreign Influences and Offences. Uh, the Electoral Legislation Amendment authorisations and the Electoral Legislation Amendment COVID enfranchisement. On the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, on the Religious Discrimination Bill, the Religious Discrimination Consequential Amendments Bill and the Human Rights Legislation Amendment Bill. So I ask that the question on those bills be put separately to the question on the remainder of uh, the bills in this motion. Okay. We will put with the agreement of the chamber, I'll put the question on those bills as set out by uh, Senator McKim first. So we're comfortable with that. So uh, we start with the question on those bills as listed by Senator McKim: three electoral matters bills, NDIS amendment. Uh, two religious discrimination and a human rights bill. So, I'll... Senator Rice. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Okay. Um, the religious discrimination minute. bill should be dumped rather than being rushed through the Senate. The bill, as it was passed through the House last night, would increase discrimination against people with disability, against women, against people of minority faiths and against LGBTIQA people. 
The bill, as passed through the Senate last night, would allow an aged care home to refuse to employ a worker because she is a Muslim woman wearing a hijab. The bill, as it was passed through the Senate last night, would allow a school to sack staff or students because they refuse to find, sign up to a school policy that says homosexuality is evil. The bill that was passed through the Senate last night would make legal, hurtful, harmful statements like disability being a punishment from God. This bill should be dumped. It should be, it should be gone into the dustbin of history rather than being rushed through the Senate. So the question is that the bills be agreed to um, uh, with respect to the motion be agreed to with respect to the bills as listed by Senator McKim. Oh, Senator Urquhart, sorry. Um, sorry, thank you, Mr. President. I just wondered if we could put the electoral bills separately and the religious ones together. So you're happy with the electoral bills and the NDIS together, and then the religious discrimination and the human rights. Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. So we will start with the three electoral bills and, and the NDIS amendment bill. Okay. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. Question is the motion be agreed to? Uh, ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath, tell her for the ayes, and Senator McKim, tell her for the nose. Knows. There being 48 ayes, 9 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the question on the two religious discrimination bills and the human rights bill. Uh, though the, those in favour of the motion say aye, against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Well, over. Can you just repeat what you actually put? So the Mr. motion President? in regards yes. to the religious discrimination, two religious discrimination bills, and the human rights bill. Okay. Yes. So the so it's negative. Okay. Sorry. The question now is that the remote remaining. The remaining parts of the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say. Sorry, and I do have about 3,000 things going on. So, with with indulgence, I'm trying to understand what just occurred then with the religious Order. with the with the religious discrimination bills and the human rights bill. Were what was the result of that vote? So the the, the, the that item was negative. So they weren't. So they weren't exempted. They weren't part of the motion. Okay. We're, are you seeking the call, Senator Betts? 
and in a state of confusion, and I think the vast majority of my colleagues are as well, can we have explained to us what is actually being put to us? But just read so the motion. The, the motion. Order! Order! The motion as printed at item three of government business has been put in three parts. So, so far we have dealt with the uh, electoral legislation amendment, the electoral legislation amendment authorisation, the electoral legislation amendment COVID, and the national disability insurance scheme bill that was uh, affirmed, that was agreed by the chamber. We then put the motion with the two religious discrimination bills and the human rights legislation amendment bills that was negative. I'm now putting the remainder of the motion. Senator Canavan. A little confused. I don't have the motion in front of me. Exactly in regards to the religious discrimination bills and the human rights bill, you said that we put the motion. What, what was that motion? What, what was the content of the it? Motion I don't have it in front of me. The motion to exempt the bills from the cutoff order. And that has been negatived. Okay, let's move on. So now I'm now putting the remaining parts of that motion. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now need to move on. It being past 12.15, I'll give senators a chance to leave the chamber. Just give senators a chance to leave the chamber. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Corporate Collective Investment Vehicle Framework and Others Measured Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. This bill may proceed without formalities and be now read for a first time. The question is, this bill will be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to provide for corporate collective investment vehicles to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation to make miscellaneous and technical amendments to, of the law in the Treasury portfolio and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator. Brown, you are seeking the call. I will put the second reading if there is no. So this is the Corporate Collective Investment Vehicle Framework and Others Measures Bill 2021. Senator Brown spoke briefly. Did you wish to make a contribution? Um, I'm Can we check? Was Senator Brown's microphone on? All right. We might call. I think there was just a lot of hubbub in the chamber, but we'll call you again, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The, the Labor Party supports the Corporate Collective Investment Framework and Other Measures Bill 2021, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Waters, were you seeking the call at all? Minister. Okay. Senator Dunning? I commend the bill to the Senate. I uh, intend to put the question on the second reading. The question is this bill be the second reading of this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend a bill for an act to provide for corporate collective investment vehicles to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and to make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the law in the Treasury portfolio and for related purposes. Minister? Oh, there's no amendment circulated, so unless it is the request of any senator, we'll move straight to the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. 
a bill for an act to provide for corporate collective investment vehicles to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and to make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the law in the Treasury portfolio and for related purposes. Government business order of the day, parliamentary workforce reform, set the standard measures number one bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Is there any second reading contribution? Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, President. I have a second reading contribution. Is that what you're calling on? I am. Great. Thank you. Um, I rise to uh, speak to this bill, and the Greens will be supporting this bill as a tiny step in the right direction by implementing two recommendations of the Set the Standards report. There's still so much more to do, but this is a start. These amendments will prevent staff from being arbitrarily fired for no reason other than that they've become a political problem for their employer. We know the sweeping powers of parliamentarians to fire staff has caused uh, significant barriers for staff coming forward, fearing that their job, not the job of their abuser or harasser, would be at risk. And we know that the change made by this bill alone will not change the culture of shaming and silencing that stops staff coming forward. That cultural shift requires full implementation of the Set the Standards recommendations, a robust, independent and well-resourced complaints process, trauma-informed training for all parliamentarians and senior staff, a code of conduct with meaningful options to sanction abusers and those who facilitate or ignore abuse, and genuine work for a more inclusive and representative parliament and parliamentary workforce. The bill makes clear that all parliamentarians have obligations under the Work Health and Safety Act to provide a safe workplace. We welcome that, but the Respect at Work report could not have been clearer that these obligations are not enough to protect staff against harassment, bullying and assault. What is needed in this workplace and all others around the country is a positive duty on employers to ensure that staff are safe, where there is a zero-tolerance policy in action, not just in words, and where appropriate su support is available. A positive duty was the foundation of the Respect at Work recommendations for making workplaces safe, and without that duty, all other reforms are built on very shaky ground. The government voted against amendments moved by myself and Senator McAllister last year to introduce a positive duty, and despite vague assurances that they're now working on it, we're yet to see progress on it. And I have no confidence that Australian workers will get that protection from this government before the election. We will continue to push for a positive duty so that every worker in every workplace can feel and be safe and respected. The final thing that this bill does is to ensure that MOPSAC staff are covered by the Age Discrimination Act and the Disability Discrimination Act. This is an important reminder that the abuse detailed in the Set the Standards report was extensive. The attention has been on sexual harassment and assault, but we must not ignore the reports of racism, ableism, ageism and classism in this place. People of colour, people with disability, older women have all reported that their harassment was compounded by discrimination and that they were targeted more, uh, believed and supported less and too often driven from this workplace. We cannot look around this room and pr pretend that we don't have a representation problem. We know the faces of Rochelle Miller, Chelsea Potter, Brittany Higgins, Josie Cole, Saxon Mullins, Chanel Contos, Grace Tame. We know these courageous women, but not because they're the only ones who've been abused, not because they're the only ones who've come forward, but because they look most like the people that we know, that we can identify with. This does not diminish in any way the significance of their experience or the importance of them coming forward. The fact that these women came forward is a key reason that we are even having this discussion today. But as each of these women has themselves acknowledged, as Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame said in their phenomenal address yesterday, as Amy Ramikas has so eloquently said so many times, so many survivors are missing from the public conversation because they don't look like me. This has to change. Today I want to share a story that should remind us all why this legislation and immediate action to implement Set the Standards in full is needed. A New South Wales parliamentary staffer assaulted his colleague, Dania Mani, in 2015. The assault happened after many months of harassment, which she'd reported to her supervisors and been repeatedly told that she was overreacting, that he just had a bit of a crush and that maybe she should just go out with him. Then he violently assaulted her. 
for reasons familiar to so many survivors, particularly women of colour, she didn't make a police report, fearing that she would not be believed, that her name would be made public, that it would affect her job and reputation, and that only she would suffer the consequences, that the justice system would not deliver her justice. Instead, she made complaints through her work and her political party and was largely ignored, placated, passed on. Meanwhile, her abuser continued to work in a senior role in the party. She and Chelsea Potter told their stories to the media in July 2019 and founded a non-partisan movement for survivors called Changing Our Headline, which was later renamed Kate's List in honour of the woman who alleges Christian Porter raped her. Through that movement, they heard story after story from women working in state and federal politics about abuse and harassment and the lack of support when they reported that abuse. In 2019, Dunya phoned the Prime Minister's office. She explained that through Kate's list, she had received many complaints from women in federal parliament, including in the Liberal Party, who had been harassed and abused. Each of those women had confided in a senior person with power to resolve their complaint, or they had followed formal complaint mechanisms. None of the women felt that they had really been heard or that there had been consequences for their abusers. Dunya contacted the Prime Minister seeking two things. Firstly, support to elevate a resolution of, of her own complaints after they had stalled in the New South Wales Liberal Party and the New South Wales Premier's office. And two, she sought a meeting to discuss the complaints from women working in the federal Liberal Party and what the PM and the party could do to avoid any other staffers suffering, as Danya, Chelsea and all of those who'd shared their stories had suffered. She was raising concerns on behalf of current and former political staff from all major political parties in Australia. She was reaching out to the Prime Minister, trying to offer constructive advice about how to lift the standards within his own party. She was sharing her own trauma to help prevent others from having to experience it. The response was telling. The Prime Minister's private secretary, Euron Finkelstein, contacted her and suggested it was not a matter for the Prime Minister. He maintained that the existing processes were working well. He refused to facilitate a meeting with the Prime Minister, instead suggesting that she write his office a letter. He obfuscated. He declined to provide an email address. He said that he would call back the next day. She never heard back. Dunya spoke with the 7.30 report in late February 2021 about her experience in trying to raise issues with the Prime Minister's office. The PMO denied that Dunya had mentioned complaints in federal parliament to Mr Finkelstein. I have listened to a recording of that conversation, and I heard Dunya repeatedly, categorically talk about these complaints and her hope to meet with the Prime Minister to discuss them. This is more of the don't ask, don't tell approach that we've heard so much of in this parliament. Pretend it isn't happening, gaslight and belittle those who come forward, background against them if you have to. That willful disregard for survivors is why a toxic culture has persisted in this place for so long. They all knew it was happening. They just didn't care enough to make it stop. Dunya wrote to the Prime Minister in February 2021, in the week following Brittany Higgins bravely coming forward. She wrote to again seek a meeting to discuss complaints that she'd received and recommendations for reform. She didn't hear back. Dunya wrote again to the Prime Minister in April 2021, and she said uh, in her letter, and I quote, I detailed to you my own personal experiences of sexual misconduct. I explained the steps I took to seek justice and assistance. I explained that I had approached your senior aide, Yaron Finkelstein, for help. I summarised two years of research advocacy and work on behalf of survivors of sexual crime, harassment, abuse, bullying and other serious misconduct in parliament and in Australia's workplaces more broadly. I took the time to write to you because I am passionate about creating change and will never stop fighting for survivors. I requested a response from you. I have not received any acknowledgement from your office. This is unacceptable." End quote. 
Danya didn't receive a response to that letter either. She was not invited to attend the statement of acknowledgement on Tuesday. Danya's experience is a stark reminder of the damage that a toxic, misogynistic culture that disregards harassment and abuse can cause. It shows how futile efforts to bring concerns to those in power have been for so long they knew they didn't care. Thankfully, we are now starting to see action, and this is because of the strength of women like Dunya, Tessa Sullivan, Chelsea Potter, Rochelle Miller, Brittany Higgins, Grace Tame, and so many others. And it's despite the barriers that powerful men have tried to put in their way. Dunya has asked for me to share a message with you about what she hopes that you took away from her story today. And I quote from Dunya Mani. Earlier this week, there was an apology delivered by Scott Morrison to survivors of sexual abuse in politics. He spoke about the power of apologies to create reform and change. That statement is true. It just does not apply to his offensive and whitewashed excuse for an apology. Scott Morrison not only failed to genuinely consult or consider survivors in the wording of his apology, he rewrote and whitewashed Australian feminist history in the, in the process. Tessa Sullivan, a woman of colour who was the first to tell her story of sexual violence in politics when the Me Too movement began to gain ground in Australia in early 2018, inspired me to speak out. Yet many Australians failed to recognise we would not be here without her. I continued Tessa's work, launching my campaign Kate's List when I told my story. My, cam my campaign was and remains designed to support survivors and end sexual violence in Australian politics and workplaces. Yet women like myself and Tessa are largely erased from media commentary, culture and history. Even now in 2022, after the lessons of Me Too, politicians and the mainstream media almost solely centre the stories of cisgender, able-bodied and conventionally attractive white women at the expense of all other voices. But this cultural moment of reckoning in Australian politics and feminism is built on the sacrifice, advocacy and unpaid labour of women of colour like me, like Tessa. We came first. Failing to acknowledge the labour of culturally and linguistically diverse women sends a message. Sexual violence and other forms of abuse only impact white women. But we know that these crimes disproportionately impact cold and First Nations women. In a country where colonisation is ongoing, we cannot allow this distorted and incomplete picture to form the sole foundation for the Australian public's understanding of male violence against women. If this parliament fails to act, it is tacitly endorsing and aggravating impenetrable barriers to equality for diverse, minority-identifying Australians. This country cannot achieve inclusive, healthy progress for women in political life until and unless we start recognising and validating the vital work of women of colour and First Nations women in making opportunities for feminist cultural reckoning and reform possible. This speech is all for minority women and women of colour who do not feel seen in political life. I'll keep fighting for us. I deserve to be seen. Tessa deserves to be seen. You deserve to be seen. This historic moment belongs to us too. I will not stop until skin colour and minority status do not determine whether we are acknowledged, whether we are recognised by politicians and the media, and whether cultural and historic milestones built on our advocacy and labour belong to us." End quote. Those were the words of Dania Mani that she wanted you all to hear, and I'm honoured to be able to say them in this chamber, albeit belatedly many years after her assault that was so mishandled by the political party that she belonged to. Coming back to this bill, it is a step in the right direction, but it is a tiny one. It finally does some of the things that Dania and others have been asking the government to do for years, but the Greens will work to ensure that this parliament urgently takes the rest of the steps needed to turn around things properly and to make parliamentary workplaces all workplace safe, equal, inclusive and respectful. Thank you, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. Senator Brown. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, thank you, yeah. Madam Acting Deputy President. Labor supports the parliamentary workplace reform set the standards measure number one, Bill 2022, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Minister. 
Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, uh, I thank um, uh, the opposition and, uh, and the Greens, and indeed I understand all parties for uh, their intention to support this and, uh, and for the endorsement of this legislation. The parliamentary workplace reform set the standards measures number one, Bill 2022, would make initial changes to four pieces of legislation in order to implement recommendations 17 and 24 of the set the standard report on the independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, the Jenkins report. The bill would progress important and significant reforms to help ensure that Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces are workplaces where expected standards of behaviour are modelled, championed and enforced, where respectful behaviour is standard uh, and in which any Australian, no matter their sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, race, disability or age, feel safe and welcome to contribute. The bill would amend the Members of Parliament Staff Act 1984 to strengthen and clarify the employment rights of MOPS Act employees. The bill removes any doubt that the Fair Work Act 2009 applies to MOPS Act employees by making this explicit and would require parliamentarians to provide written reasons where they dismiss an employee from employment. These amendments result in additional information being provided to employees who are being terminated, which will result in an update to current arrangements and forms around the termination of employees consistent with the recommendations of Commissioner Jenkins. Grounds around, uh, around uh, dismissal uh, continue to include, very clearly and specified, a restructure of an office which calls for a different set of employee skills, unsatisfactory performance or conduct by the employee, uh, where a parliamentarian has lost trust or confidence in an employee uh, and where the employee has a significant conflict of interest. The bill would amend also the Work Health and Safety Act 2011 to clarify that parliamentarians are officers of the Commonwealth for the purposes of the Work Health and Safety Act. The bill would also amend the Age Discrimination Act 2004 and the Disability Discrimination Act 1992 to put beyond doubt that MOPS Act employees have protection from age and disability discrimination consistent with the recent amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act. The government has on a number of occasions indicated its support for Kate Jenkins' recommendations. We have worked with the opposition, other parties and independents, and I acknowledge uh, in this chamber the work of you, Senator Waters, uh, the work of, uh, of Senator Gallagher, the work of Senator Farrell uh, and the work of Senator Payne as fellow members of the Leadership Task Force, uh, along with those from the other place. The first meeting of the Leadership Task Force, independently chaired by Ms Kerry Hartland, was held last week. And it's a task force that will be integral to ensure progress on all of the Jenkins report recommendations noting that not all of them are solely for government to implement, as of course a legislative change like this is. For the recommendations that are solely within the government's responsibility and control, our intention is they be implemented within the recommended timeframes. Thus far, that is on track for all of those recommendations. We are conscious that the recommendations are complex, uh, but they are also important, especially those such as establishing the Office of Parliamentary Standards and Culture. This bill will provide additional protections to MOPS Act employees and provides a clear intent that not only the government but the parliament, working together as we have demonstrated, is committing, committed to implementing the recommendations of the Jenkins report. Significantly, the reforms in the legislative package would ensure Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces are safe and respectful uh, and that the nation's parliament serves as a model workplace for our nation. Uh, they help to contribute towards those objectives uh, as, of course, they do. Uh, work in tandem with the other reforms that have been put in place and others that are still to come uh, as we seek to ensure uh, the prevention and appropriate responses to any instances of bullying, sexual harassment and sexual assault. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those in the, of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to parliamentary workplaces and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law in relation to parliamentary workplaces and for related purposes. Government business, order of the day number one, mitochondrial donation law reform, Maves Law Bill 2021, resumption of consideration in committee of the whole. Thank you. Okay. Okay. The committee is considering the mitochondrial donation law reform, Maves Law Bill 2021, an amendment 12 on sheet 1519 moved by Senator Canavan. So the question, the question is that sections 
28F and 28G and item 17 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Senator Davey. Can I uh, draw the Chamber's attention to the service of the Chamber? It's quorum required. Ring the bells. So we have done. Have quorum. Thank you. So we will continue on in uh, committee stage, and I think we're at a stage now. We're ready to put the second half of Senator Kevin Canavan's um, amendment. So the question is that sections 28F and 28G and item 17 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. No. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to sheet one. Sorry, Senator Canavan. Like a division there. Could we put that again? Sorry, or okay. just getting across that. Is that was that put stand as printed? Yes. So it was agreed. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Could we put that again, if that's all right? I just okay. Got with the leave of the yeah. Senator, I will put that again. So that sections 28F and 28G in item 17 of Schedule One stand as printed. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. Okay, so division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that sections 28F and 28G in item 17 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the. Uh, when, once I appoint the tellers, people need to be in their seats. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 36 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Ciccone, are you seeking the call? Senator Ciccone. Right. I'm going to try and keep Thank you going. very much, okay. uh, Deputy President. Um, on behalf of Senator O'Neill, uh, I just wanted to make a very brief uh, contribution towards one of her uh, amendments that has been circulated in the chamber um, with respect to amendment number one on sheet 1540. Um, this amendment that has been proposed by Senator O'Neill will introduce a threshold that 20 trial participants are required and published before the mitochondrial donation clinical licences are, guaranteed, uh, are granted. The, uh, the lack of data from the United Kingdom, the only jurisdiction where these practices are legal, should impel us to raise the threshold on these experimental gene editing techniques before we proceed in granting them a licence. The impacts and the efficacy of these proposed techniques are still in theory, and thus a large number of trials should be taken and undertaken, and their results should be shared before these, te these techniques are permitted. To go ahead, and on that note, um, acting deputy president, I move uh, the amendment standing under the name of Senator O'Neill, number one on sheet one five four zero. Thank you, Senator Birmingham, Thank Minister. You, sir. 
thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, I would, uh, would urge senators to vote against this amendment. Um, uh, this bill already re effectively requires successful clinical outcomes from the clinical trial phase uh, before moving to stage two, being the use of mitochondrial donation techniques in clinical practice. As outlined in the revised explanatory memorandum, stage two will only commence after the clinical trial has demonstrated success over a number of years and the results have been evaluated by experts. Over that period of time, it is expected that significantly more data would be acquired than the minimum data proposed in this amendment. Now, proponents of this amendment may say, well, then why not put a minimum requirement in? However, uh, however Chair, uh, that may create the false impression that it would be appropriate to move to clinical practice once this minimum threshold has been reached and raise misplaced expectations in stakeholders. This is an important area in which we should rely upon expert assessment of the appropriateness of movement from the clinical phase uh, of trials into uh, clinical practice, and that we have that expert assessment of all available data, whatever is deemed to be required, uh, to make sure there is confidence in that regard. Uh, the, in addition, this amendment uh, could also create further legal uncertainty, as it might be that this would be the only consideration that could legally be taken into account when deciding whether to move to stage two, with an, some, with an implication that the broader range of factors that are intended to be taken into account couldn't be considered. And so, Chair, I do urge uh, senators to, uh, to uh, oppose this amendment. Uh, the bill, as drafted, does set out very clearly high standards required to move uh, from trial to practice. Uh, and, uh, and that those standards rightly uh, are for scientific experts uh, to make sure they have been met. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also uh, urge senators to oppose the amendments for the reasons put forward by Senator Birmingham. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, we discussed at length last night uh, the facts that, uh, as, as drafted, this bill uh, has only minimal regulatory oversight of these processes. Indeed, there isn't really a regulator as such, and certainly not a, a solely devoted regulator in charge of uh, issuing uh, the licences associated with mitochondrial donation. Uh, the NA it is governed completely by the NHMRC uh, and the minister, neither of whom themselves are a, a dedicated regulator. Uh, uh, that would have been ideal from our perspective, from mine and others in this chamber. Ideally, we would have preferred uh, to have independent arm's length regulation uh, through the OGTR, as we discussed last night. Those amendments have failed. Um, it would seem in that environment to be prudent, though, to put some uh, quantitative uh, hurdles before proceeding to a widespread clinical practice. Just like our amendments uh, last night, none of the amendments here uh, stop, prevent or slow down. Uh, the provision of mitochondrial donation services. Uh, of course, we'll need to have participants go through these trials, including potentially uh, uh, live births or a clinical trial licences that can be issued before reaching this 20 uh, um, participant threshold. So we can have um, real outcomes for parents that are going through the trials, uh, uh, real outcomes in terms of not, uh, not um, uh, providing or, or not uh, uh, passing on mitochondrial defects uh, to children uh, if these processes work. That can happen all through the trial period, so there's no limitation on that occurring through this amendment. We can still do all that. We just have to do 20 trials before, if this amendment is accepted, we have to do 20 trials before we would proceed uh, to the widespread clinical application uh, outside of a uh, more monitored trial framework. We think that is a more than reasonable number. I dismiss the arguments put by uh, the government effect or by Senator Birmingham that somehow this would be an artificial uh, hurdle. That seemed a pretty weak argument that somehow just because we reach 20 everybody thinks therefore we have to go to stage two. There's nothing in these amendments which, which would suggest that at all. Indeed, this amendment does not uh, uh, get rid of the provision that Senator Birmingham highlighted, which requires successful trial applications to occur before moving to stage two. So just because we have 20 trial participants, if none of those are successful, there are other provisions in this bill which would prevent stage two from occurring. I am concerned, though, that term that Senator Birmingham is relying on, successful, is not defined in the bill, 
Um, potentially, it could be left to mean just one success, just one success before proceeding to stage two, would be sufficient to meet that uh, that hurdle. It doesn't doesn't need to be plural. And we know from the evidence received uh, through the Senate committee that uh, there is a risk through these processes of so-called off-target gen genetic modifications. They may not become apparent through just simply one, two, or a small number uh, of of um, of mitochondrial donation processes, and so it would make sense to do more, to do some kind of larger number. Normally in statistics, they have the number of 30. Uh, 30 participants t tends to get you a, a low confidence interval uh, when you're dealing with risk and uncertainty. Uh, we haven't gone quite as high as 30, but 20 seems like a reasonable number of participants to go through this trial so that we have clear data, uh, risk-adjusted data on whether or not uh, these donation processes can succeed in the broad before proceeding to the stage two process. Senator Steele, John had indicated. Uh, come to you next, Senator Roberts. Senator Thank Steele, you. John. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, in speaking uh, to to this amendment uh, this afternoon, there's a couple of points uh, that I would like to make. Um, First of all, I think it's important to, to, as we discussed a little bit last night, to, to acknowledge the structural conservatism of the legislation before the chamber currently, which is to say that uh, if this uh, bill passes uh, today, uh, that will trigger one of three stages of a, of a trial of, of this overall legislative process. Stage one being a trial, uh, ten years in duration. Now, as I observed last night, uh, on average 56 kids are born with severe mitochondrial disease every single year, meaning that over the course of that decade, before we get to the point of offering broadly to the public, to parents, the opportunity to make a choice to undergo a procedure that may uh, save the life of a child that they have, before we get to that point, ten years down the road, uh, about 560 kids may well lose their lives. There has been a decision made in the course of the crafting of this legislation, informed as it has been by multiple Senate inquiries and community consultation, that that waiting period of time, that duration, and, and therefore the potential for that loss of life, which may have the ability to have been prevented by the earlier provision of these services to the public, uh, is the correct balance to be struck. That's the proposition that has been put before the chamber by this legislation. Such a proposition, such a long trial period, uh, is why uh, proponents of this bill uh, the community organisations that have been campaigning for this bill see this moment as bittersweet, because uh, even if the legislation passes, they know that their suffering, their sadness, will be perpetuated year on year through many families before such a medical opportunity for the prevention of that suffering is offered to the community. Now, within that context, we consider Senator O'Neill's amendments. And I'll note two aspects of this amendment. Firstly, that it asks us to, in addition to that 10-year trial period and the conclusion of that 10-year trial period, that we add another barrier to the provision of this technique to the community that we add the barrier that uh, the procedure, the technique, has been used on at least uh, 20 trial participants, meaning, meaning that at the conclusion of the 10-year period, there would be another benchmark to be met. Now, I ask the Chamber, and I have asked myself whether such a number, inherently arbitrary in its nature, inherently arbitrary in its nature, we saw in the House of Representatives uh, 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 um, 
Mr Andrews, uh, offer an amendment which was different in its nature. It asked for five positive outcomes rather than 20 trial participants, but was no less arbitrary in the selection of its number. Five positive outcomes. Could have picked 10, could have picked four, could have picked 15, 20, 34. It was up to him. It was about what made him feel personally comfortable. And so too with this amendment. 20 trial participants are offered to us today. Could have been 15, could have been five, could have been 40. The proposition in this amendment is, regardless of what has been gained through the clinical studies carried out by the NHMRC, by, as we heard last night, some of the eminent minds in the nation in relation to uh, IVF treatments, who have been doing this work so well uh, since uh, the early 2000s, regardless of what those studies find, that we should add an additional barrier of an arbitrary nature. And given that uh, constant ticking clock of life and suffering that is the reality, that kids will already, as I said, be born in their hundreds between the passage of this legislation and the provision of this service to the community, I personally believe that that is an unacceptable and unnecessary additional barrier. I do not think it adds value to this legislation to insert an arbitrary number simply because it meets a level of personal comfort. This is not a scientifically informed number. This is an arbitrary number for personal comfort. And we here this evening are considering a legislation which turns this afternoon, <laughs> this feels like this evening, we this afternoon are considering a, a piece of legislation which turns upon the axis of science. The axis of science. So let us uh, have faith in the experts as we have had faith in the experts during the pandemic. Let's not put arbitrary barriers uh, in the way of this provision uh, of this legislation. The second point I will make is in relation to uh, section B of the amendment, which seeks to say uh, that the outcome and use of the technique, or, uh, the technique on the trial participants have been published. And again, we come back, circle back again to this question of public scientific data. And last night I read into the Hansard a letter uh, sent by one of the eminent uh, scientific experts that are leading the work in the United Kingdom, stepping out explicitly that the absence of scientific publishment of the outcome of this legislation is to in no way be interpreted as anything other than the impact of COVID-19 combining with the complexity of the United, uh, United Kingdom's privacy requirements in, relating, in relation to reproductive, assistive reproductive techniques, and that those privacy requirements are being worked through, and in due course, those findings will be published. Now, we in this Senate have no reason to believe anything other than that statement to be a true and accurate reflection of what is taking place in the United Kingdom. We also know that this legislation gives us 10 years in which to see the findings of the, of the UK uh, processes that are playing out and to play our role as scrutinising legislator, legislators uh, when uh, making inquiries of the NHMRC. So many avenues are available to us to scrutinise this process, and we should apply ourselves to that scrutiny, not place arbitrary barriers in the way of a much-needed advancement in medical science. And so, for those reasons, I will be opposing the amendment, um, and I urge uh, the entirety of my, uh, my Senate colleagues across the chamber uh, to join me uh, in that opposition. Senator Roberts was next. Senator Canavan. Oh, sorry. Senator Canavan. Okay, and Senator Canavan. Go okay, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I just look briefly wanted to respond to some of the, I think, um, 
uh, uh, errors there in, in Senator Steele Johns' statement or misinterpretations of this amendment and yeah, some of the accusations made. Um, uh, the, the Senator Steele John said that this legislation gives us 10 years, 10 or plus more years, to evaluate the trial and research phase. The legislation does not do that. It does not do that. The explanatory memorandum estimates, the government estimates in the explanatory memorandum, that the, the research and trial phase may take 10 years, but there is nothing in the legislation which prescribes or makes uh, the research and trial phase last. Ten or more years. It could be done uh, in two or three. There is no no limit at all placed on those number of years. I also wanted to just respond. Uh, Senator Steele John uh, said that this was not based on on science at all, and I only briefly mentioned this in my original contribution. But just to lay it out here, that then in fact there is a statistical scientific basis for uh, the number of 20 trial participants that we have uh, settled on here in this amendment. Uh, um, as I mentioned before, that the outcomes that are going to come from mitochondrial donation techniques are going to uh, be different for different people, for sure, absolutely sure. Almost all medical treatments have different effects on different people. Um, they would, the effects would normally be able to be expressed in some kind of normal distribution in a statistical sense in terms of their success or failure or other attributes. Um, when something is, is, uh, uh, is, is uncertain or provides uh, outcomes which do not deliver a definitive result um, in scientific statistics. The common rule, as I mentioned in my original contribution, is that if your sample size is at least 30, uh, you generally, generally will have a sample size that, uh, that, um, that, that concords with, with the overall population. It's known as the central limit theorem, um, uh, and the rule of thumb is that once you get to about 30, uh, your so-called T-stat, which is what you get from a sample uh, population, will, will, um, will start to converge to the limit of the Z-stat, which is what you get from the, pop the, um, the almost always hypothetical uh, population distribution. So that's, 30 is usually the figure used. Now, we didn't choose 30 because we can see in the UK that they, after, after eight years or almost eight years now uh, of work, um, they, uh, they have only had eight participants go through. And so if, if 30 was chosen as a threshold, we might be still here in a generation's time before we're to, to going to that clinical phase. So, so 30 was, even though that would be the statistical scientific number, uh, we thought it would be more, um, more reasonable to choose a lower number of 20. Now keep in mind that you've already had eight in the UK go through. You've not had a sing, single successful live birth. Um, uh, and so an additional 12 on top of that participants seems a fairly reasonable request of the science to, to conduct itself uh, in this regard. Yes, that will take a number of years, but in no way, as I said before, no way that will hold up the provision of these services because the provision of these services can occur right now. Well, what, well sorry, once the bill passes, if the bill passes, uh, uh, the provision of mitochondrial donation services can, can occur straight away through a trial process not through the clinical practice process, but they can occur through the trial process. So, so no one will be denied or, or, or unnecessarily delayed in their provision of the services. Of course, while the trial is occurring, they will be subject to um, significant monitoring, oversight, the conditions that are placed in this bill. And I do think it's reasonable that 20, at least something like 20, participants go through such a trial phase. So we understand all of the potential different effects that might occur. Uh, in different people with different genetic structures as best as we can um, before going uh, through to the clinical practice stage where there is less oversight, less intense uh, uh, activity that would be associated with the trial phase. Senator Roberts. President, I would like to make a number of comments on this in support of Senator uh, O'Neill's bill. First of all, I'd like to commend Senator O'Neill and Senator Canavan. I support his earlier comments 20 minutes ago uh, and will not be repeating them. I support them in very strongly. I want to draw attention to, to Senator Birmingham's comments and in particular Senator Birmingham's assumption that Parliament will make the right decision 10 years from now well into the future. That has been un, un, misplaced, unfounded. In fact, we see that uh, quite often in this parliament, it has a history, and I don't just mean this parliament, I mean parliaments for many decades now, this parliament for many decades. We have a history 
of senators and members in the lower house making decisions that not only aren't based in data, contradict the data. Now here we are forecasting what will be the case in 10 years' time. That's why Senator Canavan and Senator O'Neill's amendments and their speeches are so important. We have a history of ignoring and even contradicting the hard data, and now we're forecasting 10 years into the future. So we're assuming success, and as Senator Canavan said, without the definition of success. That is not scientific. That's absurd. Uncertainty and risk abounds everywhere. We haven't even seen what's come out of the, in the United Kingdom yet. The level of confidence in this is very, very low. And I'm reminded of President Eisenhower warning us of the military-industrial complex. In that same speech, which most people know about, they don't know about this statement, that he also warned us about the science and technology agenda and to not assume that experts know what they're talking about. We're sitting here in masks, and there's no evidence anywhere that they have any effect. There's plenty of evidence showing they don't. Many of the senators right now have been double injected. Whatever that means, fully injected, whatever that means today, because that'll change. We haven't had any evidence on that. We've seen evidence of severe severe side effects, adverse effects. We see protesters out the front, some of whom who have been injected, saying that they are opposed to the coercion. Will we see this coercion continue for the next 10 years and fulfil Senator Canavan's uh, concerns? I'll read a text here from someone coming down from North Queensland, coming down from Queensland rather. We're on our way to Canberra today, taking a car full of people. Thanks one again, once again for everything we're doing for truth in this most critical time. Truth in a parliament. Fancy being thanked for telling the truth. Whoever would have thought in our lifetimes we would see the removal of our freedoms and the destruction of our democracy. And this lady is a mature lady, very strong, very intelligent lady who has been concerned about what is happening to our country and the loss of freedoms. I go to another. Compliance and blind faith has been the problem. People have been taught to trust people in positions of power. Here we are going into the future unknown and making forecasts as to what will happen and what will be successful and won't be successful. I have no faith in experts. It is just a label. I have faith in data. I have no faith in parliamentarians. And that's why I will be supporting Senator Canavan and Senator O'Neill. Senator Keneally and then I'll go to you, Senator Steele John after. Thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. Uh, I uh, rise in support of Senator O'Neill's motion and uh, acknowledge and give support to the comments of Senator Canavan. I think it's important for senators to remember the lack of data around the very scheme that we are being asked to legalise. And that there, there is a significant lack of data. Uh, it is the case that this technique would create a human being of a type that is expressly permitted, to, uh, expressly uh, prohibited to be created today, and that is a, a human being with three people contributing to its genetic makeup. Now, I've heard in this debate some senators make claims that none of the mitochondrial DNA actually affects our, the unique characteristics of who we are. That's not entirely true. And in fact, I would encourage senators to read the Senate report, the Senate inquiry, and the report that came out of it, because we simply do not know. We simply do not know the scientific effects on future generations of altering mitochondrial DNA. We simply do not know it. The Senate report went into this in some detail. And the Senate report, and I quote, said this is a foundational question to be answered prior to the legalization of mitochondrial donation. Let me repeat that because this is a Senate report. These are not a dissenting comments. This was a cross-partisan report of an inquiry chaired by our former colleague, Green Senator Rachel Seward, 
who did remarkable work. I was a member of that inquiry. It said this is a foundational question to be answered prior to any legalization of mitochondrial donation. Now, I would argue, based on the lack of evidence available to us, in fact, I did argue in my second reading speech, that we have not answered that foundational question. And so in being asked to vote on this bill, we have a foundational question that has not been resolved. And I will come to how this amendment improves slightly on the bill in helping us try to put a stage in where that foundational question is resolved. But let's, let me allow, allow me to remind senators, in the United States, this technique is pro expressly prohibited. It is not prohibited. It is not permitted in the United States. And the only jurisdiction that has legalized mitochondrial donation is the United Kingdom. We know that from the debate. 2015, they legalized it. The United Kingdom states on the, the Department of Health, the, National, the Department of Health in the United Kingdom states on its website, we have limited evidence on the risks and the success rates of mitochondrial donation. And that is undeniably true. In over six years, no baby has been born in the United Kingdom using mitochondrial donation. There have been reports, unverified reports, of babies born in Mexico and the Ukraine. They have not been subject to any independent scientific verification or determination of whether or not the children are healthy, indeed whether they have actually been born healthy and alive. These are, we are literally legislating in the absence of evidence. I've heard some senators make the observation we should rely on science. I would be quite happy to rely on science. The reality is there isn't much science available to us in making this, in legalizing this. And so I, I understand, and the argument that Senator Steele John puts, uh, that this is a multi-stage process and we're going to have these clinical trials and, and we're going to get the science. Okay, if we're going to get it, what is so wrong without an, an, uh, with this parliament ensuring that that is a, a robust evidentiary base and that it is publicly verifiable. That is what this amendment does. It is this parliament's way of saying, if we are going to move to the next stage, then we should be sure that there is a robust evidence base and that it is publicly verifiable. Because it's not just trusting the science. We also need to share it with the public. We need to take the public with us if we're going to make changes like this. You know, imagine where we would have been in COVID if we hadn't had information available to us to make decisions about booster shots, about vaccination, about mask wearing, about social distancing. We took the public with us because we were able to share the science with them. That is what this amendment does. That is what this amendment does. In the United Kingdom, there have been 21 licenses granted for mitochondrial donation since 2015, and as many as eight have been subsequently approved for treatment. However, there is no public reporting available for these outcomes. Now, Senator Steele-John posits the argument, and I'm not quarreling with him, that this might be because of COVID and it might be because of privacy concerns. Well, I think that just shows that the, if, if we take the latter, privacy concerns that haven't been resolved, well, that's a failure of the UK Parliament that we should not repeat. We sought last night through one of the amendments, uh, sorry, we, we, sought, we sought last night through one of the amendments to, uh, with Senator Canavan's amendment around the clinical trial stage and not automatically moving um, after 10 years. That was that was voted down by the Senate. We also sought last night to put in a stronger regulatory regime through the amendments. That was also rejected by the Senate, and I acknowledge that. But what I would say in response to arguments put by Senator Birmingham 
There's nothing automatic in here. This does not automatically move us after 20 trials to the next stage. And this is the kind of thing we do in legislation all the time, is that we put in things to ensure that if the legislation is, if something is going to move on to another stage, appropriate benchmarks have been met before that happens. And so my frustration here is that this is not a barrier to moving on to the next stage of this, of, of a mitochondrial donation. It is actually a safeguard. It's actually a safeguard. And I do think when we are legalizing a technique where there is almost no verifiable scientific evidence to answer what our own Senate committee found to be a foundational question, that it is entirely legitimate, indeed it's entirely unremarkable for the Senate to ask that there be some a robust evidentiary base and that it be shared with the public. And that's all this amendment does. It doesn't create or it doesn't seek to create a legal barrier. It doesn't seek to exclude any other consideration. I've heard some senators raise a concern, well perhaps you need more than 20 trials. Well perhaps you do, but how will we know that unless we're able to be confident that 20 have happened and we'll be able to uh, see the evidence um, for ourselves and to take the public with us. So I would encourage senators to just consider that we are legislating for something that is going to go for more than 10 years. We are legislating for something which is going to have, where decisions are going to be taken by executive governments. People who might sit in those positions may not even be elected to parliament yet. We have given away our capacity to have that decision come back to the chamber. We did that last night with, when rejecting one of Senator Canavan's amendments. We missed an opportunity to get a stronger regulatory regime in place for what is a novel and untested technique. This is simply asking, a rather unremark making a rather unremarkable request that we have a solid evidence base and that it's publicly verifiable and able to be examined by the parliament and by the Australian people. Senator Steele-John. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide, Senator Rice that, and Senator, Senator Steele-John. And thanks. if we have time, I'll go to Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy Pres. Um, there's a couple of things I want to just quickly respond to uh, in relation to the contributions from uh, Senators Canavan and, and Keneally. Um, first of all, in relation to uh, the, the uh, view that Senator Keneally has put to the chamber that we as a, as a body should take note um, of the absence of the legalization of these techniques in the United States. I would put to the chamber that that is not uh, a factor which should factor into our consideration. There are many legislative differences between Australia and the United States, which I'm sure we all welcome. First to the top of our, my mind uh, is gun control. Uh, we have very good gun control in Australia, uh, there is catastrophic absence of that in the United uh, States. Uh, the United States legislative framework uh, shouldn't feed into our considerations. Uh, secondly, uh, to the question of uh, privacy uh, and uh, the, the comment that Senator Keneally made in relation to uh, the privacy settings that exist uh, in the United Kingdom and whether they should be fixed before the legislation passes. Privacy in relation to uh, facilitated, uh, facilitated um, reproductive techniques is paramount. It's paramount in IVF. Uh, it's techniques across the board. Why is it paramount? And Senator Rice will be very familiar with this phenomenon as well. People born of medically uh, uh, facilitated uh, techniques are often considered in religious contexts to be abominations and subject to profound discrimination. And so it is very important that we guarantee the privacy of those individuals. Um, I would also say uh, to, the, to the point that Senator Keneally made, uh, this is a trial, what's so wrong with inserting a number? Simply because it is arbitrary. 
It is an arbitrary number, as Senator Canavan said. Uh, 20 something, something like 20. Well, why not 10? Why not 5? Why not 9? It is arbitrary and has no place in a scientific trial for us to insert ourselves in that process. Finally, I just want to make mention of the contributions made last night and today that have touched on the rights of a child in relation to being born of more than two parents. And I would simply put to you that we have two choices before ourselves today, either to pass this piece of legislation or not to pass this piece of legislation, to pass it in a form that works or put it in a form that hampers this work. Now, if we take the path of passing these amendments or voting down this bill, then we will never have the opportunity to ask the individuals, potentially born of these techniques, what they would wish in relation to these rights. However, if people in this chamber are really very interested in having conversations with individuals born of complicated, uh, facilitated medical techniques, then let us pass this bill and, in a decade, have the opportunity to ask them themselves. Senator Rice. And look, I will be very brief. I was originally quite sympathetic to this amendment and, in fact, had informed Senator O'Neill that I'd probably support it. Um, I'm now thinking that it is not an appropriate amendment to support. I can see where it's coming from. The need to ensure that there is appropriate scrutiny, accountability, transparency, good data, really good scrutiny of, of the trial. But the arbitrary nature of 20 participants doesn't meet that um, doesn't provide that appropriateness. Basically, it's a much more complex lot of factors that you need to take into, a play, take into account rather than an arbitrary um, amount of having 20 participants go through a trial. Um, the other part of the, uh, the um, amendment that I was sympathetic to was the need for published data, because there is you know, it is an issue for whatever reasons that we have not got any published data out of the UK trial. That said, I mean, essentially we are beginning a trial, and that, yes, we absolutely need the scientific evidence. That is the whole purpose of this first stage of the trial. I also note that we do, in fact, have NHMRC at estimates. Um, every estimates, if we want to have them, where they can be questioned. And if the, the Senate feels that they are not doing an appropriate job of oversighting this trial, well, then it is open to us to then be putting more measures in place. So I just want to put on the record that, having considered this very thoroughly, um, that I'm deciding to not support this amendment. Do you have any other contributions? The last, oh, Senator Shikani. So, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And maybe, maybe for clarity, um, from the remarks that Senator Rice had made, um, and look, not privy to the discussions she may or may not have had with Senator O'Neill, um, is, is reducing the number from down from 20 to another number something that the, the good senator would be considering? Senator Rice, would you like to respond? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, no, because I think actually the number of trial participants is an arbitrary um, measure. It's not the right metric that you need to be using to determine whether the trial is successful. Okay, thank you. It being 1.30 or very rapidly approaching, the committee now reports progress and we shall now proceed to our two-minute statements. And I call Senator Gallagher. Me? I thought I was second. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'd just like to make a few comments uh, about um, the government's latest desperate attempt to launch a, a lame new scare campaign. And we saw it yesterday with the finance uh, minister who issued uh, numbers of the Liberal Party costing commitments from the Labor Party. What could possibly go wrong there? Um, and all the bluster around that. Well, I just want to make it clear that Labor will be not taking any lectures on fiscal responsibility from the Morrison government. We're not going to be lectured by finance ministers and treasurers who have delivered a trillion dollars of debt and eight consecutive budget deficits after promising uh, surplus budgets in the first year and every year after that. Uh, when you look at the facts of this government's budget management, 
and you can see why we won't be taking lectures. It's the second highest taxing government in the last 30 years, only trumped by the Howard government, I might add, hid $16 billion in the budget to be rolled out at election time, wasted and rorted billions and billions of dollars through various funds that they've established to buy votes, 21 slush funds set up in the last budget alone, spent a billion dollars in government advertising. You can always find a bit of spare coin for that. All the billions wasted on dumping the French submarine contract in costs. We know that's about 2.4 billion with more to come. 19.7 billion going in JobKeeper to companies that actually increased their revenue during the pandemic. This is the legacy of this government. No wonder they're desperately out there trying to stir up fear and use misinformation and disinformation to try and distract away from their own division, their own incompetence yeah, yeah. and their COVID complacency. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Madam, Madam Deputy President. Last night I spoke in the chamber about the significant risk that a Labor-Greens alliance poses to Australian jobs and the national economy if ever Labor was to be elected. The Greens moratorium on mining, coal, gas and oil it proposes, which Labor will be forced to accept in any hung parliament or power-sharing arrangement, will bring this country to its knees. 80,000 jobs, including 50,000 in construction and $500 billion in investment will go. With Labor's reckless COVID commitments, including paying every Australian $300 to get vaccinated, this would have cost an extra $81 billion. This is the brutal truth, Senator Gallagher. It is frightening to consider Labor being in control of the Treasury benches. In fact, Labor is so incompetent it can't even add up what's required to fund a basic road project. In Geelong, the Morrison government is proudly funding stage one of the Bowen Heads road duplication. $292 million, or 80 per cent of the total cost. This is a vital road upgrade for Marshall, Armstrong Creek and Charlemont residents and those living in Bowen Heads, Ocean Grove and beyond. This funding was agreed by our government after Daniel Andrews and State Labor reneged on their commitment to fund 100 per cent of this road upgrade. Our wonderful Liberal candidate is advocating hard for stage two. It's a $250 million project and consistent with the funding agreement, 80 per cent or $200 million is required. But what's Labor's commitment for stage two? A paltry $125 million, a $75 million black hole on this road project. We've had the carbon tax, the mining tax, the closure of Ford, the cancellation of the $1 billion howitzer project, the backflip on the east-west link, the refusal to fund the Great Ocean Road, and now Labor can't even fund a basic road project. We cannot afford to risk Labor. Thank you. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. As I said in my first speech, we've been tackling the issue of violence against women all wrong. We have to stop thinking this, of this as a women's only issue. It's a societal issue that disproportionately affects women and children. After decades of working as an activist, advocate, consultant in the gender equality space, I know the statistics all too well. As a First Nations woman, we are 35 times more likely to experience family violence and 10 times more likely to experience death because of family violence. As a black feminist, a mother, an advocate and now a senator, I want to end violence against women and girls. In this place, it's our responsibility to commit to preventing violence from happening to our children and our grandchildren. And it's our responsibility to ensure the safety of women at home, at work and in public. We must take abuse in all forms more seriously and commit to structural change. The draft national plan to end violence against women and their children is ours for consultation. While it recognises that gender equality is key to tackling uh, the end to violence against women, it fails to detail how that will actually be achieved. I heard very clearly Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins at the National Press Club yesterday talk about how violence needs to be taken much more seriously, how we need structural reform and how we need more education about violence against women and girls. 
The Greens have already committed to $1 billion a year, $1 billion a year that is needed to ensure that pro programs are fully funded and no one is turned away from frontline services. To put that into perspective, this government spends ten times that on subsidies for their fossil fuel mates. I have had enough with this Morrison government's half-baked attempts to eliminate violence against women, and it's time to kick the Liberals out and to put the Greens in balance of power. Senator Grogan. Thank you. The message I'm hearing really strongly across South Australia is clear. People want real climate action, they want more jobs, and they want cheaper power. And this is especially true in the seat of Boothby. Boothby feels the impacts of climate change very, very keenly. People in the hills know the threat of bushfire, they've lived through it, and they know that without real climate action, things will only get worse. They'll see more fires burning more intensely. People on the coast know exactly what rising sea levels will mean for them. And no one wants to see that loss of coastline from Glenelg to Brighton or anywhere else. And the incredible natural environment throughout the electorate, Brown Hill Creek, Bel Air National Park and so many other sites are at risk as the climate changes. Louise Miller Frost, the candidate, the Labor candidate for Boothby, tells me that it is a consistent issue that is raised with her on the ground. And Louise is looking to work hard to deliver climate action. And an important part of that that she's fighting for is a, a Labor's Powering Australia plan, which will result in more jobs, cleaner energy and lower power bills. Creating jobs and reducing carbon emissions. This is what the people of Boothby are crying out for, and this is what Louise Miller Frost and Labor intend to deliver. People in Boothby know that the climate is changing and they want to see this, this parliament take action. They want to see their representatives take action. Thank you. Senator Hanson, remotely. Thank you very much. I have to speak about the millions of Australians that feel that they are being discriminated against with regards to COVID. At present, we have thousands of Australians that are congregating outside the halls of parliament and on the lawns. Yet how many of you politicians have been down to actually face them, to speak to them? I tried to move a bill last year that it was against discrimination, a person's right to say whether they wanted to have a vaccination or not. You voted it down. I then Sorry, Senator Hanson, a there's a point party. of order. Um, yes, Senator Patrick. The in the standing orders is that senators must attend in person. There is a resolution of the Senate, resolution uh, adopted on the 13th of May 2021, which gives senators the right to appear remotely, but only under circumstances that enable them to participate in Senate proceedings while they are prevented from physically attending the Senate because of COVID-19 related travel restrictions, quarantine requirements or personal health requirements. I just ask Senator Hanson uh, to perhaps elaborate on, the, on whether or not um, she meets that requirement. Uh, otherwise, I ask that she not be heard. Sorry, that is no point of order with regard- Hanson, yes. That is no point of order. I'm sorry, there is no point of order to that whatsoever. Senator Hanson, if I could just consult with the clerks and we, I'll c come back in a second. Um, so there is no point of order, Senator Patrick. When the rules for remote participation operate, the system is available to senators prevented from attending the Senate because of COVID-19 related travel restriction, quarantine requirements or personal health advice. And while the basis for the rules applying to an individual will sometimes be readily apparent, particularly when border restrictions or quarantine requirements are in place, 
It is not the practice of the President and Deputy President to inquire into the nature of the personal health advice an individual senator may have. By seeking to participate remotely, individual senators are representing to the Senate that they fall within the ambit of the rules, and the Chair takes that at face value. It is for individual senators to determine the extent to which they wish to explain the basis on which they are participating remotely. Um, yes, Senator Patrick. Just responding to that, I invite Senator Hanson to, uh, to make a declaration as to why she's sitting remotely. I would just like her to turn up to work. Um, as I have said, I'm going to go back to Senator Hanson to finish her statement. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Now, that just shows that Senator Patrick, how low he will go. My speech to you, this parliament is on behalf of millions of, millions of Australians that feel they have been discriminated against, and he wants to shut that down. If I'm not doing my work, I am damn well doing my work. The whole fact is that they feel they're discriminated against. And what makes me so angry is that 11 hours were spent yesterday in the lower chamber debating a bill about a person's religious um, discrimination against the religion. And the fact is that we have spoken about transgender, we've spoken about gays and lesbians, which are standing up fighting for an issue that, that doesn't really um, come into the equation when we have millions of Australians being forced to have injections against their will, losing their jobs, losing their homes, who are suiciding. This has actually happened to Australians, but you gutless wonders in that place there have not taken the chance to actually go out and talk to them and listen to them. You shut down debate in that parliament on behalf of many Australians, and I will continue to fight for them on their behalf. Talk about discrimination. You are pathetic that you haven't given them the chance to have their voice. Listen to their concerns, because that's what it's about. And yet you actually pick and choose what you want to say is discrimination. It is a shame. Senator shame Hanson, your time has expired. Senator Askew. Madam Acting Deputy President, hidden in the hills behind Launceston, not far from the Tamar River, River is the Tasmania Zoo. This family-owned business has one of the largest collections of primates in any Australian private zoo. It is home to hundreds of endemic Tasmanian, Australian native and exotic species, including critically endangered animals. Tasmania Zoo was founded by Dick Warren in 2003 to contribute to wildlife conservation and educate the community. Dick's daughter, Rochelle Penny, took over running the zoo after his death in 2018, continuing his legacy to protect, protect endangered animals. The zoo participates in the Tasmanian Devil Breeding Program, contributing strong stock that has bolstered the national devil population and increased genetic diversity for the threatened species. Another Tasmanian zoo success is the critically endangered northern white-cheeked gibbon, with the zoo's pair welcoming a baby last August. This tiny gibbon is one of just a handful born in captivity in the world and the first in Tasmania. Besides cute gibbons, fluffy red pandas, strutting cheetahs and hundreds of other animals, I must mention the zoo's newest residents, two 18-month-old giraffes named Hunter and Talbot. These half-brothers were born at Australia Zoo on Queensland's Sunshine Coast and are the first giraffes to call Tasmania home. It was a huge financial and logistical commitment for Rochelle to bring the giraffes to Tasmania, with help from Sea Road and Zoo to Zoo transport companies, Siva Logistics, a team of zookeepers and a vet. The coronavirus pandemic presented Tasmania Zoo with a different kind of logistical issue, feeding and caring for hundreds of animals while being closed for six months. During my recent visit to the zoo, Ms Penny expressed her gratitude for the Australian Government's zoo and aquarium COVID-19 support package, which helped them out during that difficult time. Our government is making sure businesses like Tasmania Zoo can continue playing a vital role in protecting at-risk species and educating and entertaining visitors. Thank you. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The government will soon release the new State of the Environment report, an independent five-yearly assessment of our environment. Unfortunately, this report will make very much for grim reading. As we learn from Professor Samuel's review of the EPBC Act, our environment is in an unsustainable decline, and this government has yet to make any real change that will slow the decline. One important part of the report will look at Australia's air quality. 
While our air quality is clean by global standards, there are persistent issues that require attention and action. One concern is particulate matter from cars and trucks, which affects urban and regional communities. Some regional communities also face excessive pollution from local industrial activities. And as we learned two years ago, bushfires can have a devastating impact on air quality. The significance of good air quality cannot be overstated. It is not just important for general health or for those with breathing difficulties. It also has huge effects on our children's well-being. One of the best things we can do is to improve our children's education and health is to simply ensure the air they breathe is clean. When you add up the health, education and workforce impacts of pollution, the costs are truly enormous. And they completely outweigh the benefits of allowing polluting activities to continue. So I sincerely hope that the government, this government, acts on this new report and takes seriously the concerns it raises about air quality. It should move quickly to improve air quality monitoring throughout Australia and to implement policies to improve air quality in our schools and in our communities. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to offer my condolences to the family of Craig McGregor and to speak about his remarkable contribution to journalism and to Australian writing. Craig started his career at the Herald, but his writing found its way everywhere, from the New York Times to the National Times. He wrote more than 19 groundbreaking books on Australian politics and culture, along with two novels, two collections of short stories, and it was all complemented by a capacity to write poetry. And his colleagues, David Lisa, described it in this way. Craig McGregor was one of the blazing stars in the Australian intellectual and cultural firmament. For more than 60 years, he wrote about everything from politics, class, popular culture, surfing and architecture, to love, sex and marriage. His skills were vast and many, matched only by his limitless curiosity. The eight and a half metres of his personal materials now held in the National Library are testimony to this curiosity. A quick scan reveals notes on Patrick White, on Bruce Dorr, on Barry Humphreys, on music, on photography, and of course on the many political figures that he profiled and for which he is so fondly remembered by both journos and pollies. I met Craig and his wife Jane in 2001 when I was a candidate in the federal election. And Craig was living on the North Coast, a place of enormous personal significance to him. Craig planted the pandanus and casuarina trees that now stand along the front at Watergoes Beach. Craig was keen to talk and he invited me into his beautiful home. He was a lovely conversationalist, engaging deeply and intelligently with the issues that confronted Labor nationally and locally. He approached these most serious issues with a unique, joyful spirit. Both Craig and Jane offered enormously generous personal and political support to me and I will always be so grateful. My condolences. Senator Mirabella. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Victorian Government and AusNet's contentious Western Victoria Transmission Network project. This project seeks to construct an electricity transmission network through 190 kilometres of Western Victorian farmland. I recently met with the CEO of the Moorabool Shire Council and he succinctly explained the impact that this project would have across the Shire. And this is only one Shire facing these problems. The residents of Moorable Shire acknowledge and are supportive of the efforts to connect and power Western Victoria with renewable energy. However, the Shire believes that the current plans will pose destabilising and ongoing effects to the environment and economic livelihood of the region. Importantly, the agricultural industry across Moorable Shire generates $206 million in exports per annum, which equates to a third of the Shire's exports and supports 800 jobs. The direct loss of prime agricultural land due to the acquisition, construction and placing of easements of the project will jeopardise the lifeblood of the region. Seeking to improve the plans the residents have commissioned, an independent review of the project and as such believe that these transmission lines can and should be placed underground. And I must note that the member for Ballarat has previously voiced her concerns for this project. Now, I too, like the member, would like to see this issue surrounding the wider project resolved. 
However, it appears that the members' com comrades on Spring Street are not willing to listen to the voices of the affected communities, and this has real consequences. The destruction of the environment, the destruction of livelihoods and, once again, the destruction of rural representation. It cannot be clearer. What is needed is a workable and practical solution that incorporates the input of the affected shires and farmers, not the expedient dictates of the Victorian Labor Party. The project must be re-examined and redrawn as a matter of urgency. Thank you, and I'm sorry for the phone. <laughs> I was one. <laughs> um, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There's a lot to talk about age, the aged care. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the aged care minister choosing to spend three days at the cricket while the aged care sector was and does remain in crisis. He did this instead of turning up to a Senate COVID committee. Now, like everyone else in this parliament, Minister Colbeck has decided how to use his time. I have to uh, balance priorities all of the time, and no one uh, would begrudge the minister going to the cricket. He is the sports minister. But really, three days? That was not an exercise of good judgment. But I think what that does show us is the fact that whilst we've got uh, this pandemic, whilst we've got uh, this crisis uh, that has been brought home by the Royal Commission, we need to have a focus on aged care. So I'm trying to be helpful here and say to the government, we need to have an aged care minister that is solely focused on aged care. Not two portfolios, not three portfolios, but one portfolio. One minister for aged care looking after aged care people. Our, elder, our elderly deserve that. They also deserve the implementation of the uh, Royal Commission into Aged Care. We've seen a debacle this week in relation to the uh, Religious Discrimination Bill in this place. We could have been dealing with the Aged Care Royal Commission No. 2 Bill that is on the notice paper, helping our aged care. I've got an amendment in there that gives us nurses in aged care 24-7, raises the standard of care, and we need to do that. Ageing should be a privilege, not a punishment. Senator Brown. Providing quality education is the core business of our universities. I've met with university representatives and locals about the proposed move of the Hobart campus of the University of Tasmania, UTAS, from Sandy Bay to the Hobart CBD. In addition to offering direct education, universities often foster the development of businesses, big and small, research and many other activities on and around their campuses. UTAS is special in that it is the only one in Tasmania, so decisions to move a university campus will have an impact on many more people, organisations and businesses than those that are directly associated with the university. We need to make sure it is the right move. Any decision to move campus rather than to renovate and redevelop the existing site requires resourcing both financial and personnel. A SAVE UTAS group made up of community members, current and former University of Tasmania academics, business operators and UTAS students has formed and is launching a petition against the campus relocation. I will continue to meet with stakeholders. Senator, Senator Billick and I will be meeting with the Vice-Chancellor and representatives from the University of Tasmania in coming weeks. The University of Tasmania is highly valued and regarded by the people of Tasmania. We must never lose sight of the need to maintain student amenity, educational and research outcomes as the priority for the university. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy Black President. Uh, Aboriginal land and our people were stolen, and we want our land back. Not joint management. Joint management is not our land back. It's mission management. Land back means exactly what it says. Land back. 
Widgeable, wearable mob have been fighting for their sacred Bunyam Begum site to be handed back. Last year, Lismore City Councillors voted seven to one to hand land back. Shame on that one single councillor trying to stop handing land back to its rightful owners. Elders are sick of justifying and debating their very existence. Land is part of our health and well-being as First People. Thanks, Lismore City Council, for truth and justice and real action. My message to Lismore City Council is simple. Your allyship is appreciated and welcomed. And I want to pay my respects to all our old people and our warriors of the resistance who have been fighting for our land back for over 200 years, particularly Uncle Mickey in Lismore. Uncle Mickey has made it very, very clear that the only way for the site to be protected is to return the land back. Returning land back to its rightful owners is the right thing to do. After all, it's stolen land. We just want our land back, so give it back. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Northern Australia. Labor's critic of reinsurance, the reinsurance pool, don't live in the north, and they don't reflect the lived experience of thousands of people in the north. In the north, we pay more for electricity, building materials, flights and insurance. Our premiums are at least two and a half times what people in the South pay, and that's if insurance companies will even look at you. It's especially grim for businesses. Many are forced to self-insure because no insurance companies will give them coverage. Uh, the coalition government listened, consulted and acted, and the $10 billion reinsurance pool will reduce household premiums by up to 46 per cent, strata title properties up to 58 per cent discount, and small to medium enterprises up to a 34 per cent discount. The Townsville Chamber of Commerce has calculated that if just two-thirds uh, of the projected savings were spent in the city annually, there would be approximately $220 million in economic output, a contribution of $118 million to gross regional product, over $60 million in income and salaries for local workers, and approximately 949 ongoing full-time jobs created directly and indirectly through multiplier effects. These numbers did not include reductions in small business premiums, and if they did, we would see even greater benefits. Thank you to customer advocate Margaret Shaw, Assistant Treasurer Michael Sooker and our North Queensland MPs Phil Thompson, George Christensen and Warren Inch for helping to make this pool a reality. Northern Australia covers 51 per cent of the country. It has only 7 per cent of the House of Reps and Senators living there uh, and 3.5 per cent of the population. We are deserving of a go to enjoy the, enjoy the same prosperity as the rest of the country. Thank you. Senator Lyons. Of this country, when he failed to attend the National Press Club luncheon yesterday to hear the addresses by Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins. Apparently, he was too busy. He's too busy to introduce an ICAC and he's too busy to take notice of the women of Australia. Well, we're watching, Mr. Morrison, and everything you've done to date has been completely inadequate, whether it's your tone deaf to women, whether it's your inadequate apology, your failure to attend the National Press Club luncheon, women are watching, and uh, we will not be silenced. And good on Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins. It being 2 p.m., we will move to questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham, you're seeking the call. I do have, uh, Grace, leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Oh. Please go Mr. ahead, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today, Thursday, 10 February 2022, for medical reasons. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Government Services and the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Education and Youth. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Now we will move to questions. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Former New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian has said that, and I quote, all four of my grandparents were orphaned and witnessed untold atrocities against the Armenian people in 1915. More than 40 of her relatives were killed. Nine newspapers reported on the weekend that staff in the Prime Minister's office referred disparagingly to the New South Wales former Premier Gladys Berejiklian as Anne Frank. Why is the Prime Minister's office using Anne Frank's name to disparage Gladys Berejiklian? Uh, Minister, uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And Mr. President, uh, I have not heard of those allegations, and I did not see uh, the story to which Senator Keneally refers in relation to those allegations. The Prime Minister has made very clear the utmost respect and regard that he has for Ms. Berejiklian. Uh, as is well known, he would have loved indeed for her to be a candidate uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, this parliament. Uh, we would have welcomed that particular former New South Wales Premier uh, to enter the House of Representatives, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President. We would have welcomed that particular New South Wales Premier to enter the House of Representatives, uh, Mr., uh, Mr President. Uh, and the Prime Minister has been very clear in relation to his, to his very high regard for her, uh, and I am confident uh, that he would have no tolerance for any such uh, references were they to be made in any place. Here, here. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Has the Prime Minister ever referred to Ms Berejiklian as Anne Frank? Has the Prime Minister determined who in his office referred to Ms Berejiklian as Anne Frank? And will the Prime Minister apologise for his office using Anne Frank's name as an insult to Gladys Berejiklian? Minister. Oh, Mr President, as I just indicated, uh, the Prime Minister, I am confident, would have no tolerance for such references in any way. I am completely confident that he would never have made them and that he has such zero tolerance. As I said, I haven't seen the allegations, and forgive me for the fact that I don't take everything in the way it's framed in questions from the opposition uh, as being presented at face value. because. I've learnt uh, in this job over time uh, that the distortions in terms Order. of the way questions can be presented uh, often uh, add a tone of misrepresentation uh, to what is apparently uh, having occurred. But the Prime Minister's respect for Ms Berejiklian is paramount, is significant, is held in the highest regard, uh, and Mr President, uh, his intolerance for such references or statements would equally be high. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Notice supplementary. she didn't rule out that his office had done it. The Prime Minister's office backgrounded against the loved ones of Ms Brittany Higgins. Then a veiled threat was made against Ms Grace Tame. And now we learn the Prime Minister's office uses Anne Frank's name as an insult to Gladys Berejiklian. You have not ruled that out. Order. What is going on inside the Prime Minister's office? Order. 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 Minister. Mr President, just because Senator Keneally says it doesn't mean it's true. Just because Senator Keneally picks up the mud bucket and throws it around doesn't mean there's any accuracy to it. Mr President, these opposite, those opposite are demonstrating, as they do time and time again, question time after question time, they're only interested in character assassination. They're only interested in making it a personality contest. They're not interested in policies. You know, as we've highlighted in this place, they come in here, they sling mud at Senator Colbeck, but they never propose an alternate aged care policy, do they? No, no, they never do that, of course. They are an opposition bereft of any ideas, bereft of any direction, bereft of any substance, with a leader who flip-flops and policies depending Order. on where they're at, with a, an opposition Order. who came up with $81 billion of extra spending ideas during the course of the pandemic, but then say we should have budget repair. Minister. They demonstrate they've just Minister. got no idea. Minister. 
Thank you. Before we move on, Senator Patterson, I would just like to draw attention of honourable senators to the presence in the gallery of the Minister for Health for Papua New Guinea, the Honourable Jelta Wong, and the High Commissioner for Papua New Guinea to Australia, His Excellency John Carley. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and, in particular, to the Senate. Senator Patterson. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister update the Senate on the visits to Australia by our key partners this week and broader engagement by the Liberal and Nationalist government to promote an Indo-Pacific region that is stable, secure and prosperous? I call the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his question and for his deep interest in these key strategic issues. Under this coalition government, Australia is working with our partners to advance our values and shared interests. This week, in fact, brings engagements with eight of my foreign minister counterparts. Tomorrow, the Quad foreign ministers' meeting with India, the United States and Japan will take place in Melbourne. With External Affairs Minister Jashanka, Foreign Minister Hayashi and US Secretary of State Blinken, Australia continues to pursue an agenda for a free and open Indo-Pacific through ambitious, practical cooperation. The Quad follows a visit by my Lithuanian counterpart, Foreign Affairs Minister Lands Burgess, with whom I had very productive discussions yesterday on our responses to major security and trade challenges. Today I've met with Timor-Leste's Foreign Affairs and Cooperation Minister Adeliza Mengo, and we discussed our shared COVID-19 response, vaccines and labour mobility. This week we've also had a four-way virtual call with Minister Magno and our counterparts from Indonesia and New Zealand, Ministers Masudi and Mahuta. Four female foreign ministers in our region sends a very powerful message, Mr President. We discussed advocacy and action on the Women, Peace and Security agenda and, and once again I expressed Australia's strong support for the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Today, I also met with my friend, Papua New Guinea's Health Minister, Jolta Wong, and I also acknowledge Jolta in the chamber today. Minister Wong and I particularly just reinforced Australia's commitment in our discussions to partnering with Papua New Guinea on our shared COVID-19 response and recovery. All of our partners, Mr President, are committed to building a free and open region, deeply engaging with a range of partners to support our vision for an open, prosperous and secure Indo-Pacific. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise the Senate on the positive agenda for the Quad foreign, meet, foreign Ministers meeting with India, Japan and the United States tomorrow? Minister. Mr President, our four countries share a commitment to building a free and open Indo-Pacific, and we are cooperating to support that goal. Most critical is the COVID response. I'm pleased to report that the Quad has now delivered more than 500 million vaccines under our 1.3 billion dose commitment. We will also discuss further cooperation to defend against malicious cyber attacks and dangerous disinformation, to enhance maritime security in our region, to support infrastructure development, to enhance climate action by working together on clean energy supply chains and to assist our Indo-Pacific partners when they face crises, such as the volcanic eruption and tsunami that so recently devastated Tonga. The Quad agenda is positive and it's practical. It works alongside our other relationships, including, importantly, with ASEAN, which, founded in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, lies at the heart of the Indo-Pacific. Senator Patterson, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise the Senate on upcoming opportunities to further advance Australia's vision of an open and resilient Indo-Pacific? Minister. Mr President, Australia is promoting and supporting our shared vision for the Indo-Pacific region, including through cooperation with partners like the United Kingdom and Europe. Late last month, Minister Dutton and I hosted the Australia-United Kingdom ministerial consultations in Sydney. We had substantive discussions about deepening strategic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and secured new agreements with the United Kingdom on cyber cooperation and sustainable infrastructure investment in the Indo-Pacific. This follows my meetings in December at the G7 in Liverpool with the world's most influential liberal democracies and meetings with and visits to counterparts in Greece, the European Union, uh, in Belgium and in Austria. This month, I'll attend the Munich Security Conference in Germany and the European Union Ministerial Forum for Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific in Paris. 
These discussions underline Australia's commitment to cooperation with the EU and other like-minded countries in support of the rules-based order. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Minister Colbeck. Minister, the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics Selected Living Costs Index was released last week. By how much has the cost of living gone up for aged pensioners in Australia over the last calendar year? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank the Senator for the question. Uh, Senator, I don't have a brief with me on the CPI increase um, for uh, senior Australians. I'm sorry, I can't give that. I'll commit to come back to you at the end of question time with the data. Senator Sheldon. A Minister supplementary question. If the December quarter 2021 is 3.4 per cent, do these latest statistics show that the highest annual increase to the cost of living is being inflicted on aged pensioners, or have we conveniently forgotten to bring your homework today? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, the, the government has continued to support senior Australians through a number of measures over the course of recent times, including through specific and special payments to support them through the COVID-19 pandemic. We've put a number of measures in place to support individuals who might be isolated in their homes during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and I reject any assertion at all uh, that we have left any part of the community behind. We have worked as a government throughout the entire uh, period of the pandemic and uh, to ensure that there are additional resources available available for people to help them meet the cost of living. We've put supplements in respect of the pension in place, Mr President. We've put supplements in, pl Minister, in place. Please resume your seat. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, direct relevance. Um, the question was fairly tightly worded and specific as to whether or not there were the highest annual increases to the cost of living being inflicted on aged pensioners. The minister hasn't addressed that aspect of the question. I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to bring the minister back to the question. However, the question did involve uh, some commentary in the asking of the question, uh, which quite frankly does mean the question is not worded quite as narrowly as you say, Senator Keneally. Uh, I've allowed you to bring the minister back to the question. Uh, minister, you have the call for 15 seconds. Mr. President, uh, uh, the government has, or the, the process that, that the government supports, and I'm presuming that the opposition supports, has continued to support the increase in pensions on, the, on a regular cycle. Uh, and so, Mr. President, I don't accept the premise. I don't, I don't accept Minister, the premise, Mr. Minister, President, that Minister, uh, your time the government's left has pensioners behind. Expired. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary question. With the cost of living for aged pensioners going up for food, housing, and transport. What is the minister doing in his role as minister for senior Australians to ensure they can get by? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was just indicating, there is a regular cycle of pension increases which take into account the impacts of the CPI uh, as, as a part of the, the pension increase process. And as I said earlier, Mr. President, during COVID, uh, during COVID Mr. President, we've put additional payments in place to support. Uh, senior Australians and pensioners to help them support support them through uh, the COVID pandemic, Mr. President. So, uh, I acknowledge the comments that uh, Senator Sheldon is making in relation to the, the recent CPI increases, but those things are taken into account in the in the regular CPI increases uh, that are undertaken for the pension. Um, they, the pension rates increased on the 20th of September by $14.80 for singles and $22. 40 for couples demand, uh, combined, and new maximum fortnightly, fortnightly rates, uh, including uh, pension supplement and energy supplements, 
967.50 for singles and 1458.60 for couples. I have Senator Wish Wilson next on the list. I'm going to you, Senator Rice. Is yes. that correct? <laughs> Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Attorney General. Minister, I just read this headline from the ABC. Government shelves religious freedom bill indefinitely. Can you confirm that you no longer plan to bring on the religious discrimination bills for debate in the Senate before the election? The Attorney General. Minister Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Senator Rice, and thank you for your question uh, on the very important topic of protecting Australians um, from discrimination on the basis of their religion. Uh, the bill actually passed the House of Representatives last night, the Religious Discrimination Bill. It passed with the government amendments. But in relation to another bill, Senator Rice, which Adam Band voted for, changes to the Sex Discrimination Act. Mr President, do you know what happens when you rush something and you don't potentially Order. consider the consequences? Order. Senator Rice, you can Order make mistakes. You can make mistakes. And Mr President, I have Order. been overwhelmed with calls this morning regarding Order. the impact of the amendments passed last Minister, night. Minister. No, I'm not going to give you the call until there's silence in the chamber. Senator Rice. Um, President, um, point of order on relevance. My question was very succinct and very direct as to whether the religious discrimination bill would be brought on for debate in the Senate before the election. I listened to your question, Senator Rice. I'm listening to the minister's answer. I believe the minister is being relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thank you very much. And Mr. President, as I said, the Morrison government, the Morrison Joyce government, takes the issues of discrimination very seriously in Australia. We are committed to protecting Australians of faith and those not of faith from discrimination on the basis of their religion. And as I said, the bill passed the House of Representatives last night. We made a commitment to the Australian people that we Order. would, on this issue, address it at the last election. And Senator Rice, we are progressing that commitment. Order. But when amendments passed the House of Representatives, supported by the right of Labor, that have the potential impact of actually increasing the discrimination Order. and the grounds of discrimination that can actually be now against Order. students. Mr President, we take that Minister. serious— Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt. Senator, Senator Rice, I have not given you the call. It needs to be quiet in the chamber. Order. Order on my right. Order. Senator Rice, you have the call for a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your non-answer to my question. We are still in the dark as to whether the government will bring on the bill. Minister, the, the media is full of headlines, bill on ice, indefinitely delayed, will not proceed. Minister, given that, and it seems that you know, I take that it's not going to proceed, why won't you take, commit to taking meaningful action to protect people of faith rather than this sham bill that was the rushed product of right-wing culture wars? Minister. Well, Senator Rice, you see, this is the fundamental difference between the Australian Greens and those in the coalition side of the government. You see, we believe in protecting people of faith from discrimination. And we made a commitment to the Australian people. We Order. consulted widely, Mr President, across the board, and we presented to the parliament what was a fair and reasonable bill. It honoured our commitment to people Order. of faith to protect them from discrimination Senator on the Rice. basis of their religion. Senator, Senator Rice, Rice, do you think it is fair? that a Muslim should be discriminated against in employment. Do you think it is fair, do you? Do you think it is fair that a Sikh 
should be discriminated against in Senator employment. Pratt. Do you think it is fair? Senator Mc Order. Order. Senator McKim, on a point of order. Thank you, President. On a, on a point of order, the answer to those questions, of course, is no. But I draw to your attention, uh, President, that remarks should be directed to the chair, not to, uh, in the form of questions, directly uh, to other senators. But the answer, Fair. for what it's worth, is no. Senator McKim, there is no point of order. Minister, you have five seconds remaining if you wish to take them. Absolutely. Again. On this side of politics, we believe in protecting people of faith Minister, from discrimination based Minister, on that Minister. faith. Senator Order. Senator Rice, a second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, do you think that transgender diverse and non-binary people, including students at school, deserve the same protection from discrimination as other people, including by not having their very identity challenged and undermined by hurtful transphobic speech? Minister. Well, Mr President, again, the Morrison Joyce government has made its position very, very Clear. Order. Yes, we have, Senator Rice. And if you Order. actually, Senator Rice, believed in protections, you would have read the amendment that passed the House of Representatives last night. There are very, very serious potential consequences for Section 38 and 37 of the Sex Discrimination Act because of the way it is drafted. Do you know what it has the effect of, Mr. President? potentially increasing the grounds of discrimination against students and against prospective students. Order. 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 Senator Watt. Order. Senator Rice, on a point of order. A point of order again with relevance. My question was whether transgender diverse and non-binary people, including students at school, include, deserve the same protection from discrimination. I was listening to the minister's answer, and I believe she was being relevant to the question. Minister, you have 16 seconds remaining. Let me be very, very, very clear about the potential impact of the amendment that you supported last night. It seeks to protect students on the basis of gender identity. It leaves out the protections for those in the intersex community. This is why you need Minister, to properly understand Minister, the Minister, consequences Minister. of amendments that you make. Senator Walsh. Order Thank you, on President. My left. Order. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Does the government collect data on how many shifts in aged care in Australia are going unfilled each week? If yes, what is that number? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. No, the, the government does not collect individual facility shift data. Um, I do not think that is a, a level of detail uh, that uh, we should go to. Order. Mr President, as, as I have indicated, uh, to the chamber recently, we do some We do ha have done some calculation of the number of shifts that we, uh, uh, that we believe might or not might, um, might not be being filled, based on the number of uh, staff that um, uh, have con have had COVID, Mr. President. And so, uh, based on uh, some information as of the 4th of February, uh, for affected facilities. We believe the accumula uh, cumulative infection rate is nearly 30, 13 per cent um, of the uh, workforce on average and just over 5 per cent concurrently. So uh, that's, that relates to uh, the impact on facilities of uh, COVID-19 and therefore the shifts that are, that are being filled, particularly in relation to COVID. Sen order. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Peak Body, the Australian Aged Care Collaboration, found up to 140,000 shifts were not being filled each week. Can the minister confirm that, at best, the surge workforce is filling 0.7 per cent 
less than 1 per cent of unfilled aged care shifts each week. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the surge workforce was not designed to fill every unfilled shift in aged care Order. during COVID. Mr. President, it wasn't Order. designed to do that. Um, and, Mr. President, the the advice that the government provided Order. to aged care providers right at the back at, at the beginning of the pandemic was that they would be required to have a, some capacity in the cells to manage vacancies in, and shift. Senator Watt, on a Thank, point of order. Thanks. On relevance, Mr President, the question was a factual one and was going to the percentage of uh, unfilled shifts that the surge workforce is filling. That was the question, not the policy rationale or anything else like that. We'd just like a factual answer to that factual question. S Senator. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, on the uh, on the point of order, as uh, as you have ruled and uh, and your predecessors have ruled regularly, uh, it is not uh, it is not for the chair to determine precisely how a question should be answered. It is the chair order. to uphold the standing orders in terms of the direct relevance uh, of uh, of an answer, uh, and of course that direct relevance uh, can go to. Uh, the type of policy considerations and other things, uh, uh, Senator Watt Order. has said, would not be relevant. It is not the case that uh, just because a question asks for a particular number, that other relevant policy and issues associated with such data or facts would not also be directly relevant. Clearly, they would be. Uh, I've been listening to the minister's answer. I believe he was being directly relevant to the question. The minister has 39 seconds remaining. I call the minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, and it does relate specifically to the question, because the inference is that the surge workforce should fill all shifts that uh, aren't being filled, and that's not what the surge workforce was designed to fill, Mr. President. In the advice to the sector provided early in the pandemic, providers themselves were required to have capacity to fill a certain proportion of shifts themselves, uh, Mr. President. And we have said where they, that capacity became overwhelmed, we would come in and support them with the surge workforce. And that's what we've done, Mr. President. That's what we've done, and we've continued to build the, the surge workforce to assist the sector to manage COVID-19 yeah, and their workforce shortages. Senator Walsh, a second supplementary. When 140,000 shifts in aged care are going unfilled. Does the minister think providing a thousand shifts is him performing exceptionally well? And when this minister continues to refuse to accept the aged care sector he is responsible for is in crisis, something even Mr Morrison has accepted, when will he resign? Minister. Uh, can I thank you and can I say what, what a completely incoherent question. I mean, Mr. Mr. President, ta ta again, Labor dishonestly taking out of context comments that I make about the performance of the sector versus, b b b versus uh, the, the circumstance with respect to filling of, of shifts through the surge workforce. And as I said in my uh, previous answer, Mr. President, the surge workforce was not designed, never was designed, to fill every vacant shift in residential aged care during COVID. It was there to provide assistance to providers who weren't able to fill Order. specific shifts in certain circumstances of extreme, um, uh, extreme need, Mr President. That's what we've done. Over 80,000 shifts we've provided support for, Mr President. We've continued to build that capacity uh, as we've uh, been able to and put additional resources towards it, and we will continue to support the sector as they work their way through the pandemic. We will now go to Senator Hanson remotely. Senator Hanson, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In the event the coalition is returned to government at this year's federal election, will the Prime Minister commit to establishing a Royal Commission into management of the COVID-19 pandemic by Australian governments? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank Senator Hanson um, for her question. It, uh, it is a very similar question to uh, to one that I uh, answered or addressed yesterday or the day before um, in relation to the types of reviews that uh, that could be undertaken. Uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear that uh, that 
Uh, right now, in the here and now, uh, the government's priority remains on response to the pandemic. Uh, and in responding to the pandemic, uh, Australia, uh, working together, Commonwealth government, state and territory governments, uh, business community, health experts, and, uh, and service providers in particular, uh, have all managed to achieve some outstanding outcomes in comparison to the rest of the world. Uh, that across Australia we uh, retain one of the lowest fatality rates and one of the highest vaccination rates uh, and some of the strongest economic outcomes. And, uh, they have all been uh, very important, hard fought for outcomes that, uh, that Australians as a whole have contributed to and have responded to all of those messages. But the Prime Minister also acknowledged that there will, Senator Hanson, be uh, time uh, for appropriate uh, reviews and inquiries to look at the management of COVID-19. Uh, of course, we have had in this chamber an ongoing review process through the COVID Select Committee that was established, uh, but I'm sure there will be processes that look back uh, once we can put the pandemic more clearly in the rearview mirror. Uh, Senator Hanson, the exact nature of such reviews and inquiries would be matters uh, to be discussed with states and territories and others at the time. And whilst it will be important to have a look at preparedness and readiness for the handling of future crises and other uncertainties and what has gone right or wrong, I would, as I did in the response the other day, also just caveat that uh, with the fact that the next pandemic, the next crisis will be quite different, no doubt, to this one. And so while there will be lessons to be learned, we shouldn't pretend that anything will always provide preparation for all of the uncertainties Minister. we may face. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question? Thank you. The Prime Minister has consistently stated he does not support mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations, but did not support my COVID-19 vaccination discrimination bill. Why hasn't the Prime Minister introduced government legislation to give effect to his position and override state and territory vaccine mandates? Minister. Order. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Um, well, and the response to that, in part, is contained within uh, your question, there, Senator Hanson, and that is that we are uh, not about to uh, introduce legislation to override uh, the states and territories uh, in these matters. Uh, we have supported uh, vaccine mandates only in the most limited of circumstances, uh, as Senator uh, as Senator Colbeck and others have uh, have worked through, and those limited circumstances being for high-risk settings such as aged care. Beyond that, uh, we have strongly encouraged all Australians to get vaccinated, and more than 94 per cent uh, have responded by being double-dose vaccinated. We have strongly encouraged people to have the third-dose booster, and many millions have responded by receiving the third-dose booster. But the decisions of state and territory governments to apply their own mandates in different circumstances are matters between them and their electorates. Uh, and of course, it is for parties, oppositions and people to make their own determinations in those states Minister. and territories. Senator Hanson, a second supplementary. Um, Minister, you just didn't um, encourage people to have them. You actually complied with the states to force the people to have it, otherwise they would lose their jobs and positions and not be allowed into hospitals and doctors or stadiums or pubs or clubs. So if the Prime Minister will not introduce legislation, what measures will he implement to end COVID-19 vaccine discrimination in Australia and allow millions of citizens the rights and freedoms to which they are entitled? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Hanson, uh, as I said, these are state and territory mandates. They differ across different states and territories. They're decisions taken uh, under the uh, constitutional powers of the states and territories through their public health and emergency orders uh, using state and territory laws. Uh, we're not uh, in the business of routinely seeking to override all state and territory laws and powers or be the arbiter of what is right or wrong in every state and territory. Uh, they have to stand and account for themselves. Uh, they are each democratically elected governments. They each have an opposition and other political representatives uh, in their state or territory, uh, and they are the right places to debate uh, the laws and the approaches of those states or territories. Our government has taken a different approach. We have not believed that widespread mandates are necessary except in the most exceptional of circumstances. We have been clear and consistent about that, uh, and our encouragement of Australians to voluntarily get vaccinated has helped to achieve some of the best vaccine outcomes in Minister, the world, which is helping to keep Australia safe. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Mullen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. 
And my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. With the Director General of Security's annual threat assessment speech yesterday, can you please update the, uh, the Senate on how our security environment has changed in recent times? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for his question, and of course acknowledge his great service to Australia and ensuring that Australians are kept safe. Mr. President, as we know, the coalition government's first priority is the security of the nation and its people, keeping Australians safe from those who seek to do us harm. ASIO and our law enforcement agencies they are alive to the threats that our nation faces, and they work tirelessly to both detect and deter those threats on a daily basis. The national security environment in Australia is a dynamic one, and it's an ever-evolving one. And that is why the government continually reviews the legislation and the capabilities that our agencies need to detect, intercept and to respond to the emerging security needs. We have seen online radicalisation continue to evolve and become a greater security threat to Australia and to our way of life. The Director-General addressed this in his speech last night. And we know that as a result of COVID-19, this threat has continued to increase. However, we also know that as Australians, this is not the only threat that we are currently facing. We know that the pervasive threat of foreign interference is rapidly growing in both scale and in proportion. As the Director-General stated last night, foreign interference has become a principal security concern for Australia not to downplay the significance of the threat of terrorism, but it is demanding far more attention and resources. And that is why the Morrison-Joyce government have is, always ensures that our national security legislation is strengthened and up to date. We have passed 27 tranches of national security legislation Minister. since 2014. Senator Molan, a supplementary question? Uh, how is the Liberal and National Government uh, working together to strengthen our national security and combat the threat of violent extremism? Minister. Well, thank you, Senator Molan. And Australia's counter-violent extremism framework it aims to prevent people from radicalising to violent extremism, whether religiously or ideologically motivated, by delivering nationally consistent approaches to managing at-risk individuals, including those in the justice system. Just this month, the Morrison-Joyce government announced an additional $61.7 million over four years to further strengthen the counter-violent extremism efforts. This funding it includes $24.5 million to expand the CVED radicalisation activities, $4.7 million to build on and extend efforts to combat terrorist propaganda online, identifying extremist material for removal, and $10.7 million to a new CVE grants program that will increase awareness and build community resilience to violent Minister. extremism. Senator Mullen, a uh, second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, beyond what our agencies report in their threat assessments, are there any other risks you are aware of when considering Australia's national security? Minister. Well, Senator Molan, we're at that time of the year where we're moving towards an election. And the Australian people really do need to consider what is important to them in their federal government. What they know from the Morrison-Joyce government is we will never compromise on national security. We will never make apologies for keeping Australians safe. We will never make Order. apologies for putting in place Order. tough measures to ensure that the lifestyle that we have in Australia is protected. Australians need to ask themselves, given what happened under the former Rudd-Gillard Labor government, what Senator would happen if Mr Albanese and Labor were elected to Senator office? Lines Mr Senator President, Rez. after 25 years in the parliament, Mr Albanese has never held a national security Order. portfolio. Never held a national port a security portfolio. Minister. Minister. Order on my left. 
Senator Cox. Oh, no. We Sen have another change from the Greens. Yes. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Th thank you. That's thank you, Chair. <laughs> My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In December last year, the Prime Minister made an unprecedented announcement of the Commonwealth's intention to refuse the application by Asset Energy to drill for oil and gas in Petroleum Exploration Permit 11 off the coast of Sydney and Newcastle. Reading directly from the PM's statement on the day, he said, this project will not proceed on our watch and this is not the right project for these communities and pristine beaches and waters. Strong statements were also made by six Liberal MPs on the day on the need to respect community wishes, protect our environment and not put our coastlines at risk. Minister, you would be aware that other communities are fighting against proposals for oil and gas drilling off their coasts, including King Island, Tasmania, off the 12 apostles in the Otway Basin in Victoria, Senator Thorpe's own good eye on Ditchamara country and off the Ningaloo Reef in the Carnarvon Basin. Many of these people don't feel these are the right projects for their communities. Will you also make a political intervention to protect these communities and their environments? And if not, how is that I'm not utterly Senator, hypocritical? Senator Wish Wilson. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Um, I, uh, I thank uh, Senator Wish Wilson for uh, his um, Yes, indeed. Was, was there a question? But uh, I'll do my best to respond, Mr. President, to, uh, to the, um, highlight the fact around the process issues related to the PEP 11 decision um, that, uh, that was taken. And from those, uh, those process issues, I think Senator Wish Wilson will, uh, will see that some of the uh, suggestions contained, assertions contained in his question, um, are without basis. Um, uh, PEP 11 uh, was. Uh, was uh, and is regulated and decisions are made under the joint authority uh, which comprises the relevant New South Wales Minister uh, and the Commonwealth Minister uh, for Resources. Uh, that joint authority uh, approach uh, advised the PEP 11 Order. title holder of the intent to effectively end the permit uh, by not approving the application by the title holder for a variation and suspension of the work program commitments and for an extension of the permit term. Uh, the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse <laughs> Storage Act sets out the process for the cancellation of a permit, uh, which oh, ensures a fair Minister, process. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wish will my, my question wasn't about the process, President. It was about whether the Prime Minister will now make an intervention on behalf of other communities around this Senator country Wish that don't want oil Sen and gas drilling Senator, off their coastlines. Senator Wish Wilson, there's no point of order. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Um, well, I, I do know that, of course, nothing would uh, would give Senator Wish Wilson uh, more delight than to cancel projects right across the country. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's sort jobs. of the Greens, the Greens, the Greens, the Greens cancel culture. It goes in a range of different directions, and uh, cancel projects is, of course, uh, you know, right at the top of their favourite list. And from cancel projects, they like cancel jobs, as Senator cancel Cash jobs, says. Cancel that uh, uh, cancel business, cancel outcomes for Australia, cancel growth. Cancel projects, cancel jobs. Uh, it's very much uh, the Greens' way. Uh, but the point I was making, Mr. President, uh, was that there is a process arrangement put in place in relation to how PEP 11 was considered. Uh, those processes were followed, uh, and that's how the decision was arrived at. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. On the process, President. Um, following the PM's announcement, Asset Energy announced that the regulated NOPTA had formally advised him that PEP 11 permit would not be renewed and that Asset Energy had sought a review of this decision. There is no publicly available information on whether this process has been completed and a final decision made. So will your government recommit in the Senate today to the communities who fought for this decision that this project is now formally dead in the water? Minister. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and, and, and thank you, uh, thank you, Senator uh, Abetz. Indeed, I think um, um, uh, it, uh, you were uh, very, uh, very droll, Senator Abetz. But, um, uh, Mr. President, uh, in terms of the appeal processes that may be available to Asset Energy, uh, I uh, will have to take those on notice unless I can. Uh, uh, ascertain the particularities of the status of that. Uh, I do note that uh, um, estimates are next week, and so I'm sure, in terms of the status of any such appeals, uh, that, uh, that authorities uh, appearing before estimates can probably address those questions. Uh, but, uh, but of course, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister 
uh, relevant uh, local MPs and others uh, listened very carefully to communities as well uh, and sought to make sure that all concerns were reflected uh, as part of the proper decision-making process. Senator Wish Wilson, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, the minister may be aware that the International Energy Agency stated last year that in order to meet our Paris commitments of 1.5 degrees warming, uh, we needed to leave all new fossil fuels in the ground and stop all new oil and gas exploration. Yet, following that report and statement, your government issued 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean exploration permits to your oil and gas donors. Are you insane? Were you willfully ignorant? Or simply totally corrupted and or captured by Senator the fossil Wish fuel Wilson. industry. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Sazelja on a point of order. I don't think it's parliamentary to use uh, those kind of labels uh, and language in a question. It's not an opportunity for a rant uh, from Senator Wish Wilson, uh, and it is unparliamentary to be applying those sort of labels uh, in, a, in a question. I, I, Senator. On the point of order, Senator Wish Wilson. On the point of order, Chair, I asked a question on whether the minister's government was insane, and I don't think that's out of order. I think that's what most Australians Senator feel. Wilson. In fact, that's Senator what most Wish of the Wilson. world feels when they Senator look at what Wish you're Wilson, doing to this planet. Your seat. I will allow the minister to deal with the question. Um, I, I believe that, in referring to it generally towards a political party it is not out of order however the minister can choose to answer the question um, as he sees fits minister thanks sir. thanks mr president well mr president on the question of insanity i just wish i had brought a mirror into the chamber that i could hold up to the australian greens that i could show to the australian greens that if you're looking uh, for insanity the policy platform of the Australian Greens offers a perfect model of insanity, economic insanity, job-destroying insanity, the type of insanity that those opposite uh, would see, of course, Australia close down industries, close down industries, prematurely lose jobs in different sectors and industries, whilst other nations would simply grow and fill that gap in different ways. Mr. President, the way we are pursuing net zero and helping the world to get closer to addressing climate change is about making sure we get the technology developed in affordable ways so that other countries have affordable energy solutions. And we want Australia to be at the forefront of those affordable energy solutions, but we're not going to shut down the industries we have now while we're still in the process of supporting hydrogen and other Minister, sectors to grow Minister, and develop. That would be Minister, insanity. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Last week, a 79-year-old woman who had waited three and a half hours for her pain medication to be provided at the Jeddah Gardens nursing home ended up throwing herself off a third-floor balcony. She broke her leg and multiple other bones. The incident report lists neglect as a contributing factor. Only a registered nurse can deliver pain drugs, and on that day there was only one nurse rostered for more than 160 residents. Minister, all week I've been asking you about the Jetta Gardens nursing home, about which you were warned twice by your own regulator. Why are older Australians in residential aged care still being neglected by this minister in his aged care system? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, and I am aware of reports of the um, serious incident that occurred at Jetta Gardens, Mr. President. Like, unlike um, Senator Watt, while the circumstances of the uh, serious incident are being uh, in, investigated by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, to whom they were appropriately reported. Uh, I'm not going to make judgments like Senator Watt, who's already tweeted that he thinks he knows exactly what happened and why, Mr. President. Order. Uh, well, uh, Order. Senator, Senator, Senator that's, that's, a com that's a complete Senator absurdity Watt. because, Senator because Watt. all. And I'll take the interjection, Mr. President. I'll take the injection. The, the, the serious incident response scheme. Uh, introduced by this government, Mr. President, introduced by this government, uh, has been designed specifically to investigate properly serious incidents and then report them. 
and report them publicly. So, Mr. President, I reject any assertion Order. from the opposition at all that we're seeking to, uh, uh, to cover this up. We have a process, a legislative process in place that this government put in place to investigate those incidents appropriately and then report them and report them publicly, Mr. President. That's what we'll do. I'm not going to presume here in this place before the investigation has been completed and Order. then appropriately reported as to the cause of it uh, in the way that Senator Watt has, Mr. President. And I think it's an absolute disgrace that he comes in here to make those sorts of assertions Order. without the appropriate without the appropriate process to investigate what's going on, Order. Mr President. I am as concerned as Senator Watt is about the event that Senator occurred Watt. at Jetta Gardens. I am as concerned as anybody. We all are, Mr President. Senator Those sorts Watt. of circumstances don't, should not be occurring in our aged care facilities. That's why we have over $18 billion in a five-year reform package on the table when the Labor Party has absolutely nothing. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. While this minister went to the cricket, Jetta Gardens resident Ruth was in lockdown and hadn't seen her family since December. They did not know she had COVID until she was on her deathbed and were robbed of the opportunity to spend time with her in her final days. How many neglected older Australians and their families have been robbed of their final days and moments under this minister's care? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would point out that all residents of residential aged care in Australia are under the care of the provider, the approved provider, uh, that, uh, that where, where they are living. And of course, Mr. President, uh, as I've acknowledged here before, the Australian government is responsible for the uh, approving of approved providers, and therefore, and and also, Mr. President, the regulation. Uh, and, and predominantly Order. the funding of residential aged care providers, Mr. President. Senator can Watt. I say, Mr. President, though, can I say that, in my view, in the government's view, it's been its view all through the pandemic, access to residents for visitors has something that's, is something that's been very important. It was raised by the Royal Commission in their special COVID-19 report. Uh, it was something that AHPPC put some advice out to the sector about, uh, and, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, the sector has come around to the same point of view. But, uh, of course, it's the actions of the opposition that is making Minister, harder for people to let people Minister, into residential aged care Your facilities. time has expired. Senator Watt, a sup second supplementary question. The idea that this minister could blame the opposition for his problems is beyond belief. But anyway, Virginia's 85-year-old father with dementia, a Jetta Gardens resident, has COVID-19 and is locked in his room. He is disorientated and thinks he has been abandoned. The aged care home isn't communicating with his family, an aged care home this minister was warned about. How bad does the neglect of older Australians need to be before this minister resigns? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the aged care facility should be communicating with his family. That's what my expectation is. And that's the expectation uh, of, of the government, Mr. President. So the aged care facility has a responsibility to communicate with Mr President uh, and, and the regulator has taken regulatory action against the facility uh, and part of that process is the requirement for them to employ uh, a, a special supervisor into the facility to ensure that the functions of the facility are occurring as they should be. That's been done. In fact, there's a team of people that are working in that facility to do that, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, as has been discussed in the chamber, there, is a, there are a series of regulatory actions that have been taken against this facility over the last 12 months. Uh, and, Mr President, my expectation, the government's expectation, is that the provider brings the facility back to compliance. That is, the, that is what the provider should do. That is what the provider should do, Mr. President. Senator and if they Watt, can't, Mr. President, Senator Pratt, the, the opportunity to remove Minister, their approved provider status Minister, actually exists. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Can the minister please update the Senate on how Australia is supporting Tonga following the recent volcanic eruption and tsunami? The Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Sazelja. 
uh, well, thank you, and I thank Senator Fawcett for his question and for his interest uh, in the Pacific and in humanitarian relief. Uh, on the evening of Saturday, 15 January, I received a call I dread, of course, as Minister for the Pacific, news that one of our Pacific family had just suffered a devastating natural disaster. And the explosive eruption of underwater volcano uh, Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai and subsequent tsunami was declared an unprecedented disaster by Tonga's Prime Minister in the days following. At the request of the Tongan government, Australia and New Zealand coordinated closely on initial surveillance flights to provide Tonga to assess what was needed. Australian donated patrol boats and landing craft undamaged from the tsunami also went to survey the damage and evacuate people. Once the need was clear, we jumped into action. Uh, we had pre-positioned uh, supplies with the Red Cross in Tonga, which were delivered uh, immediately. Uh, we've delivered 190 tonnes of humanitarian support to date, uh, with more to come. 13 RAAF humanitarian assistance flights have landed carrying essential supplies and equipment, including food, water and shelter for families who lost their homes, medical supplies to support those who are injured, uh, and communications equipment so that friends and family in Australia and elsewhere could contact their loved ones. HMAS Adelaide arrived in Tonga on 26 January, carrying additional supplies, including equipment, to help with the clean-up and rebuilding efforts. All deliveries have been done in the COVID-safe way, in close cooperation with the Tongan government and our partners in the region. I acknowledge one of our partners in the region here, in my good friend uh, Jelta Wong, who is with us in the gallery. Now, this support will continue for as long as it's needed. That's our commitment to our Pacific family, and they know this. They can see it in our actions. The, this government spent a record $1.76 billion in the Pacific in 2020-21. We don't just talk about support, we deliver, because that's the right thing to do for our neighbours and our family. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, how does Australia's response to disasters help to maintain security and stability in our region? Minister. Uh, well, thank you. Um, our assistance to support Tonga is consistent with what we do for our good friends across the Pacific and is not limited to a single mission. Rather, it is our enduring presence and our high-quality development, policing and defence cooperation programs that has built trust over decades. Now, under the coalition, defence, stability and national security are a priority. Those opposite, unfortunately, take a different view. While under this government, our investment Order. in the region and in defence is at record highs, the Labor Party gutted the defence budget by $18 billion, the lowest level as a proportion of GDP since 1938. While we on this side take a strong stand with our partners in the region and indeed across the world, Senator Wong won't condemn the former Labor Prime Minister Keating for his appeasement on China. Now that's the contrast Order. we have in this place, Order. and we don't shy away from prioritising. You know, you might not like hearing it, but that's Senator what you're going to do. That's your record: cutting defence, cutting defence in the past, Senator and you do it again. Senator Watt. Order. 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 Senator Watt. Those on my right, interjections are always disorderly. Senator Fawcett, a second supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate how security and stability in the Pacific region will be maintained in the future? Minister. Well, yes, I can. Uh, thank you. And, and the, co the coalition hold national security as our highest priority, and we've demonstrated that in the Pacific in a complex geostrategic environment that we will go out and support our partners in very practical ways. And as I said earlier, in contrast, uh, the Labor Party has a very different view. And the Leader of the Opposition, of course, has never held a national security role. He's never held a financial role. He's never delivered a budget. He voted to unwind our strong borders under the Rudd-Gillard government, and he has flip-flopped on everything. And now, of course, he has the Greens in his ear holding him to ransom, demanding that he cut the defence budget in half, costing jobs Order. and harming our national security. And Australians are right. They are right to ask if they can trust those opposite with the security and the stability of our region. Now, Senator Watt might not like us highlighting these things, but these are serious questions for Australia and they are serious questions for the stability of our region. If you've got a government that doesn't Minister, care about these things, Minister, all of these Minister, things will be undermined. Minister, your time has expired. 
Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. In an article entitled Yelling Out for Help, the Atrocious Conditions Inside Australia's Aged Care Homes, aged care worker Jess said, and I quote, one of the worst situations I saw was a lady with quite severe dementia and she was sitting in her own poo and urine, which had also gone all over the floor. It was an infection risk and a slip risk, and I was just thinking this is a expletive nightmare. What does the minister have to say to Jess? Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Firstly, I say to Jess, thank you for the work that you do in residential aged care in this country. It's really important, uh, Mr. President. I, don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think I can count the number of times I've expressed my gratitude and thanks to the aged care workforce and appreciation for the work that they do, Mr. President. Mr. President, well, Order. Senator, on, on four occasions now we've provided workforce. Uh, we've, we've provided bonus payments. We've provided bonus, bonus payments on four occasions now to senior Australians, and, and the Labor Party chatter on about uh, a pay rise for aged care workers, uh, but they don't acknowledge that they won't put a number on it themselves. They expect that the Australian government will do it, but, but, it, but in opposition. In opposition, Mr. President, they're not prepared to say or do anything. They say that it's a job for the Independent Order. Fair Work Commission that they legislated, Mr. President. So there's a hit. There, there is so much hypocrisy on that side of the, the chamber, Mr. President, in relation to this. But, Mr. President, uh, I, I thank Jess for the work that she does. I really do, uh, and I know that it's a. I know that it's a tough job, uh, and I appreciate Order. the work that she continues to do, Mr. President. We will continue to work uh, with the sector. Uh, with Fair Work Australia as the case progresses in relation to workforce wages, provide the information that Fair Work Australia seeks uh, and support them in that process. Senator Grogan, a supplementary question. Aged care resident Rose, who was unable to go outside for fresh air while her home was in lockdown, has said, and I quote, I think the aged care minister, Richard Colbeck, is an absolute disgrace. I mean, going to the cricket, what are his priorities and does he know what's going on? What does the minister have to say to Rose? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank, you, thank you, Rose, for your opinion. I tend to disagree. I tend to disagree. But, Mr. President, of course, this is, this is the nasty personal politics that the Labor Party want to play. Uh, they're, not interested, they're not interested in actually fixing aged care. How do we know that, Mr President? Because they have no policy, Mr President. Not a single response to the Royal Commission almost a year. Almost a year. Tell Rose that, Senator Grogan. Tell Rose that almost a year after the Royal Commission has reported you don't have a response. This government has $18.3 billion on the table in response to the Royal Commission. You have nothing, not a thing, since the, not, not a dollar for aged care, not Order. a mention of aged care or funding for aged works. care in any budget Order response during the term of this government, right. Mr. President. Not a single dollar for aged care, and Mr. President. A year, a year after the Royal Commission, no response, not a dollar, and this government Minister. has a full response, Minister. fully funded Minister. on the table. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, a second supplementary. When will this minister, who evidently doesn't wish to take any responsibility whatsoever, accept that older Australians in residential aged care are being neglected and would be safer without him as the minister? Minister. Well, Mr. President, as I've just indicated, Residents in residential aged care are safer with a coalition government than they are with a Labor government, because the Labor government has no policy, has had no oh, policy no. for years. At the 2019 election, not a dollar for home care, not a, do not a dollar oh, for residential no. age, mainstream residential aged care, not a dollar for workforce, Mr President. So they come in here with no policy over a full term of parliament, no response to the oh, Royal Commission, no, no response Senator almost Watt. a year after the Royal Senator Commission Keneally. has reported. We have a full response to every single recommendation of the Royal Commission. $18.3 billion on the table, and what has Labor got? Zip. Nothing. What a disgrace, Mr. President. They come in here to play politics. 
We come in here to fix the problems of aged care. We called the Royal Commission because we knew what the issues were, and now we've responded Senator to the Royal McCallum, Commission. Senator Labor Keneally. has done nothing. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, further, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for is today. Is leave granted? Yes. There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the back. Senate. I move the motion as circulated. Question is the Senator McKim. Apologies. Uh, thank you, President. Could I please ask that the question on uh, part three one? of this motion be put separately to the rest of the motion. That is in regards to, um, in part C, the Corporations Amendment Meetings and Documents Bill 2021. Uh, and I'll just indicate that we intend to vote differently on that to all of the other bills. Okay. So we'll deal with the motion without C1. So we'll deal with everything else. Everyone clear? Then we'll put C1. Okay? Senator McKim, you're comfortable with that approach? We are, but I think Senator Griff. Oh, I'm just thinking that. Senator Griff may be seeking the call. I'm just checking. Senator Griff. Uh, yes, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to move that the uh, mitochondrial donation law reform bill 2021 be added to the list of items to be considered from 4:30 p.m. at paragraph C of the motion. So Senator Griff is seeking to amend the motion. We will deal with that first. Then we will deal with the motion either as it stands or as amended. And then we will deal with the inclusion of section C1. Everyone comfortable with that? Sorry, Senator Gallagher, are you uh, seeking the call? Yes, please, Mr President. I just want to, um, on Senator Griff's amendment, just to explain that we will not be supporting that. Uh, Maeve's law is subject to a conscience vote um, across the Labor Party, and in line with that decision, we do not support guillotines or time management motions on that um, legislation that's subject to conscience votes. All right. So, if everyone, Senator Birmingham. And, uh, Mr. President, just for clarity, uh, uh, the government uh, echoes um, the position just put by Senator Gallagher that, uh, much as I would like to see debate on Maeve's law concluded and, uh, and have tried to facilitate through this motion additional time, we won't be applying the guillotine uh, to its consideration. All right. So we'll start with Senator Griff's amendment to the motion. Those in favour of Senator Griff's amendment say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. I, I only heard one voice. I'll put the question again. Those in favour of the amendment say aye. Those against say no. I did not hear a voice for ayes. The noes have it. The noes have it. So I will now put the rest of the amendment, not including subsection C1, then we'll vote on C1 last. So I'll put the motion without subsection C1. Those in favour of that uh, motion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now we will vote on the inclusion of C1. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Everything? Stop the bells. Question is regarding the inclusion of item C1. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose. There being 41 ayes, 9 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. We will now. Senator Colbeck, are you seeking the call? I am, President. Thank you, President. I just uh, tabled data that was sought by Senator Shelton in his question today. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. We will now move briefly to taking note. Are there any motions to take note? Of answers, I'll give. I I'll, don't need to run, Senator Pratt. I'll give you some time. I'll uh, allow the deputy president to step in. That can go. Yep. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note. Actually, I know you don't like to be called Madam, so I'll just call you Deputy President. Um, I take note of answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Sheldon, Walsh, Walsh Watt uh, and Grogan. As we have seen in question time after question time, our minister, National Minister for Aged Care and Seniors, Senator Colbeck, refuses to take 
any responsibility for the dire plight of senior Australians trapped in aged care in appalling circumstances. Incident after incident, it is leaving my home state of WA incredibly scared of what it might mean for our state when and if COVID uh, actually arrives in the state. We have seen from this minister such abject unaccountability, it beggars belief. We saw the minister in question time today simply point the finger back at the dysfunctional companies that are failing to uphold standards. He is responsible for the regulator. The government is responsible for aged care. And he simply pointed the finger back at the Jetta Aged Care Home. He says, well, it's their responsibility to improve their standards. Well, sure it is, but look how dysfunctional it is. Look at the abject lack of care. We have senior Australians in pain with injuries, jumping out of windows and breaking their legs because there is only one nurse there to administer pain medication. Is it little wonder that this poor woman was left for three and a half hours? Is it any wonder that she threw herself uh, off a third floor balcony and broke her bones in multiple places? And the incident report demonstrates that neglect is a contributing factor. This is the minister that has refused to allow aged care workers and pensioners keep up with the cost of living, refusing to acknowledge the impact of the high rate of CPI here in Australia, the high rate of that consumer price index inflation and the impact that it has on pensioners and, indeed, aged care workers who in some cases uh, might earn say as little as $1400 a week it is utterly appalling we have here uh, un in this government a, a government that refuses to take responsibility for the plight of people in aged care at Jetta Gardens, which was talked about in question time today, one resident has been not locked in their room, 85 years old with dementia. He's disorientated and legitimately he thinks he has been abandoned and the aged care home has not been communicating with his family. Jetta Gardens uh, resident Ruth hadn't seen her family since December. Her family didn't know she had COVID until she was on her deathbed. And they were robbed of the opportunity to spend time with her in her final days. I cannot begin to imagine what is going on on the front line and how upset not only families, residents, but also how upset staff are who are doing this work in our aged care facility homes right around Australia and doing it with inadequate wages, absolutely inadequate wages, inadequate wages that, according to the Aged Care Royal Commission, contribute to the lack of staff you, and the lack Pratt, of retention of staff. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. And uh, look, I, I thank Senator Pratt for raising this very important issue, um, the issue of, of aged care and our government's commitment to aged care. Senator Pratt said our government refuses to address the issues in aged care, which is patently wrong. It was our government that commissioned, uh, set up the Aged Care Royal Commission 
It's our government that accepted the report, the final report of the Royal Commission, which had 148 recommendations. Our government that has accepted or accepted in principle 142 of the 148 recommendations. Our government that as at January 2022, 135 of those recommendations are being addressed, either wholly or in part. We have already implemented measures within the aged care reform package in the 2021-22 budget context and subsequently through the MyEFO process. We have a five-year implementation planned, plan underpinned by five pillars. We are improving the home care packages, which supports our senior Australians who choose to remain in their home. And we know that so many of our senior Australians want that choice. They want to be able to stay at home, retain their dignity, be close to their friends and their family. We are improving and simplifying residential aged care services and access so that for those who have to go into a res residential aged care facility, it is easier to access. We're improving the quality and safety monitoring of aged care facilities, and we are supporting growing a better skilled workforce. We have measures in place, and we're improving. We've got new legislation for stronger governance principles through that process. We know that throughout COVID, our aged care workers have gone above and beyond their usual requirements. We know that the aged care workforce has been front and centre under the spotlight during this pandemic. And we know that the aged care facilities, the aged care environment is very vulnerable to the various waves of COVID. But that's why, instead of refusing to address it, as Senator Pratt has alleged, from the outset, we have put in place measures to help our aged care um, community respond to the challenges that COVID puts in front of us. We have, since August last year, we had rapid antigen tests at point of care being used within aged care facilities first as a trial, and then we rolled it out more broadly. And that underpinned the process to then move to rapid antigen tests at home. From our national medical stockpile, we made sure that there were masks, gowns, gloves, goggles, face shields, hand sanitizer, and other PPE provided to the aged care sector facilities. Our Defence Force is providing strategic logical support to the aged care sector, and we, from the very outset, from the first case of COVID in an aged care facility, <coughs> we set up a surge workforce, which has to date facilitated more than 80,000 shifts filled by this surge workforce when our aged care staff have been uh, isolated due to COVID or being a close contact. 100 per cent of our aged care facilities across the country have received a booster clinic. More than 76 per cent of eligible aged care residents have now received their booster shot. So we have remained flexible and adaptive throughout COVID while still remaining focused on our commitment and our response to the Royal, Royal, Aged Care Royal Commission. This government is delivering once-in-a-generation change through our response to the Royal Commission, through $18.3 billion of support for aged care sector reform. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Davies. Senator McCarthy. Deputy President, I rise to take note of questions asked by Senator Sheldon, Walsh, Watt and Grogan to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. It's interesting listening to uh, the previous senator speak about the Royal Commission uh, that um, 
there seems to be always a lapse in memory that uh, the only reason the Royal Commission into Aged Care came about was because of the pressure that was applied onto this government time and time again by those of us on this side of the chamber. It was a Royal Commission that you did not wish to take part in or even to establish until there was political pressure to do the right thing. And that's the same in this context as well. We shouldn't be surprised that this minister cannot answer a basic question about the impact of the cost of living increases on senior Australians. This is, after all, a minister who'd rather be at the cricket than working on solving the crises in his portfolio, the crisis affecting our elders, our parents and grandparents. The Australian Bureau of Statistics published back on 2 February that aged pensioners are experiencing higher cost of living increases. More than a week ago, the ABS published its findings that annual increases in living costs range between 2.6 per cent for employee households and 3.4 per cent for aged pensioner households in the December quarter, and food makes up a high proportion of overall expenditure especially for our elders. And what we have consistently said in this chamber time and time again is take accountability, take responsibility. This minister has failed time and time again to do any of those things. People have died under his watch, hundreds of people. His inability to stand before this Senate and to face that accountability is reprehensible. He should resign. There are people in the Northern Territory who still, in our communities, do not have the rats that they should have. Our aged care centres do not have the resourcing that they should have in terms of staffing. Our elders across those regions need this parliament to do the right thing in protecting and caring for the vulnerable. You said you would from day one care for the vulnerable in our country, and you have failed, totally failed. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. The time for this debate has expired. I'll just put the motion as moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maids Law Bill 2021 in committee. The committee is considering the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maves Law Bill 2021 and the amendment moved by Senator Ciccone on sheet 1540. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Are you seeking the call, Senator Canavan? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Look, I think it might just be worthwhile just to repeat very briefly uh, what is this amendment is about. Uh, this amendment would seek to uh, require a minimum of 20 participants to go through the trial phase before proceeding to uh, the, uh, uh, the clinical stage uh, of mitochondrial donation. I want to repeat that this, nothing in this amendment would delay or prevent uh, Australian parents accessing mitochondrial services. Um, the bill would even amend it after this amendment would still uh, immediately allow the trial processes to occur, which include the uh, uh, through that trial process include the full suite of mitochondrial donation through to live birth processes so of course parents can go through that process. The intention of these amendments is to ensure uh, that there is sufficient data, a sufficient large number of data such that we can have information about the risks uh, of this revolutionary and novel technique uh, before proceeding to provide it in a wider clinical fashion where there will be much less oversight and involvement of researchers on a day-to-day -day basis as per the trial phase. It's a simple amendment. It provides uh, some protection uh, for us as legislators that there will be sufficient information before the minister would make regulations to go to the clinical phase, as was discussed last night. Uh, some senators here would have preferred if, if, uh, if, if, if we would have required uh, more uh, uh, legislation to come back to this place before we proceeded the clinical phase, that we did not delegate that power to the minister, but those amendments have um, not been proceeded with. And so this is, a, I think, a sensible uh, approach that would still allow the minister to delegate delegated power 
uh, to proceed to the clinical stage, but just simply after 20 participants go through the trial. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Ciccone on sheet 1540 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I believe the noes have it. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bell. So the question is that the amendment 
uh, number one on sheet 1540 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as seller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart to seller for the noes. Twenty-five ayes and thirty-six noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Canavan. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the, the amendments that, uh, that that myself and other colleagues have moved uh, through these the committee stage have pretty much all solely been focused on trying to improve the uh, accountability, monitoring, uh, oversight uh, of what are uh, revolutionary and novel technologies. Um, many of the amendments have been aimed at providing more oversight from this place uh, in this institution. Uh, I'm obviously disappointed that uh, we have chosen not to, uh, not to strengthen our arm uh, in providing more oversight, but instead leave it to, uh, to the, the effectively the scientific community to, to make these decisions. I, uh, uh, I am, am um, intending here to move another set of amendments which, while would not really provide uh, much oversight or monitoring, would at least provide some information uh, to us uh, on what uh, is occurring in these trials, uh, more information than what is prescribed currently in this bill. The bill, uh, as amended in the House, and I do give credit again, as I did in the second reading speech, to Mr Kevin Andrews, who, who he and others pushed for. Um, uh, for some more reporting, and I thank the government for uh, agreeing to those amendments and providing some additional reporting um, uh, than, than what was there originally. However, the, the reporting that is there now on a six-monthly basis uh, does not have to prescribe any particular information. Uh, uh, there's no guarantees that this will include um, details of, of how many uh, trials have occurred, how many participants have gone through those trials, how many have been approved, uh, whether or not the, but there have been adverse events associated uh, with the donation techniques, uh, or even indeed what types of donation techniques have been used, and we'll come to those later in other amendments. I don't think that's appropriate that <clears throat> for something as novel and revolutionary that it ultimately has led it's up to uh, the, the people that uh, owe are. Uh, Regulating, and I'll use that with the lower case R, regulating this area, not being a regulator exactly, but, but overseeing this area. It'll be up to them what information they provide us. Senator I don't Canavan, think that's... it may assist the Senate if you move the amendments. I'm guessing it's the ones on 1520. Um, uh, Madam Executive Chair, but I'm happy to move those at the end of my contribution. I'm, okay, um, thank uh, you. Um, I, will, I do intend to do that, but of course I, 
would like to explain the, the reasons for them, um, and, and I'm sure we'll have a, a, a discussion. Um, so, so uh, uh, where was I? Uh, um, so, Sorry. we we need to make sure here that the regulation does. Uh, the regulators do provide the information that we can assess what's going on. This is really important because we've seen from the UK experience there hasn't been a lot of information provided about what's going on. Uh, in the UK, they, they legalised mitochondrial donation techniques in 2015. Um, we have extremely limited information from the UK uh, about the outcomes of uh, uh, the donations that have occurred to date, or the people at least have been going through it. We don't even know if mitochondrial donation has occurred in any real sense. Uh, we know that I think 20, maybe 21 participants have been approved uh, to proceed through uh, the process, and there has been eight apparently that have actually received some services. But as I say, we're not sure the content of those or what has occurred or the outcomes. And to me and to my mind, that is completely inadequate that after almost seven, eight years now, we have not, not received information on the barest of details about what is occurring uh, in the UK. It's an issue here for us. It was an issue in the Senate inquiry uh, that I participated in that there wasn't a lot of detail about exactly how uh, these revolutionary techniques are being used in the one jurisdiction in the world where they are legalised. So what, what I and some other colleagues, as we thought through this, uh, we thought that we, we should actually try to specify as a parliament some at least minimum information that should be rep uh, in reports. We have decided annual reports are fine, and as I mentioned, the government had decided on six monthly reports. But given the slow pace of these technologies overseas, I, I don't. We didn't think six monthly reports are absolutely necessary. So an annual report would be fine. But we do think it should require some minimum information uh, that uh, that can provide people with an oversight of what is occurring and how these are being developed. Um, this, the the information outlined. Um, in an amendment, and I, I suppose I will move that now, Madam Deputy Chair. If I can move uh, amendments uh, one and two, if I can do that by leave on sheet one five two zero. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, the, the details of this amendment are not restrictive. They, more information can be provided than what is outlined here. But as I say, we're just seeking a bare minimum of information uh, that uh, that should be provided. So in that information, we would like to see the number of and kind of mitochondrial donation techniques, licences, sorry, um, that have been issued um, under Section 28J of the Act. We would like to see the reporting include the, the outcomes of the activities of each licence issued under that same section, and including in this information the number of births of children as a result of pregnancies achieved by mitochondrial, mitochondrial te donation techniques. And additionally, the number of any adverse events notified to the licensing committee under a specific paragraph in the bill. I mean, I, I, I don't see these amendments at all being controversial. It should not be controversial. It should be uh, a basic requirement for uh, uh, for uh, the, the reports to include this kind of information. And as I say, there seems to be a risk that we may not get this type of information given the experience of the United Kingdom over the past seven or eight years. So I'm sure we'll hear other speakers say, oh, we don't need this because other pe they will be provided anyway, but I'm a little bit concerned that on a trust us basis may not occur given what has happened in the UK. If I can make a broader point here too, that going back and harking back to the arguments we've been making, we have effectively established a system through rejecting other amendments of self-regulation for uh, gene um, uh, therapy research here in Australia, at least a precedent for that in this case of mitochondrial donation techniques. The only regulation oversight of these mitochondrial donation techniques will be done by the organisation who is commissioning uh, and, uh, and, and funding the research in uh, to this field. That is self-regulation. The people, the HMRC, great people, intelligent people, but they are directly involved in the research itself, and they are being asked under this bill to regulate themselves, uh, to be the only people actually overseeing what is occurring. And I've noticed, I wanted to just make this point at some time in this debate, because I've noticed as this debate has evolved in this place uh, over the past uh, day, that a number of speakers have seemingly suggested that scientists are somewhat an infallible species among us, that, that we don't need to question or oversee the work of science because they're very intelligent, they know what they're doing, uh, and, uh, and they can be trusted. Now, some of those things are true. No doubt scientists are extremely intelligent. 
No doubt uh, the, the successes of science are things we can learn great lessons from. No doubt the successes of science are things we've all benefited from in some way. But to suggest somehow there are no risks involved uh, with scientific research uh, blinds yourself to the history uh, of scientific development among the world. Indeed, the history that we are living through right today. today uh, um, we still don't exactly know where the coronavirus came from, but it is absolutely sure that the relationship standards and oversight of research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was definitely deficient. Definitely deficient. There were issues. And perhaps the coronavirus itself and this whole pandemic came from that lab and deficiencies associated with that lab. We had a situation where we only learnt really after the event that our own researchers at the CSIRO were cooperating with, indeed training, researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, on coronaviruses in bats. They were doing that. It's all come out since. They were doing that. They were regulating themselves, deciding this themselves. There wasn't any oversight of this problem because it's a bit complex, of course, and we didn't know about it. Ministers I've spoken to didn't know about it. And the CSIRO has ended up, we know now, from evidence in this place and other work by journalists like Shari Markson, that this, their own CSIRO, great organisation, really great people, but they trained Xi Jing Li, the, the so-called bat lady, uh, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They, they collected samples of coronaviruses in bats here in Australia and helped uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, scientists work out how to identify which coronaviruses would more, be more effective at infecting human cells. They provided human cells, stem cells, to the Wuhan Institute of Virology to do further work on coronaviruses in bats. That all happened here. That's before you get to what happened over in the United States with their scientific organisations, which seemingly had even a stronger and closer relationship with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, including funding people that did work there. Uh, and we've all seen the potential cover-up that has occurred since and the complete lack of oversight over those processes, which may have caused the death of millions of people around the world and untold economic damage uh, to almost every country. Uh, we, um, we, we, we do need some oversight of what is occurring here. This is a bare minimum, a bare minimum. It's just asking for some specific data. It is common sense. Uh, uh, it will not in any way, any way, stop or prevent mitochondrial donation techniques occurring, and I ask the Senate uh, to approve this amendment. Thank you, Senator Canavan, Minister. I'm happy enough to let Simon do. Encourage senators from supporting uh, this amendment. I discourage senators from supporting it because uh, because uh, the bill before us uh, already provides some very uh, clear reporting requirements. Section 19 of the Research Involving Human Embryos Act requires the Embryo Research Licensing Committee of the National Health and Medical Research Council to report to the Parliament about the operation of the Act and licence issued under it. Uh, the operation of those uh, every six months. Uh, and also when required by either House of Parliament. Uh, so it's been very clearly established that, uh, that there is to be a frequency uh, and indeed even an on-demand where required reporting arrangements put in place in that regard. Others have noted the role that the NHMRC uh, has in relation to accountability to the Parliament through estimates and other vehicles as well. Secondary reason as to why, uh, why I would discourage support for this uh, is, uh, is that as well as potentially being duplicative and confusing, uh, it also has the uh, and runs the risk um, of undermining some of the privacy considerations uh, that, uh, that are clear. Um, this amendment would uh, uh, remove um, the, uh, the provisions there that ensure that reports that are provided uh, do not identify any person uh, or are not capable reasonably of being used to identify any person. Uh, clearly those privacy considerations are important and, uh, and so uh, I would urge the Senate uh, to support the existing quite comprehensive reporting arrangements. Thank you, Minister. Senator Watt. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, for similar reasons to Senator Birmingham, I would also encourage senators to vote against this amendment. Uh, this amendment, uh, I accept on the surface, seeks to increase transparency, but the risk is that it does the very opposite. Under Australia's Privacy Act, any information provided about a cohort of less than 10 people, even if de-identified, does not achieve anonymity and therefore is not permitted. As a result, in the event that there are fewer than li 10 live births in any given year, instead of receiving more information, as is suggested by the amendment, no report would be able to be tabled at all. So again, I'd encourage uh, senators to vote against this amendment. So the question is that um, the, uh, we'll put them separately. That amendment one be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is that Amendment 1 on sheet 1520 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 27 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now intend to put the second part of that amendment on the voices. So the question is that item 55A of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required? Uh, do we, can we just ring the bells for one minute? I'm in the hands of the Senate. Yes, one minute. A of Schedule 1 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 34 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, uh, I, I wanted to, to move on to a slightly different topic in this bill, uh, uh, as I've mentioned earlier. I oh, beg your pardon, Senator Steele, John. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Just draw your attention to uh, Senator Rennick, who is not wearing a mask in line with the requirements of the chamber. Uh, I would advise all senators to please wear a mask if you intend to participate in the chamber. Um, Senator Canavan, please continue. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, as I was saying, uh, I want to move on to a slightly different topic. The previous amendments, as I said, were focused on uh, those around monitoring and reporting, oversight. Uh, are you helping us? Senator, Senator Thorpe, point of order. Deputy President, um, 
Somebody's who is it? Rennick, Senator Rennick is not wearing a mask. We have people with health issues in this place. So please, you ask everybody to respect the rules, including me. Why does a middle-aged white fella have to get away with it? I understand that there's been no motion of the Senate in relation to masks, although there's been a direction from the presiding officers. So all I can do is respectfully ask Senator Rennick to place a mask on. That's, the, that's the, the extent of the authority that I have. Senator McKim. Yeah, point of order. I um, did, by I the way, to... I did clarify that with the clerk, Senator McKim. I, I understand that you've clarified that with the clerks, but you have just informed the Senate that there is a direction yes. from the presiding officer, the president of the Senate. And I just um, would like to place firmly on the record that this is a workplace and that people are entitled to a safe workplace here. And part of a safe workplace is for people who may have health issues, which would lead to extremely um, serious consequences for them if they were to contract coronavirus. I think that it should be enforced that uh, senators in this place, unless they are on their feet speaking, should wear a mask. And it's just common courtesy apart from anything else, but it is also essential to provide a safe workplace for other senators. I just consulted with the clerk. Again, I don't have authority to issue a, direct, a direction from the chair to Senator Rennick. It's a matter, it's a matter for him. But I, enc I encourage senators to raise it with the president. Uh, I will take on board your um, matters of concern and raise them directly with the president at the first available opportunity. Senator, can I, can I, I'm going to give the call to Senator, Senator Canavan. Were you seeking the call? Okay. Uh, I have the call? You have the call. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, look, as I was saying, I, I wanted to, to move discussion onto a slightly different topic. Uh, uh, the other amendments we have moved to this date relate to oversight, monitoring, etc. Um, might just pause. Uh, yeah, Senator Keneally. Yes, I would just seek your guidance as to some of the audible conversation in the chamber. It's very difficult to hear Senator Canavan. Yeah. Is this a point of order, um, Senator Roberts? Uh, I support Senator Keneally because uh, people are being rude to Senator Rennick. There is no evidence for these things, and I'm only doing it as a courtesy to. Cur can I can I ask to... can I ask honourable honourable no. senators to understand that this is not a debate. We're debating a particular bill. I appreciate various views. There are no standing orders that are available, and I will refer it to the president. Senator Keneally. I'm not concerned about the rudeness or otherwise of the conversation, just the volume level. Yes, I appreciate Thank that, but we moved on from the volume, Senator Keneally. Can I give the call to Senator Canavan? Uh, look, thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I will try again. Um, look, uh, these are... Uh, uh, the, the amendments previously related to, to regulation oversight, uh, uh, accountability. Um, uh, I wanted to move the discussion on to a, to a different part of the bill, though, and those are the techniques of mitochondrial donation that are permitted by this bill. Uh, uh, I, I do need to just set up a little bit for my arguments a brief explanation of those uh, techniques. There are five that are outlined um, in this bill. And uh, uh, broadly speaking, as is clear in the explanatory memorandum, those five techniques can be uh, divided into two different types. Two different types. Um, one type of methods 
um, including the, the pro-nuclear transfer method and the second polar body transfer method, uh, relate to making the mitochondrial donation after the fertilisation of two different eggs. Uh, so in that situation, uh, two eggs are provided, one from the expectant mother, one from the donor mother, uh, um, uh, sperm, of course, from the father, and those two eggs are fertilised. Uh, and once that fertilisation occurs, a, a zygote, or personally I would refer to it as an embryo, but uh, the bill refers to it as a zygote, uh, is formed, and uh, 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 mitochondrial, mitochondria are uh, transferred between the two fertilised egg at that stage. Following that process, uh, one of those eggs, um, uh, sorry, one of those zygotes, I should say, uh, or embryos, is discarded uh, before the other uh, embryo is implanted through uh, normal IVF techniques, uh, hopefully for a live birth. That's one type of those techniques, the, the second polar body transfer and the pro-nuclear transfer. The other, the other set of techniques, um, most commonly the maternal spindle transfer method, uh, 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 make the mitochondrial donation before the fertilisation of, of the egg. So two eggs, the same way, two eggs are harvested uh, from the expectant mother and the donor mother. Uh, the mitochondrial donation, the mitochondrial transfer occurs at that stage, uh, and uh, uh, one of those eggs then uh, is discarded. The other egg proceeds to be fertilised creation of a zygote, implantation through IVF and a live birth hopefully ensues. Uh, some of us, as was outlined in the second reading speech, um, uh, view these different, two different types of techniques as having quite different ethical implications. In the former techniques, the most commonly pro-nuclear transfer technique, uh, uh, the, the, there is the creation of uh, 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 an embryo or a zygote for the, for the only purpose, the only purpose to be used as an instrument to help another, another life, another embryo, and it is then destroyed. Uh, it has no, that, that, that particular uh, life, I would call it, but um, if others want to call it a zygote, that particular zygote has no potential, no plan, uh, no possibility of becoming a life in and of itself. It is only created uh, for the purposes of, uh, of, of trying to improve, in this case, um, uh, the life of another. Uh, some of us uh, have ethical issues with the potential of using one life as an instrumental tool to help save other lives. Of course, this occurs at a very early stage of life, but uh, uh, as was outlined in the second reading speech, there's no scientific distinction between the conception uh, or creation of a zygote uh, and other stages of life. There's no discontinuity which has been identified by sciences. At that point this is something and at the other point this is something else. All the chromosomes, all the potential for life are there at conception. Once conception occurs it is a viable life, potentially a viable life under the appropriate um, nurturing conditions. So uh, uh, we, some and my colleagues in discussing these issues uh, think it would be better at the trial stage to start with the techniques that have less ethical implications, uh, uh, less concerns for many Australians around the techniques. So um, in, a minute, in a second I will move amendments on sheet 1518, which seek to simply remove those two techniques, the, uh, the uh, pro-nuclear transfer technique and the second polar body transfer technique, which would in, in, in necessity involve the destruction, in my view, of a life. Uh, I know uh, in discussions I've had with others around these issues that there is a view that, this, that removing those types would limit and possibly obstruct the development of mitochondrial um, donation techniques. However, I do not think that accords with the evidence. Some have even put that really it's pro-nuclear tra tra transfer, it's the, 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 the embryonic transfer of mitochondria that have been more successful or shown more success and therefore we must keep them in the bill. because. Uh, there are only limited po possibilities of the egg transfer method, the maternal spindle transfer method, being successful. I don't think that accords with the evidence at all. I don't think that accords with the evidence. A lot of, a lot of times, actually, and I think unfortunately, this debate, um, when the government and others have put forward their, their support of this bill, it's very much been through assertion. It's been an assertion of certain facts, like the one I just provided, that somehow maternal spindle transfer is a failed technique or uncertain and may not work. 
Well, in fact, uh, a report released very recently in a medical journal called Annual Reviews, um, uh, titled "The Regulation of Mitochondrial Replacement Techniques Around the World," it looked at all the different techniques around the world, including pronuclear transfer, maternal transfer, spindle transfer, and the regulations of the environment around the world. As has been discussed, only the UK specifically legalises um, uh, mitochondrial donation techniques. But they actually identified that there had been three births around the world using mitochondrial techniques. Uh, sorry, using, uh, using uh, these techniques outlined in this bill, not always for mitochondrial donation. So um, there have been apparently births, live births, according to these scientists, uh, in Mexico, in in Greece and in the Ukraine uh, in the past four or five years. Two of those three births, those three live births, involved the Sorry. use of maternal spindle transfer techniques. They involved the use of the technique involving the transfer of uh, uh, um, genetic material at the egg stage. Only one of the three used the pronuclear transfer technique. Um, which the government and proponents of this bill are saying must be included because it's the only way we can do it, or the most, most, most prospective way we can do it. Well, that's not the evidence around the world. Now, I should say, in those three, for full, full information, those three live births, only one of them was for mitochondrial donation. Um, that was the birth in, in Mexico. In, in the birth in a case in Greece, which was done with Spanish scientists, and in the Ukraine, in those two cases, the Genetic transfer techniques were actually to overcome inf infertility issues uh, in the mother, but the same techniques were used to transfer genetic material to, to correct for infertil infertility de de defects. The one, the one that actually did, the only one, and we've heard others have referred to this in the debate, the only live birth that actually occurred uh, for, to, to overcome mitochondrial disease occurred in Mexico. And that was using a technique that involved the transfer of material between eggs, not embryos. That one, the, that one was maternal. According to this article, it was maternal spindle transfer. It was the one, it was the technique that, these, that the amendments I'll move would leave in this bill and leave possible for research and trials to start with. It seems to me that given the revolutionary and novel um, uh, techniques we are including or, or legalising here, that we should start with those techniques that have been the most prospective, raise the least ethical issues. And, and see how that goes first. Uh, the government could always, or others could always, come back and seek to legalise the other techniques if, if, if maternal spindle transfer, um, if the egg transfer technique um, does not uh, prove viable. Uh, again, uh, while these amendments are ones that go a little bit further than what we, uh, many other senators, have proposed uh, previously, they do not in any way stop the progression of the development of mitochondrial techniques. It just seeks to uh, prioritise the development of those techniques into those that have pr been proven so far to be the most successful, or at least the ones that have been most used, uh, and, and are those that clearly have less ethical issues wherever you fall on this balance. There are less eth eth ethical questions with the transfer of mitochondria at the egg stage compared to the embryonic stage. Senator, oh, sorry, Senator Keneally had asked for the call, and then I'll give you the call, Senator Still John. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise in support of Senator Canavan's amendment, and I will not uh, repeat uh, the arguments he has put about the differences between pronuclear transfer and second polar body transfer, but simply to make the observation uh, that one in one process, pronuclear, pronuclear transfer, involves the creation of two distinct human embryos one of which will be destroyed. And the other process, which is a second polar body transfer, does not. It does not require the creation of two distinct human embryos, one of which will be destroyed. What I would like to do with the contribution uh, here is to address really this very moral and ethical question, and a scientific one, about what value we should attach to a human embryo. And in saying this, I reflect that in, the human embryo has moved out of the womb and into the petri dish, and this is not something I am opposed to. Techniques like IVF have assisted families to have children.
but it has raised some significant moral and scientific and legal questions. Uh, 30 years ago, when an embryo could only reside in a uterus, stockpiling them in laboratories was inconceivable. Harvesting bits and pieces from them was unbelievable. Buying and selling them, unimaginable. Where we are today is in truly a brave new world, and it does require us as parliamentarians and has required us uh, to think carefully about these things. This parliament in 2002 and again in 2006 and state parliaments have considered these issues and they continue to do so. I do want to address this issue though of why I think it matters that a human embryo does deserve our consideration and our legal protection. And in doing so, I recognize I'm going to get into some slightly vexed ethical and moral issues. So please bear with me, but I think it's important that, I, that we, we test, tease these out. Because I think it's important that we understand that every single human e e embryo has a new genetic code. It is a code that has never been seen before and will never be seen again. It is a distinct human being. Now, I don't think a human embryo is a human person that attracts all the legal rights of personhood. But nor do I think it is just a collection of cells like those cells we might find in our skin or our hair. It is something different. And so I do think it deserves respect. I do think it deserves some legal protection. And I certainly do think we should think very carefully about normalizing the situation where human life can be viewed as it through a utilitarian lens. That is that we can create a distinctly new human life for the purpose of harvesting parts from it and destroying it. I think we need to think about this carefully. And I note that, and I'm not being partisan, I'm just simply drawing on a quote from the Prime Minister John Howard when uh, in a previous debate he said, I have been personally unable to find a huge moral distinction between allowing the human embryo to, to succumb as a result of exposure to room temperature, as sometimes happens in IVF, or ending it through research. And I've heard other people make that point, and I think it's a legitimate point to make. Here's why I think there is a difference. The intention of creating the embryo does matter. When you create embryos in IVF, you create them for the purpose of trying to bring a new life into existence. And just as when, a, when you conceive naturally, not all of those embryos survive to birth. And it is the case that, allowing an em that creating embryos for the purpose of IVF is to bring a new life into existence. And some of them, yes, may well not survive. They may never get used, that is true. That is true, Senator Pratt. They may never get used. But that doesn't make it right for those embryos that are surplus or to create new embryos simply to harvest something from them and destroy them. It is a utilitarian view of human life. And you know, I say to the chamber, imagine if we applied that approach in other circumstances. What if we were able to cure Parkinson's by harvesting brain cells from comatose people or severely disabled people? People who we might say their life isn't viable or their life isn't productive. We would react in horror to that. I would hope we would. I would hope we would. So we don't do that. For many Australians, and I am one of them, a new human embryo, the idea of creating it simply to harvest something from it and then destroy it, is a step down a slippery slope I don't want to take. And there are many Australians who share that point of view. And that's why we have conscience votes, like we are having now. Now, I have made this speech, or versions of it, in previous parliaments, when previous bills have been, when similar bills have been debated that go to the use of a human embryos. And what I often find is after that I get accused of being anti abortion. So I'm going to take a moment or two and speak to this. Let me be clear human life is not simple or straightforward. And as I said earlier, 
I don't think a human embryo at its embryonic stage is a full human person deserving of all the legal rights that a person has. But nor do I think it is nothing. I can't align myself 100% with the pro-choice movement for those people who think a, there is no consideration we should give, and I can't align myself 100% with the pro-life movement either, who thinks that we cannot ever allow for an abortion to happen. I take the line, the approach that former U.S. President Bill Clinton took, that abortion should be safe and legal and rare. I take the view that in an ideal world, conception, contraception would be more readily available through the Medicare system, that it would be more readily available uh, to young women and young men, uh, and that the use of abortion in terms of contraception would be reduced. That is my personal view, and it's what I would support in a policy sense. And I want to put that on the record, lest some people seek to take my remarks here tonight about human embryos and twist them and use them in another context. This is a deeply important issue we are considering here. And I am actually hopeful, and I'm encouraged by the number of senators who have expressed concerns about this bill, because I do think we are rushing into a brave new world here. Not only are we asking this parliament to legalize a technique that changes, that alters the makeup of human beings at its most significant level, its DNA level. We are also, unless we support this amendment, legalizing and giving a tick to the creation of a new, distinct human life that has never been seen before and will never be seen again solely for the purpose of harvesting something from it and destroying it. And, we, and to those people who say it is just a bunch of cells, I ask you to reflect on that very fact, that we are introducing a utilitarian approach to human life. We are saying unless a life is viable, it is not one that it deserves our respect and support. And I don't make those comments lightly, but this is a deeply personal held conviction that I bring to this debate, and I ask people to consider it. In terms, in terms of the actual amendment, I might, if I may say, Senator Canavan's observation that this does not stop the progress for those people who want to see mitochondrial donation progress. This does not mitochondrial donation progress. This does not stop it. It merely removes an ethically problematic morally problematic process from the legislation. And in that sense, I think it improves the legislation. In that sense, I think the parliament would be wise, given the novel, indeed revolutionary, process that we are being asked to legalize, that we take the most, we provide a conservative approach, a conservative approach, not in the left-right way term of conservative, but rather the most risk-adverse approach uh, if we were to legalize this. And so I will be supporting Senator Canavan's amendment. Senator Still John. No. Do I wish to call? No. No. Senator Canavan. The uh, clerk's table would just like to know whether you've actually moved this amendment. Uh, I, I believe. Thank you. Um, Perhaps uh, you could move it again, to President. But I, I believe I did. But if I have not, I'll. I'll um, I think leave was sought. I thought. Or well, maybe it was the previous one. I'm just getting my place here. Um, so yes, I'd like to, with leave, move uh, amendments one to nine on sheet one five one eight. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Silger, you see the call. You have about two minutes before we go to the hard marker. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, well, then, just in the two minutes I have, a, a couple of points I'd like to uh, make. Uh, one is that, um, as, as this debate started, I had the opportunity to engage with the Mitochondrial Foundation and a number of other experts to try and understand uh, this legislation. I absolutely understand 
the intent behind it, uh, and I, I support the intent behind it, which is to alleviate suffering and to use research to alleviate suffering. And I think we should look for all reasonable measures and all ethical measures that we possibly can uh, to that end. And so I, I commend uh, those great scientists who engage in that type of work. But I do want to associate myself with some of the comments we've heard from Senator Keneally, from Senator Canavan, uh, and to support this particular amendment, uh, because I do think. Uh, that this particular amendment uh, would alleviate one of the worst parts of this bill and one of the most morally problematic parts of this bill, and that is uh, that the bill allows the creation of a human life for the purposes of using it uh, for research, which inherently means its destruction. And that is a massive ethical line uh, that we are on the verge of crossing in this country through this legislation, where for the first time we will be allowing the creation of a human life specifically for the purpose of destroying it uh, in research. We haven't done that in the past. We didn't do that, in fact, even when it came to stem cell research, and we had a, a lengthy debate in relation to that. Uh, we were told that embryonic stem cells had the most potential. It turned out that actually adult stem cells delivered great potential and great scientific advances without those ethical concerns. So I, I support this. I think we are crossing a really serious line, uh, and it's not one that I support, but I do support these, Thank these amendments. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it's four, it is 4.30. The time for debate has expired. The committee reports progress. Clark. Government business order of the day number two. Oh, Senator Still John. Uh, President, I uh, seek leave to move a motion to extend the consideration of the mitochondrial donation law reform Maves Law Bill uh, 2021 to 5 pm. Is, is leave granted? Leave hasn't been granted. Uh, Ms. Ms. President, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving this motion. Can I give them a call? Give them. Just, just. Senator Stilljohn. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, here, is, here, is, here is where we sit tonight. This, this law opening the gateway to vital medical research vital medical research that has been subject uh, to a debate in the chamber uh, is now about to come to a uh, close without resolution because of the previous decisions of this chamber in relation to the organization of the business of this place now i seek uh, in moving this motion today not to constrain any senator um, in making a contribution to what is a conscience vote. I simply move here to allow the time necessary for that debate to conclude and for a vote on the legislation finally to be taken before the Senate rises at the end of this parliamentary day. Let us not have uh, a situation where this law passes because uh, we have run out of time when it is totally within the powers of this chamber to grant ourselves additional time uh, to consider this legislation. My uh, motion here would grant an additional hour of time to debate, plenty of time uh, to get through the three remaining uh, amendments and vote finally on the law as it would then stand, uh, giving clarity and certainty to all of those in this debate who are concerned by this issue. There are many other matters before the Chamber, however, I would note, I would note that our colleagues in the House uh, sat until 2 o'clock in the morning yesterday debating an issue of legislation. Let us not leave any impression that we are not willing uh, to sit and do our jobs to get legislation important to our communities through this place. So let us stay here in this debate. Let us finish what we have started. And let us give certainty and clarity to all those are concerned by the outcome of this legislation. I commend, no, I beseech this amendment to the chamber. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, Acting Deputy Chair, I uh, would deeply wish to see this legislation pass. 
um, the government uh, provided government business time for legislation that is, uh, is uh, receiving a conscience vote. Uh, we listed it as the first item of government business on Tuesday uh, and provided all of the government business time available on Tuesday for its consideration. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, with the cooperation um, of, uh, of the Chamber, um, uh, also, uh, also provided uh, additional time uh, on Tuesday night um, for, uh, for the Senate to continue its consideration uh, of this bill. Uh, we then also uh, provided uh, for extended sitting hours through negotiation uh, with, uh, with other parties last night for consideration of the bill. Um, and, uh, and of course, have, uh, have provided it as the first item of government business, and again through negotiation with other parties, have provided uh, additional time this afternoon for debate uh, in what would otherwise have ordinarily been the general business uh, debating time. So uh, I want to acknowledge that there's been cooperation across the chamber to provide additional time for the debate uh, of this bill. Uh, I don't want to cast any aspersions on any of the individuals um, who have contributed at various lengths to the bill. I have certainly tried to keep uh, my contributions as short and sharp as possible to keep things moving. Uh, I would provide the commitment to the Chamber, noting that, uh, that I think it is um, unlikely that the extra half an hour you proposed, Senator Steele-John, would have enabled all of the remaining amendments to be considered and debated in the way in which um, uh, such sensitive topics should be handled uh, and for the conclusion of the bill. Uh, I would provide the commitment that, uh, that we will seek to manage the program in, uh, in the next sitting week uh, in a way uh, that provides sufficient time to try to conclude uh, this matter. Uh, I hope uh, that we will receive sufficient cooperation around the chamber uh, to be able to do that in terms of uh, giving up uh, of some of the other parts of the business uh, or enabling additional hours, as you say, uh, at a time where that is uh, possible for individuals to do. Um, uh, I appreciate, as I said, very much the sentiments you're making. Uh, uh, I am committed, uh, and many others are committed, to wanting to see uh, this bill come into law, uh, but I am also committed uh, on what is a highly sensitive topic uh, with serious ethical and moral considerations for individuals around the chamber that cross party lines uh, to ensure that, as with previous conscience votes of a matter of this nature, uh, people do have um, uh, all the time that they need uh, to be able to thoroughly ventilate their concerns and the issues that are raised uh, in a manner uh, befitting uh, um, proper parliamentary debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to make, rise to make a very short. Senator con Keneally, oh, could I just, for apologies. a moment, just to, so I can explain to the chamber, if this motion is agreed to on the voices, we will go back to the mitochondrial bill. If, however, there is a division, uh, the arrangements as arrived at earlier today will be followed, and this would be then conducted on March the 29th, which is our next sitting day just for the Chamber's elucidation. Senator Keneally. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, I rise to make a short contribution on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, uh, and that is, first of all, to acknowledge uh, the words of the Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham, uh, both in terms of his uh, respect and thoughtful con um, consideration of the way in which we've all approached uh, this uh, this conscience vote, and I think that that is a tone that has been set uh, by Senator Birmingham uh, in his handling of the legislation, and so I thank him for that. Uh, I think the debate has been conducted respectfully and carefully and thoughtfully and recognises that people come to a conscience vote. Uh, with strong views on both sides, uh, formed by their ethical convictions, uh, their work experience, their own research, their, their consultations with their constituents and the like. Uh, and therefore, uh, the respectful tone of that uh, is acknowledged. I also acknowledge Senator Birmingham's commitment uh, that the bill will come back to the chamber upon the next sitting week and that time will be allocated uh, and that we will, he will work with other parties in the chamber to ensure that time is allocated uh, so that the bill can be brought to a conclusion. Uh, and so I thank him for his uh, commitment there. Uh, on that basis, uh, and in consideration of the lateness of the hour, 
the sensitivity of the bill, the necessity to ensure people can participate fully in the debate, and the necessity for this chamber to pass other legislation, including well, it is a, including the appropriations bills, uh, as well as legislation that is required prior to the election, uh, that we will be uh, supporting the government in their approach to this motion. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? Okay. So I'm going to put the question, and the question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. No one's called for a division. No one's called for a division. The clerk. Government business order of the day number two, corporations amendment, meetings and documents bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator McKim, thank you for waving. Thank you. <laughs> waving, uh, not drowning. Uh, indeed, indeed, um, Acting Deputy President, thank you. Um, when we were uh, debating this bill late, last year. I was making the point that this bill is the latest attempt to capitalise on a, the COVID pandemic for political purposes and, in this particular case, to capitalise on the COVID pandemic for the sake of the rich and the powerful by uh, making permanent the temporary dispensation that was previously granted to companies from having to hold in-person AGMs. And can I just be clear that the Australian Greens, as I said last year, absolutely accept that this measure was necessary <coughs> during the period of extended lockdowns. And we also continue to support making permanent the capacity for companies to hold hybrid AGMs. But we do not support the provisions in this bill that would allow companies to hold wholly virtual AGMs because annual general meetings are one of the few occasions that big corporations have to account for themselves and account for themselves publicly. They are an opportunity for investors to scrutinise what is actually being done with their money. Now, the pursuit of profit under the laissez-faire, neoliberal, uh, late-stage disaster capitalist system that we find ourselves living in <laughs> relies on those that run corporations being able to abstract themselves from the human or the ecological cost of their actions. And that is why the executive class finds AGMs just so uncomfortable. The billionaires and their lackeys hate having to face the public because they hate being held to account and they hate having to answer uncomfortable questions. Which is precisely, of course, why companies, and listed companies in particular, should be required to continue to have to hold in person annual general meetings, either as a standalone meeting or as a hybrid virtual meeting. Now, given all of the power and the wealth concentrated in their hands, given the public responsibility associated with being publicly listed, the least that the captains of industry and finance should be expected to do is face the music once a year and allow themselves to be held to account for their actions. But this government doesn't want that. Because let's face it, this government is here for the big corporations. This government is here for the billionaires and their lackeys. This government is here for its political donors. Now, how do we know that? Because this government takes millions of dollars in donations from the big fossil fuel companies, as in fact does the Australian Labor Party. And that's why neither 
of the major parties in this place are proposing to take action on climate change anywhere near in line with what the science is telling us we need to do if we want to avoid catastrophe and calamity. Now, virtual AGMs may well provide greater accessibility for a greater number of shareholders and greater public transparency at some point in the future, but the point is right now neither the technology nor the governance arrangements are in place to ensure this. The committee inquiry into this bill heard detailed accounts of the problems with virtual AGMs conducted during the period of temporary dispensation as a result of the pandemic. The bill has, of course, failed to address the issues flagged during that inquiry. Yet it has made the leap to allowing companies to hold wholly virtual AGMs. This is nothing other than a naked ploy to give corporate Australia a chance to recalibrate standards around accountability and transparency. And don't uh, let, let no one make the mistake of thinking that this bill exists in a vacuum, because it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It sits alongside the government's watering down of continuous disclosure laws. It sits alongside the regulations that the government attempted to put through this place to cancel the licences of proxy advisers. And can I say what a great show by the Senate earlier today to disallow that move by the government and disallow that naked attempt to cancel the licence of proxy advisers, who do such a great job in making sure the market can be informed by accurate information. This bill sits alongside the latest attempt to use the pandemic as cover to consolidate the power of the tycoons at the expense of mum and dad shareholders who the Liberal Party once made a virtue of representing. Allowing hybrid AGMs should be the limit of current reforms. And to that extent, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move the amendment on sheet 1472 circulated in my name. This amendment would prevent listed companies from holding, whole, from holding wholly virtual AGMs. It's been revised to align it with the amendments agreed to in the House to establish a review into these provisions of the bill. By their nature, Listed companies have a public responsibility and the parliament should ensure that their AGMs are conducted in a publicly observable manner. Allowing listed companies to hold hybrid AGMs will provide an opportunity for all of the issues associated with virtual meetings to be sorted out and for there to be a real-world confirmation of their purported benefits. Until then, wholly virtual AGMs for listed companies should not be allowed, and shareholders should retain the opportunity to sit in the same room as the executive and the board to bear witness to exactly what they are up to and have the capacity to hold them to account for their actions. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McKim, before you sit down, are you planning on moving your amendments in committee? Uh, yes, I am. Um, President, thank you. Thank you. Thank Madam you. President, thank you. Thank you, Senator Kim. Uh, Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I just rise to make a few brief remarks about this bill. Um, whilst I support choice in the ability to hold these AGMs in a hybrid model, to have that virtual participation and that in person participation. It was something which we saw happen during the pandemic and I, I note that those arrangements are being extended through this bill. I do think it is worth, when we're looking at this legislation, just reflecting on the impact um, the pandemic has had on people who do struggle to participate virtually um, and for reasons which are very much beyond their control. We know things like the regional divide, accessibility to high quality broadband do affect people's ability to participate 
in person. Um, we, we know that during the pandemic for these individuals that uh, participation not just in, in AGMs but in all sorts of, um, of the key economic opportunities in life have been impacted, um, notably uh, the, the, the limitations of our national broadband network make it very difficult for people in regional areas to participate in education when education goes online, to participate in virtual health uh, when, when that went online during the pandemic. The pandemic has raised many questions about digital access, the need for all Australians to have access to high quality, reliable, fast broadband internet, which they do not have at the moment. And I know in many parts of regional South Australia, many South Australians are struggling with access to internet. It, it is causing barriers, not just socially, but economically for these individuals in regional South Australia. And when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at issues like those contained in this bill, I would just urge the Senate to also be considering the other ways in which these uh, regional Australians, or those who have difficulty in accessing the tools they need to participate in online, whether it be in their health, their education, or in instances like this, that we're prioritising the needs of those Australians. Um, there have been a lot of critical and urgent issues during the pandemic for government to deal with, but I think one of the key lessons it has shown us is that it's incredibly important for people to have access to technology, access to internet, and also even when they have access to be able to use it and to know how to use it. So for many elderly Australians, it, they may be able to access broadband internet, but they may not be comfortable using the smartphones or the other pieces of technology uh, required to unlock its potential and its benefits. Um, so I did just want to make that point. I do um, welcome the opportunity to be able to review these arrangements. I appreciate why um, choice would be important, but if I could just uh, just draw the Senate's attention to those issues, particularly for, for Australians in regional areas. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator, Senator Scar. Thank you. Senator Scar is coming to us remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can I first say to Senator McKim um, that I'm a great supporter of profit and a trenchant critic of losses. So if I can say that, the pursuit of profit, I think, is, uh, is quite a noble ambition. And uh, we shouldn't disregard the point that our great enterprises across this country do provide um, growth and jobs and opportunity for all sorts of people. So I come at this from a totally different philosophical background from Senator McKim, which should surprise no one. Senator McKim did not refer to any of the many checks and balances that are contained in this bill. And let me go through some of these. It can only be a wholly virtual meeting if it is provided for in the constitution of a company. That means one of two things. Either when someone becomes a shareholder of the company, the constitution of the company actually provides for a virtual meeting, or secondly, that the constitution of a company is amended when someone is a shareholder to permit only virtual meetings or virtual only meetings. And that can only occur if a special resolution is passed, and a special resolution requires 75 per cent, at least 75 per cent of the votes cast on a resolution to be in favour of the amendment to the constitution. So that is an extraordinarily strong check and balance. And I would expect, I would expect, and I think there have been examples where uh, companies who perhaps have been considering amendments to their constitutions to allow for only virtual AGMs will find that many stakeholders, including those companies which, with large retail share base holders, uh, with large retail shareholders, shareholder bases will actually be against amending the constitution and those, those amendments to constitution simply won't proceed. So I think in many cases there will be checks and balances through the constitutions of the companies. The second point I want to make is that the bill provides that there must be a reasonable opportunity for shareholders to participate in the annual general meetings of companies, a reasonable opportunity to participate. And while some stakeholders have raised concerns, some practical examples with respect to how that has worked in practice uh, during this COVID pandemic 
um, period. Most companies, most companies have worked well with their share registry service providers and others to ensure that shareholders do have that reasonable opportunity to participate in AGMs, where those AGMs have been conducted on a, on a um, virtual basis. The third check and balance. So we've got the check and balance in terms of the constitution. The constitution of the company must actually provide for virtual only AGMs. Secondly, you've got the check and balance with respect to providing a reasonable opportunity for all shareholders to participate in the AGM, to ask questions of the board and the senior executive team as they should be entitled to in an AGM context and also make observations and raise concerns, raise questions of the auditor. Whoever's there at the AGM, they have that opportunity through the AGM to raise those questions, ask those questions and raise those concerns. That's the second check and balance. The third check and balance is there's going to be a review of this legislation after two years and how it's actually worked in practice. So that's the third link of the protections which are contained in this proposed amendment to the Corporations Act. And I think when you look at those checks and balances in their totality, you look at what has actually happened in practice over the course of the COVID pandemic and how companies, corporate Australia has responded positively, has responded positively in terms of making sure that its shareholders have an opportunity to participate in annual general meetings. That should give us all, that should give us all a lot of comfort, a great deal of comfort. I say to the comments raised by Senator Smith, and I think they were earnestly made, with respect to the participation of shareholders in a regional context, prior to companies providing hybrid AGMs, regional shareholders were even more disadvantaged, were even more disadvantaged because they'd have to travel large distances uh, in order to physically participate in annual general meetings. So I think these reforms should be looked in a global context and it should be acknowledged, it should be acknowledged that shareholders actually had more opportunity more opportunity to participate in AGMs where the information technology is, is provided to allow them to participate in virtual AGMs. So in fact, more shareholders would be able to participate than in what used to be the case of purely physical AGMs. Lastly, I want to say as, a, as, as someone who did serve as a company secretary at an ISX listed public company, that I think many companies, and in fact, most companies certainly uh, in the ASX 100, a top list of public companies, will recognise the benefit of having a physical AGM in addition to a virtual AGM. I can well remember during the height of the global financial crisis how much it meant to the senior executive team of the company I worked for to actually have physical AGMs where we had an opportunity to liaise with our retail shareholders who supported us through those very, very difficult times. And I can remember one of a few of my favourite retail shareholders, Albert and Sam, and I must, uh, I must find them so I can, um, I can convey that uh, I've, I've referred to them in terms of Hansard in this debate. I can rem remember some of the fine points they made at many of the AGMs that we held um, during those difficult times. So I think there certainly is a place for physical AGMs and I suspect that most companies which have large shareholder bases, retail shareholder bases, will continue to have them. But, but companies should have the choice, and for some companies who even struggle to establish quorum at a physical AGM, actually giving them the power to conduct a wholly virtual AGM will actually provide a powerful driver towards achieving economy and saving costs for their shareholders, and that shouldn't be forgotten either. I think the other thing that shouldn't be forgotten, Madam Acting Deputy President, is that this bill contains other reforms, very important reforms in relation to the execution of documents so that those can be done through technology neutral ways and also important reforms in relation to the conduct of polls so that most important resolutions that are put before uh, shareholder meetings, AGMs, will have to be determined on poll. And in addition to that, those shareholders who represent at least 5% of the total shareholder base would also have the right to be able to call for an independent, an independent expert or independent conduct of the poll to make sure it's been done in the correct way. And that is certainly a reform which is supported by the proxy advisors 
who Senator McKim uh, refers to as being a positive uh, development in terms of corporate governance practices. So I think this bill does more than just deal with virtual AGMs. Insofar as it deals with virtual AGMs, I provide it my 100% support. I think it's a welcome initiative. There are checks and balances through the constitutional provisions, through the two-year review, through the reasonable opportunity for shareholders to ask questions and make observations. But it also provides important reforms with respect to execution of documents in a neutral technology sense and also through the conduct of polls. So with those comments, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I'm very, very happy to commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thank Scar. You. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to the Corporations Amendment Meetings and Documents Bill 2021. The process of bringing corporate governments into the, into the digital age has proven problematic for the Morrison-Joyce government. This was not because the issues involved in this bill were too complicated for the good folk over on the government benches. The real culprit in dragging this issue out for more than two years is the Treasury, who we know are the real government in Australia. Once again, Treasury could not help themselves, constructing measures serving the interests of the big end of town over the interests of everyday Australian shareholders. And they came unstuck. The Treasury came unstuck. This is an issue that I've been trying to sort out since the first reports of the failure of virtual AGMs came into my office in October 2020. In September 2020, Treasury introduced the Corporations Coronavirus Economic Response Determination No. 3, 2020, which allowed any company to run a virtual AGM as well as providing for some measures regarding electronic filing. That determination was enthusiastically embraced by the big end of town, who proceeded to run roughshod over the entire concept of shareholder primacy and accountability. All the usual suspects were there rotting away. Bendigo Bank limited questions to an online form that allowed only 500 characters for the question. That's a little longer than a tweet, making it almost impossible to ask a sensible question. Maybe that was their objective. Activist shareholders were excluded from the virtual meeting room by way of being sent incorrect logins for the meeting. The emergency assistance number did not answer. Bendigo Bank did write their own Dorothy Dix questions, which were not correctly referenced to a shareholder by name, of course, for obvious reasons. Were all shareholders asked? Shareholder questions asked, sorry. Who would know? There was no public transcript of the AGM made available, although a full transcript was available for a fee. Not to be outdone, Crown Casino pulled their own stunts, including changing the wording of questions that were too embarrassing for Crown. It's just like CCP, Crown Casino, combining questions from different shareholders that were the same, except they were not the same. Hard questions were grouped with a softball question, and only the softball question was answered and was asked. Reading a question, but then advising the answer, would be only be given in a private conversation with the shareholder. What? <laughs> this, the meeting was then guillotined and remote attendees were given seconds to vote, ensuring proxies decided the vote in favour of the guillotine. This sounds like Labor and Liberal running the Senate. A year after that, AGM Crown's operations were described by a Royal Commission as disgraceful, illegal, dishonest, unethical and exploitative. As a result, one of Crown's casino licences was placed under supervision, their largest shareholder told to unload their shareholding, and at one point, Crown's share price was off almost 50 per cent. People didn't trust them. Those Crown shareholders who were deliberately and systematically disenfranchised by the director's deceit at the AGM lost money because Crown ran their AGM as a damage control exercise. That cannot happen if the shareholders are in the same room as the directors. If shareholders were allowed to ask their hard questions, to hold the board to account, would the meltdown of Crown in the year that followed still have occurred? It's an interesting question. But it's, that's why AGMs matter. That's why shareholder primacy matters and accountability to shareholders above all else. Who would invest money in a publicly listed companies if the directors 
can make a joke of the one opportunity shareholders have to control how their money is being invested by their company. And worse, knowing their money was being misused and not then being given a chance to do something about that. That's indeed disgraceful, dishonest, unethical, immoral. The Treasury's attempt to relieve their big business mates of the troublesome scrutiny of these pesky shareholders who own their company risked undermining the very concept of a publicly traded corporation. Despite the circus that virtual AGMs became, the government enshrined the same provisions in the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 1 Bill 2021, which was passed only after One Nation and others in the Senate forced the government to sunset the bill on 31 March 2022, next month. If the Corporation's Amendment, Meetings and Documents Bill 2021 is not passed in this sitting, then the measure sunset and the original provisions of the Corporations Act regarding AGMs and document filing come back. This is not something One Nation want to see. To be fair, the government has constructed a bill which went a long way towards correcting their original skullduggery. This is actually a well-written bill, except One Nation is still concerned this bill contains the same provisions for registered corporations to hold 100 per cent virtual AGMs, entirely virtual. Now the Treasury tried to cover that up. The explanatory memorandum for the Corporations Amendment Meetings and Documents Bill 2021 includes this passage, and I'm going to quote. The bill makes permanent changes allowing companies and registered schemes to hold hybrid meetings, which give shareholders the option of either attending in person or remotely. On page 18, which explains the provision for virtual AGMs, the section is headed hybrid meetings of shareholders of a company or registered scheme. Then it says right there registered companies can hold 100 per cent virtual AGMs, not hybrid, virtual, in its own document. Did Treasury think no senator or stakeholder would read the bill? and discover the provisions for virtual AGMs for registered corporations still lurking in there? Is this planned? Is it deliberate deceit? Enough of the spin, enough of explanatory memorandums being written by the marketing department. How about some honesty? In the Senate inquiry, the Property Council of Australia stated that while they supported the bill, they remained concerned. Subject to a constitution change, even public corporations could vote to hold 100 per cent AGM, virtual AGMs. The Australian Shareholders Association has called on AGMs to remain hybrid, not 100 per cent virtual, and highlighted the same failings that I raised with the Australian Securities and Investment Commission at Senate Estimates in March of 2021. Submission by the Australian Centre for Corporate Responsibility also opposed 100 per cent virtual AGMs in these terms. And I'll quote, the proposed bill would permit companies to adopt virtual only proceedings where their constitution allows for it, thereby avoiding any in-person, transparent interaction with share interactions with shareholders. This is not in the interest of shareholders of public companies. We believe there is no obvious case to justify allowing companies to do away with physical meetings altogether." End of quote. One Nation agrees. We want transparency, we want accountability, we want scrutiny. The Australian Council of Superannuation Investors pointed out that some companies changed their constitutions during the pandemic to allow virtual AGMs, and the wordings of those re resolutions would count as a constitution change under the bill, meaning that company could run virtual AGMs straight away with no further vote. A second rort the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors found was in IPOs. If the initial constitution passed to create a new company call included virtual AGM provisions, then those would be in place from the start and, again, the shareholders would be disenfranchised with no opportunity to vote against virtual AGMs. Senator McKim has submitted Amendment 1472 revised, which removes the right of a listed corporation to hold a 100 per cent virtual AGM. I thank Senator McKim for proposing that amendment and One Nation is in support. Now, looking at the rest of the bill, the corporation's amendment Meetings and Documents Bill 2021 enables electronic execution and witnessing of legal documents to be made permanent and consistent 
across Australian jurisdictions. This is not an AGM-related provision. For instance, it would allow for execution and witnessing of deeds electronically. In committee, the document handling section of this bill was supported by the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, CPA Australia, the Law Council and the Governance Institute of Australia, amongst others. One Nation overall supports this bill. However, we remind the government that we will be voting against the bill because of our principle of voting for freedom and wanting the government to restore basic freedoms to not only the people at the front of protesting at the front here right now, but people right around Australia being penalised with inhuman, immoral and ridiculous, unscientific vaccine mandates and other forms of coercion and, force and coerced restrictions. We will be voting against this. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I'd like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate. I'd also like to thank the Senate Economics Legislation Committee for their inquiry into and report on this bill. The Corporations Amendment Meetings and Documents Bill 2021 modernises the Corporations Act of 2001 and the Corporations Regulations of 2001 to allow for the use of technology to meet regulatory requirements. Specifically, companies and registered schemes will be able to hold meetings physically as a hybrid or, if permitted by the entity's constitution, a wholly virtual meeting. Members will have the flexibility and the choice to receive documents electronically or in hard copy. And finally, the bill allows for documents to be validly executed in flexible and technology neutral ways, including electronic or wet ink signatures. The government will conduct a 12-month opt-in review of annual general meetings, or AGMs. The aim of the review will be to encourage companies and shareholders to engage with technology with a view to considering whether future permanent reforms are needed to further support companies to effectively use technology to engage with their members. A review of the legislation will also be conducted and tabled in Parliament by the first sitting day of each House, following the 30-month period after the day the bill commences. The review will be undertaken by an expert panel, consisting of members with experience in corporate governance and the role of company directors, representing the interests of shareholder rights and experience in advocating for corporate social responsibility. These reforms will support companies and registered schemes to effectively use technology to engage with their members and provide regulatory settings to support Australia's economic recovery plan. In its report, tabled on 18 November in 2021, the Senate Economics Legislation Committee recommended that the bill be passed. I would like to address here the two other recommendations that are made in that report. The Labor senators recommended an independent review of the bill conducted within two years of its implementation date. The bill includes a requirement to review and report on the operation of these amendments at the earliest practical time, two years after the commencement of the provisions. The Australian Green senators recommended that the bill uh, that the provision allowing for entities to conduct wholly virtual AGMs be opposed. The bill gives entities and members the flexibility to hold meetings in the format that best suits them. The bill allows entities to continue to hold physical meetings and makes permanent the ability to hold hybrid meetings. An entity may only hold a, virtual, a wholly virtual meeting if it is expressly permitted by the entity's constitution. And this give members, gives members the right to consciously decide whether wholly virtual meetings should be permitted. We have made further amendments to the bill to ensure that if a review is not conducted and tabled in parliament, provisions of the bill that allow for wholly virtual meetings will cease to have effect. Additionally, if there are any recommendations from the review, a written government response will be required and tabled in Parliament no later than three months after the report is tabled. The bill also preserves members' rights to participate in meetings by requiring that virtual meeting technology be reasonable and facilitate the ability of members to ask questions and make comments, both orally and in writing. 
For these reasons, and on the recommendation of the Senate Economics Legislation Committee, I commend this bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the Corporations Act 2001 and for related purposes. Thank you. Is it the wish uh, of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill uh, stand as printed. Senator McKim. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Uh, as I flagged uh, in my second reading contribution, I move um, the uh, amendment uh, standing in my name on sheet 1472 uh, revised. Senator McKim, are you seeking leave to move them all together? Yes, I am. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The question uh, uh, is that um, the amendments uh, moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say, oh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, Labor shares some of the concerns raised by the Greens in relation to their use of virtual AGMs, and it's why we demanded that the government include a vigorous review process, including a sunset clause that will repeal the virtual AGMs clause if, if the independent review is not tabled in the parliament after two years. And the government has agreed to this amendment. Um, but we do actually recognise the substantial benefits that can come from virtual AGMs, including improving the ability of Australians in remote and regional areas to participate in corporate governance. And so we won't stand in the way of this. But we will ensure that shareholder rights are protected through the independent review process that we have secured in the other place. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Oh, sorry, Chair. Uh, um, look, allowing uh, both listed and unlisted companies to hold virtual, wholly virtual meetings allows the companies the flexibility to do business the way that best suits them. The bill contains a legislative requirement for the review to, for a review to be undertaken within two years after its commencement, and government parliamentary uh, amendments introduced into the House of Representatives ensure that those wholly virtual meeting provisions will cease to have effect if the review is not done and a report tabled in Parliament two and a half years after its commencement. For this reason, the government will be opposing the Greens amendment. Uh, the question is uh, that the amendments uh, moved by Senator McKim uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. I'll bring the bells for four minutes.
up will you will you count? Stop the bells. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair uh, and the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, teller for the noes. Not yet. The result of the division, there being 11 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Uh, the question. I'll give the minister a minute to go back to her place. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I, I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill uh, be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. 
The committee has considered the corporation's amendment meetings and documents bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee now be adopted. The question is that the, committee of, uh, the, the report of the committee be adopted. All of those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you, Connie. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Order. Stop the bells. The 
question is that the third reading be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 31, nose 10. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, the oh, clerk, sorry. Bill for an act to amend the Corporations Act 2001 and for related purposes. Senators, the time for the allotted debate on bills has expired. In accordance with the resolution agreed earlier today, I will now put the question before the chair and then put the questions on the remaining stages of bills and motions listed in that resolution. Uh, I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Appropriations Coronavirus Response Bill No. 1, 2021-22, and the Appropriation Coronavirus Response Bill No. 2, 2021-2022. Minister. Uh, I move the bills be now read a second time? First. Third, first time. Oh, that's right. They've only just come in. First time. Question Thank you. Is I didn't quite hear your introductory bit. The question is that the bills be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Appropriations Coronavirus Response Bill No. 1 2021-2022 and Appropriation Coronavirus Response Bill No. 2 2122. Minister. Thank you. I move the bills now be read a second time. Question is: the bills now be read a second time? Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. I'll now deal with the second reading amendment on sheet 1549, circulated by the opposition, and the amendment to that second reading amendment, circulated on sheet 1555 by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. We'll start with sheet 1555 from Pauline Hanson's One Nation. The question is that the amendment to the opposition second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. I'll now move to sheet 1549. Oh, sorry, Senator Roberts. Could I have my name recorded as voting in favour, please? Certainly, Senator Roberts. Quest, quest, uh, we now move on to sheet 1549. Uh, in the name of the opposition. The question is now that the second reading amendment on sheet 1549, circulated by the opposition, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. Division required? No. The noes have it. No. Oh, the ayes have it. Apologies. Apologies. We are moving on. The question is now that these bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Appropriation Coronavirus Response Bill No. 1, 2021-2022. Appropriation Coronavirus Response Bill No. 2, 2021-22. The question is that the remaining stages of the bills be agreed to and the bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. 
Appropriation Coronavirus Response Bill No. 1, 2021-2022. Appropriation Coronavirus Response Bill No. 2, 2021-2022. I will now deal with the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Foreign Influences and Offences Bill 2022 and two related bills. As uh, opposing the appropriation, please. Certainly, Senator Roberts. But as I, as I said, we will record that, Senator Roberts. Um, the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Foreign Influence and Offences Bill 2022 and two related bills. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Electoral Legislation Amendment, Foreign Influences and Offences Bill 2022, Electoral Legislation Amendment, Authorisations Bill 2022 and Electoral Legislation Amendment, COVID Enfranchisement Bill 2022. I will now deal with the opposition amendments to the Electoral Legislation Amendment Authorisations Bill 2022. These amendments were circulated after 3.30 p.m. Leave will be required for them to be moved. Is someone seeking leave to have these dealt with? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move the opposition's amendments on sheet 11556. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1556 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and that the bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Electoral Legislation Amendment, Foreign Influences and Offences Bill 2022, Electoral Legislation Amendment, Authorisations Bill 2022, and Electoral Legislation Amendment, COVID Enfranchisement Bill 2022. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment, Enhancing Superannuation Outcomes for Australians and Helping Australian Businesses Invest, Bill 2021, for concurrence. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and taxation and for related purposes. I will now deal with the amendment circulated by the Australian Greens on sheet 1521. Uh, we start with amendments three to five on sheet 1521. The question is that schedules two, three and four stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, in the interest of time, instead of calling a, a division, and I acknowledge the uh, encouragement of the Chief Government Whip, could I simply ask that the Australian Greens' position be recorded? It will be so recorded, Senator McKim. I thank you. Anybody else? Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie, your position? As against. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Thank you very much. I'll now put amendments one and two on sheets 1521. The question is that the remaining amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. I request from the Greens that our position uh, in favour of these amendments be recorded. Certainly, Senator McKim. Senator Lambie? Yes, yeah, same request from me too, Mr President. Please Thank against. You, Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, the, quest uh, the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and taxation and for related purposes. I will now deal with the motion listed in the resolution concerning the establishment of a joint select committee on parliamentary standards. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion as circulated in the chamber. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now deal with general business notices of motion listed in the resolution. I will first deal with Senator Chandler's motion number 1311 uh, to introduce a bill. I call Senator Chandler. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to sex discrimination in sport and for related purposes. I'll move that motion. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. 
the ayes have it. Senator Chandler. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that the bill will now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to sex discrimination in sport and for related purposes. Senator Chandler. I move that the bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. Order. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. I'll now deal with order. I'll now deal with motion number 1314, proposing, an ex proposing an extension of the Select Committee on Job Security. I call Senator Sheldon. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. I, the ayes have it. I will now deal with Senator Roberts' motion, number 1316. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Um, Senator Roberts. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that this bill now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. It would be good if there were some voices. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Roberts. Oh, Clark, sorry. Bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. Senator Roberts. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum re relating to the bill. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Roberts. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. I believe that's it. Just. The President has received letters requesting changes to the me membership of committees. Minister. I table particulars of proposed and certain additional expenditure for 21-22 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to le the legislation committees. No, I don't. Wrong one. I seek leave to move a motion to vary membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic thread. Minister. I table particulars of a proposed and certain additional expenditure for 21-22 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to legislation committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that Minister. the documents, together with the final budget outcome 2020-21 and the advances under Annual Appropriations Act for 2020-21 be referred to committees for examination and report and consideration of the advances provided under the Annual Appropriations Acts be made in order for the day for the day on which committees report on their examination of the additional estimates. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The president has received messages. Oh, beg your pardon. The president has received messages from the House of Representatives for forwarding the following bills for concurrence: Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, Religious Discrimination Bill 2022, Religious Discrimination Consequential Amendments Bill 2021, and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. Proceed without formalities, be, be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is, these bills now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. 
Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, Religious Discrimination Bill 2022, Religious Discrimination Consequential Amendments Bill 2021, and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Uh, Minister. President, just if it would assist the Chamber just to confirm that was the standard passage of a message from the House of Representatives and the standard first reading that uh, a minister would give such that bills now appear on our notice paper. Uh, Minister. I table a replacement explanatory memorandum and revised explanatory memoranda relating to the Religious Discrimination Bill 2022 and related bills and move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Oh, In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 29 March 2022. Minister. I move that the Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 be listed as a separate order of the day. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The President received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr K. J. Andrews to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. The President has received messages from His Excellency, the Governor-General, notifying assent to 25 laws, details of which will be incorporated into Hansard. I'll just ensure, Minister, you're seeking the call. I seek leave to move government business notice of the motion number four, proposing the approval of works within the parliamentary zone. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move the motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that. The Senate, at its rising, adjourn until Tuesday, the 29th of March 2022, at midday, or such other times as may be fixed by the President or in the event of the President being unavailable by the Deputy President, and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each Senator, and leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. It, um question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Oh. Mr President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn. Oh, the, Senate, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Tuesday 29 March 2022 at 12 noon. <laughs>